Hello everyone and welcome to this SQL for Absolute Beginners course. Thank you so much for enrolling in this course. So here we are going to learn a ton about this language called SQL where we will learn how we can manipulate data and build better manipulation techniques to work with data back and forth. I hope you have a good time in this course and that you learn a lot. The most important thing is that Throughout the course, if you have any question, don't hesitate to send me a message here on Udemy. I'll be happy to support you in your learning. So a bit about myself, I'll be your teacher for this course. I was the one that uh, created and envisioned uh, this SQL course for absolute beginners. I have around nine years of experience in data science roles, and I've been working with SQL in the past uh, probably 15 years, counting also with my college education, where, where I also programmed with SQL. I'm based in Lisbon, Portugal. I started more in ETL databases, so stuff more regarding data engineering. Then I moved into a data science role, and now I work at Their Data Engineering, where I'm a partner uh, in this Portuguese startup where we help to set up uh, data science and machine learning systems, and most of our data pipelines are, of course, done in SQL. Uh, about the areas where I've worked on, uh, mostly retail and banking throughout my career. And then as a consultant, I've worked for multiple industries because, of course, that's in the basis of a consultant to work for multiple industries at the same time. So what were the motivations for me to build this course? Well, first, I wanted to help professionals to power up their data managing skills and have this language that is really flexible and it can be used around multiple systems. You can be working in Python and call some SQL code. You can be working in R and call some SQL code. You can be working in, uh, for example, application development and you need to know how to work with SQL. That's something really common every time you have to query some databases or at least to insert data into specific databases. This is like a really transversal skill throughout the data world, if I can call it in this way. And the most important part is that most data professionals understand SQL. So it's a really a common language uh, that everyone can understand, even though there are small parts of the code that people don't understand that the other part is doing, for example, data engineering and data science, SQL is normally the common ground that everyone understands and it helps also professionals to be a bit more empathetic in their uh, daily lives and also helping others understanding their issues. Another motivation is, of course, to help people have a gentle introduction into SQL. We are going to start from scratch, like really from the beginning, assuming you have no prior knowledge in this course. That's why it's for absolute beginners. That was one of the main motivations. Then I want also uh, uh, to help engineers and scientists and data engineers and data scientists to integrate this language into their data pipelines. We can, of course, as data engineers and data scientists, do things in Python, R or Spark, for example. But SQL is also a great tool to have under our tool belt so that we can uh, use it when we think it's appropriate and particularly when we have SQL interfaces with databases. Uh, so here is my LinkedIn and their data website, my company's website. I'll leave them in the resources for you to check. Also, add me on LinkedIn. I'll be super happy to have you as a connection. Okay, so what is SQL? Well, SQL is a domain specific language that is used to program and is designed to manage and query data. We'll understand what this means, of course, throughout the practical lectures, but mostly SQL is used as a language to be specific for data manipulation. It's not a language to build applications. It's not a language to build algorithms like Python or R. It's not that. It's assumed to be a language for manipulating data, querying and extracting data. So it works especially well with structured data, rows and columns, with new formats such as the uh, tensor format in computer vision, it's not that good to work with it, but most use cases, of course, also in machine learning are with tabular data, so it's a really cool way for us to manipulate data. Uh, consists of several statements, we'll learn, of course, the most important ones throughout the course, but it's most a language that is organized around several uh, statements, such as select, from, group by, and we'll understand that in the coming lectures. And then one of the cool things is that it may be integrated inside other languages, such as Python or R. So SQL is a more broader term for several implementations. There are different implementations with MySQL, PostgreSQL, Microsoft SQL, or Transact SQL, the T-SQL. 
All of them are really, really common between them. They have small differences in the syntax, but the overall implementation is basically the same. So the way that you organize code and what specific instructions do. So there's not a major shift between all these implementations. If you learn, for example, as we are going to learn here, MySQL, you will be ready to jump to other implementations because with a small Google search, you can find the instruction or the parallel instruction that you know for these other uh, implementations. And the logic is always the same, basically. A cool thing is that SQL is around for almost 50 years, if not more than that, I think. It's a language that is probably going nowhere in the near and mid-term future, even in the long-term future, because it's so widely used by data professionals out there that it would be need a really great scientific advancement in this area for SQL to be substituted. But as it is simple, effective, and even well understood by people that are not coding every day in other languages, it's a standard in the industry and it continues to show its strength throughout the last 50 years because if you think about it, there have been a lot of technological advancements, even with cloud infrastructure, with machine learning and data science and all the other stuff regarding the data industry that SQL, I think is probably one of the few things that continue to have a lot of power and a lot of market share in terms of the coding languages. So it's not expected that it goes anywhere in the next 10 to 20 years. Okay, so a cool thing about the learning journey in SQL is that learning SQL can help you in all of these areas and more. These are just the ones that I've remembered at least, which are data science, data analysis, data visualization, and also database administration uh, slash data engineering. So in all of these areas, you probably will use SQL or you can use SQL to power up something. And that's something extremely cool. If you learn SQL, you'll be prepared to do tasks in all of these areas. Of course, by learning SQL, you'll not become automatically a data scientist. That's not what's expected. And I would be lying to you if I would say so. But even so, it's a really important task for data scientists to have because mostly as a data scientist, for example, you'll not have your data fully ranked and arranged for your models. You will need probably to access some uh, databases or some and do some queries to retrieve some data. And if you have uh, SQL knowledge, that will be extremely good for you. And of course, after this course, you will finally uh, close the debate on either you call SQL or SQL. That's, uh, of course, the most important discussion here in the industry. Now, I'm joking, of course not. You can call it however you want. It's a hot topic if you call it SQL or SQL, but honestly, it doesn't matter for the learning. Okay, so what will we learn and approach in this course? This is the first version of the course, okay? So probably when you are doing this course, it may be that we have more sections than these. So first we'll learn, of course, to install MySQL and load a database called the Sequila database so that we have our environment ready. Then we'll spend a lot of time doing basic querying. So starting from scratch, understanding the most important statements. Then we'll work around data types. Data types are transversal to other languages and you really need to understand them so that you can also work better here with databases. After that, a really exciting part, creating and modifying our own tables. Then we'll go and combine tables between themselves, which is a really cool skill also here in SQL. Finally, we'll do a bit more advanced stuff where we'll compound on knowledge that we've learned throughout the last sections. And this one will be extremely interesting because I think that there will be a small aha moment here when you'll see how we can combine several instructions that we've learned into a single one and how flexible the language is. Okay, so learning loop will start here. What we'll have is lectures where you'll code along with me, seeing the instructions and learning at the same time. Then we'll have some quizzes where you'll put your knowledge to the test. And finally, of course, a use case and programming exercises that will help you to consolidate the knowledge uh, because that's, of course, one of the most important parts that you need to do so that you can grasp the language and understand what we are doing. There's nothing that can substitute learning by doing, of course. And by the end of the course, you should know how to comfortably use SQL to manipulate data. The most important things that I would like to pinpoint that you will know is retrieving data from tables, for example, using filter statements, just uh, retrieving some columns as an example, then you learn how to combine data here exemplified in this join that will understand what it is. Then we'll learn how to create our own tables, our own table structure, and also how to insert our own data into specific tables. And finally, you'll be able to uh, basically build a data pipeline from top to bottom, or at least understand how you can create tables and compound on several instructions.
And that's it for the introduction of this course. I'm excited to have you here and I hope you enjoy this course as much as I've enjoyed doing it. Now, let's go forward and start by installing, of course, the software that we will use, which is MySQL. Again, this is one of the implementations that we have on SQL. There are more of them. The good part is that MySQL is completely free because it's an open source framework. So you don't have to pay absolutely anything to install it in our machines. So let's go forward. I hope you're excited and I'll see you in the next lecture. Hey everyone, and welcome again to this SQL course. So here in this lecture, we are going to set up a MySQL on our machines. This is a tutorial for Windows, but I'll leave some links in the resources to install in Mac or Linux. So as I've said, MySQL is a completely free and open source uh, software, so we'll be able to use it with no charge. The only thing that we need to install MySQL is internet access so that we are able to download the softwares. So here in your computer, go to Google Chrome and or Firefox or whatever and go to a search engine page so that we can search for the MySQL download page. Then we'll download MySQL and install it and set it up immediately in our machine. Okay, so here in Google, let's hit MySQL download. This will take us to these pages and we can hit the first one, MySQL downloads the first link should be the one where you will find the mysql download after installing we are able to interact with mysql in two ways either by the interactive interface the ide which is the one that we will use more often or at least we'll always use that for the rest of the course and we'll also have the command line this is a bit more advanced and if you are not familiar with common lines don't worry about that because that's not relevant for the rest of the course and that will not interfere at all with learning sql Okay, so probably here you'll have these uh, cookies. This is an Oracle company right now. If you are here in the cookies, just use whatever preference you want. I'm going to use accept all in this case. And now you'll go here to MySQL community downloads. Okay, go here to this part, MySQL community downloads, because this is where we are going to download the community version. So here in MySQL community downloads, go to MySQL installer for Windows. And here we should go to this page where we have the MySQL installer. We can select operating system. Right now it's only Windows. Again, I'll leave some uh, resources for Mac or Linux. And then here, just go to this version that has uh, 400 or around 400 megabytes. Download the bigger one or at least the bigger file. And then here you can just hit no thanks, just start my download. Okay. No need to log in at all. Of course, this is a technique by Oracle for you to create an account, but you don't need to create it. So just go and continue with the download. And then just let's just make here a small wait until the download finishes. And then we'll go to our downloads folder where we'll have this file that we can use to uh, basically install MySQL locally in our computer. Okay, so MySQL uh, download just finished. So let's go to our downloads folder. And here on the downloads, you'll see here, where it is, MySQL installer community. This is the community version. Of course, it's the free version of MySQL. So MySQL also has paid implementations, but that's for corporations, not for users. So, or for individual users. Uh, so hit two times on this MySQL installer, on MySQL installer community, and the version that you are working on. Depending on the time where you are doing this course, this version may change. Just hit it two times and then Windows will start to install the MySQL server and workbench in your computer. Okay, so when you are running the MySQL installer, sometimes you may have this message of error that's going to show up right now, which is uh, this application requires .NET Framework 4.5.2. Please install this .NET Framework to run this installer again. This depends on your system and what .NET Framework from Windows you have on your computer. If you have this issue, just go to uh, Google Chrome, hit .NET 4.5.2 download or the version that uh, MySQL is asking for. Go to the first link, which will usually be a Microsoft link. Okay, so make sure that it's a Microsoft link and you are not downloading from any other source. That's not an official one, at least. And wait for the page to open. I'll also leave in this case, this page in the resources and then here, just go to the uh, framework that you want. In this case, we want the 4.5.2. Hit, hit, in this case, download, okay? After you hit download, you'll see here that the download should start in a moment, okay? This will be a small file just to install this framework. Uh, in this case, it's a 66 megabytes file. Let's wait for it to finish, and then we'll install this .NET framework 
so that we can install MySQL. If this error did not occur to you, just skip this part, but I'm showing something that is super common to occur when you are trying to install MySQL, and I'm doing it in a completely clean environment, which uh, probably there are students out there that also have this clean environment, or at least an environment that doesn't have this .NET framework uh, updated. Okay, cool, so our framework or our .NET framework installer already finished. We'll go here and you'll see this uh, file or confirm that it's the file that you've downloaded in the .NET framework. Click yes here when you are trying to launch this. If you have this pop-up and then just wait a bit for this to install. So here read the terms of acceptance and then accept them and click install. This will install this .NET framework that will be needed for our MySQL. Okay, so the .NET will finish installing. It may take a while depending on your system. Okay, so when it finishes installing, if you are going through this process, just hit finish. Now, let me go here again to the MySQL installer and let's install then the community version. Now our installer should work and go forward because we have already all the requisites that we need in Windows. Remember, if you have this pop-up, just hit yes then MySQL installer will launch. Okay, so here we are in the window for uh, installing MySQL. Here, just hit developer default. That should be the one that's enough for uh, this course and also the one that has the most important applications uh, for using MySQL, then hit next. So now here, if some of the products have this requirement, click on top of each of the products and then hit execute that will start some install process either for dependencies and the product itself. And on the side, uh, MySQL will launch new installers for each of the dependencies of each of the softwares that will install, okay, after you hit execute. So this will be some packages that are needed, particularly regarding libraries in Microsoft. I know that this seems a process that's a bit cumbersome, but that's because uh, the products from MySQL have certain dependencies that need to be installed. So here, when you have these products, for example, this one, just hit install, close it. You'll see that you'll start to have here more processes that you can do. But for example, this was the only uh, dependency that was uh, not installed in my computer. So after I installed that Microsoft Visual C++ uh, package that was needed after hitting execute, now I have all of these uh, packages available and I can just hit next. Okay, so don't do next without doing the execute and installing every software that MySQL is asking, okay, on the side. You'll see new windows popping up if you need that. Just make sure that when you hit next, okay, now one or more products requirements have not been satisfied, click yes. But just make sure that when you are on this window after hitting next, that you have here MySQL Workbench and MySQL Server and also MySQL Shell. So these are the three most important products that we will use. These ones must be on this list right here. If you don't have them, go uh, return. And when you are on this window, you'll have here the products where you need to install some dependencies. Do that with the execute command. And then only after that, only after having sure that you have these products right here in the installation, you can go forward, click execute, and our software will start to install it. Or at least our different softwares will start to install. So another important thing while this is installing is to differentiate between the MySQL server, MySQL workbench, MySQL shell, for example, and SQL. So SQL is a language, okay? SQL is what we are going to code on. It's the language that we are going to use to code and it's an acronym for Structured Query Language. We can use SQL in multiple softwares. In this case, we need to have a database server in our machine the MySQL server so that we can manipulate tables back and forth in our computer. Then we need the MySQL workbench because the MySQL workbench will be the software that we'll use to code. So that's where we are going to write our code and our SQL code will be interpreted and send commands to our server. Okay, so that's what the workbench is going to do. We'll see it in a minute. Then we have the shell. In this case, if you want to access via command line to your SQL server, you can do it using MySQL shell. And then you have here other products that are basically connectivity products and also documentation products that are cool to have also and to install when you install MySQL, okay? So these four concepts are different. SQL is the language, okay? MySQL Workbench is the software that we use to access the server, which is the MySQL server. And then the MySQL shell is what we can also use instead of the workbench to communicate with our server. 
So the workbench is much more cooler because we have an interactive interface where we can click on buttons and also send commands. So it has a front end, while the shell doesn't have a front end. Okay, that's the main difference. Both of them access the MySQL server, which is what interprets and reads SQL code. Okay, just to uh, put these concepts uh, separate and for you not to get confused at this stage, but all of these will be relevant. Uh, the shell, not so much, but we can install it. But all the other ones, SQL, the workbench and the server are essential for us to continue with the course. Okay. So let me also know if you are having any trouble installing any of these softwares. I know that this is not a straightforward install process where you just click two buttons and install and that's it because MySQL has a lot of dependencies, but even so it's, uh, it shouldn't be hard to install this software. Okay, so after all of these softwares installed, just hit next. You may notice that I've changed the machine where I was working on because uh, MySQL was having a bit of trouble in the virtual machine that I was doing a clean install because of the Windows version. I had a Windows 8 version, so a pretty old Windows version on that Windows machine. That's also a learning. If you have those versions on your machine, probably you'll have more issues installing MySQL. So uh, Windows versions older than Windows 10, for example. Okay, now we need to configure the server mainly. That's what we are going to do here in the installer. I'm going to hit next and here we can do a, config, a configuration type, makes sense for you to use development computer uh, for instance, and then just keep this uh, as default, okay? Everything that you see right here, click next. Authentication method, leave use strong password encryption, okay? And then just define a password that you remember, of course, uh, that will be used uh, for you to connect to the server, to the uh, MySQL server every time we want to work with SQL. So I'm going to hit uh, my password here. I'll hit check. Remember that this password must be something that you remember uh, so that you may be able to use it when you are uh, working with MySQL because you'll need to type this password to connect to your local server. Okay, so after the check is done, we can hit next. And then you have here Windows service name for MySQL. You can configure MySQL as a Windows service. You can uncheck probably start MySQL at Windows startup, at system startup, because if you are not going to work with MySQL every time you log into your computer, it doesn't make sense for this to be uh, checked. And then run Windows server. You can use standard system account, which is the recommended for most scenarios. Hit next and execute all these configurations. Okay, so these configurations will enable us to connect to our local server every time we want to talk with data that we have on that local server. You'll understand this when we work with MySQL, particularly in the first lectures. Okay, so finish and you can hit next now. This will have the router configuration. Just hit finish. Uh, no, it's not relevant. And TCP server also here just introducing the password, your password, the one that you've defined before. Hit check, you'll see that the connection is succeeded. This is just a test to see if everything is set up in your computer. Hit next and execute. And now this will apply the configuration to uh, the server. Okay, so after this, we'll be ready to start to code in SQL using the MySQL workbench. Finish, let's hit next, of course. And now you can do uh, start MySQL workbench after setup. I'll leave both of these checks on so that we have both MySQL workbench and MySQL shell for you to check. Let's hit finish and there you go. Okay, so both softwares just popped up. This is MySQL shell. This is where we can use SQL code directly in a command line type of interface. Let's not open MySQL shell again in this course. This uh, will not use this interface, okay? But if you want, if you are already aware of how common lines work and you want to experiment a bit, you can use shell all the time. Of course, that's a personal choice. I'm going to close MySQL shell and there you go. We have here MySQL Workbench. This is the software and the interface that we will use to do everything here in this course. Here from this window, I can use this connection right here, local. I'm going to connect it and you can see that this is already uh, asking for my password. I'm going to put my password, the one that I've set before and do okay. And now MySQL will open as you can see. So super cool, we have here all the interface that we need 
This is where we are going to code in SQL inside this script uh, file, okay? So this is what we commonly call a script file. And this is where we are going to type our SQL code. So select all from something. Of course, these are statements that we are going to learn in a minute, but this is our interface to code in SQL. Every time we'll do something here in SQL, we'll communicate with the server. So the SQL server that we've just installed that contains these databases. Of course, these databases have already been created by me for the course and you probably have less, okay? so. This is it for loading MySQL. This is the window that we will use, okay? You have here several stuff that we'll explore also when we need. We'll not need much of these options right here, okay? So because we'll mostly need everything that we have here. I'll also explain the divisions that we have, for example, what's this output and the log for the errors and all that in subsequent lectures. This was just for you to uh, have MySQL up and running in your system. That's it for this lecture. In the next lecture, we are going to see how we can create the database that we will use throughout this course, or at least through most of this course, which is the Sakila database. And in the next lecture, I'll explain how you can create this on your site. Super simple, just two clicks and an execute button. Okay, so we're almost ready to start coding in SQL. I'll see you in the next lecture. Hello everyone and welcome again to the SQL course. So let's set up the Sakila database, which will be the database that we'll use uh, throughout the course, which is a sample database that we can use with MySQL for teaching purposes. So you can go here to Google and just type Sakila database download, okay? And here go to the first link, which is on the dev MySQL uh, website. And you can go here to the installation. This should put you on the for installation of the Sakila database. And you can hit this link that you see here. The Sakila sample database is available from this link. And here you can just go a bit down and where you have example databases, Sakila database, just hit the zip file, okay? This will download this zip file that you see right here. I'll also leave this in the course materials. And if you go to the downloads, you'll have here this Sakila db.zip. Let me open it. I'm going to unzip it and put it here. So here we have these uh, three scripts. Okay, so these three SQL scripts. I'm going to go to the course materials to show you where they are in the course materials. So here in the SQL for Absolute Beginners course, you have the Sakila database. And inside you'll have this Sakila slash db, okay? Here we see do two SQL files and I'm going to do something. Now that we have MySQL Workbench installed, you can do the following. You can start with this Sakila slash schema, just open it, click twice on this SQL file. And here this will open a schema that we have with the Sakila database. Okay, so what you can do is now that you open MySQL, go here to this reconnect to DBMS so that you connect to the server, click OK. This will ask for the password again. Hit your password, you'll connect to the server. And now go again here on the top to this Sakila schema. You know that you're connected to the server because you see here databases, that's how you know that you're connected. And now just select everything with control A. So on the script use control A and hit this lightning bolt that we see right here that will execute this part of the code. Now, if I run this, don't worry, this is just to create a database. You'll understand what these commands really mean in the future during the course. And now if you go here to the left side and hit uh, right click, refresh all, you see that you have now here a cool structure, Sakila, which will be the structure that we will use. Okay, now what you can do is return to the course materials and open the Sakila slash data file. Okay, and in this file, what we are going to do is exactly the same thing. You control use control A to select the entire code. If you don't have the connection to the server, it's because you are here in different tabs on top, as you can see. And this means that this is connected to the local server. This tab is not. That's why you can't use the code here inside. That's an important difference. If you want, you can just connect again, or you can copy all this code, selecting all the code that's highlighted in blue, go here to local, open here a new query, and just paste the entire code that we've seen on the other side, or you can go here to the unconnected and connect again to the server, okay? Now it will not ask for a password because you already have one of the tabs here connected to a server, and you can go to the Sakila data, select everything, use the lightning bolt, and this will put data 
inside your Secular database. That's what we need to do to get this data uh, up and running and to be able to query this data in the subsequent lectures. Now, if you go here to tables, you see that this is basically a database that contains information about movies and about a rental store, a movie rental store, like we had one of those blockbusters, I don't know if you remember, that seems like a long, long time ago, but it's similar, the structure of the tables are similar to that. We'll have the opportunity to explore uh, much of the Secular database, but if you have any trouble right now and you want to understand really deeply how this tables work, because we'll just use specific use cases of this database, you can read the Secular documentation online also if you are interested in learning more. But now we have already SQL setup and also the data ready or most of the data that we will use throughout the course, this sample database that's also common for other courses. Uh, so this is the one that's uh, super easy to understand, so we'll also start with that. Okay, of course, during the course, we'll also create our own tables and our own data, which will be relevant for use cases that we will do. Okay, so we have everything set up. Let's continue and let's really start to code in SQL, learning how this language works. And when you use this language to manipulate data, I think uh, things will make a lot more sense regarding even the tabular format of the data. You'll see how easy it is to manipulate it using SQL. So I hope you're excited, let's continue, and I'll see you in the next lecture. Hello everyone, and welcome to the SQL course. I'll ask you to open a MySQL that we've just installed and connect to your local connection, where we have loaded in the previous lectures the Sakila database, the one that we are going to use for our examples. As soon as you are in MySQL, just click your local connection, enter the password, and you'll be inside MySQL software that will interpret our SQL code. So here I am on SQL with the databases here on the left or the schemas, you can call them in both ways. And here is the SQL file or the SQL editor. So in this lecture, we are going to start to code in SQL and learn the most basic instructions that we can use regarding SQL. You can find these script files here in the basic querying folder in the course materials. The one that we are going to see now is this simple select statements. I'm going to double click this file and open it here immediately on MySQL. Notice again, as soon as I double click my SQL file, MySQL will fire and I'll be able to manipulate this SQL file inside uh, MySQL Workbench. Every time I'm referring MySQL, I'm referring to MySQL Workbench, which is the UI that we are using, but of course you can also interact with everything using the command line from MySQL. Okay, let me create here a new query. So I'll use new query tab so that we can start to work on our database. Notice when you open some script from a folder, you have to connect probably again to the local environment. Just click OK here after going to this icon right here. Okay, so we have reconnect to DBMS. If in some way your connection is not established because of something, just go here and then a window will pop up. You click OK and you'll be again available to access the tables inside the schemas that we have here on the left. Let's start with the most basic SQL command that we can think of, which is a simple select statement. Most, if not all, I think SQL commands start with this word select. What we might want to do is just select everything from a simple table. So select all the columns and rows from a single table. And how we can do that? Select asterisk. As soon as you get more advanced in SQL, you will see that this asterisk is normally uh, not quite suited for most operations because you don't have any traceability of the columns that you are choosing. So it's normally better to explicitly name the columns instead of using this asterisk. This is just, of course, for learning purposes. So here what we want to do is select everything, where the word everything is encapsulated in this asterisk right here. Let me also zoom this a bit. And here you see this asterisk and the word select. And now what we can do is select all from. And this is normally the archetype of a query, a SQL query. You have this select and you have a from. Of course, you have multiple instructions that you can use. And you also have other clauses that we'll study uh, throughout this course. Now, as you can see, we have here select all from something and we have to give two things, the database name and the table name. So in my case, what I want is the Secula, which is the database. So the database is named Secula, as I can see here on the left. 
And here I have this schema or database with several tables. How can I give the tables? I enter a dot and then I give the name of the table from where I want to select from. In this case, I want to select all the movies. So I know that the movies is in this film. Go here, select all from secular.film. Now I'll have to close this uh, just to make sure with a dot and a comma. There are certain UIs or SQL implementations that don't need this dot and a comma explicitly. Here in MySQL, you need this dot and a comma to run multiple instructions as we will do. I can run this code in multiple ways. I can select all this code and just go here, execute this statement. Then you can also run this one. The difference between these two buttons is that this one enables you to run the entire code top to bottom if nothing is selected. Something where the behavior from this button is a bit different. Okay, so if I want to run this code, for example, I'll just highlight it here, or in this case, I'm not going to highlight anything, and I hit this button that will run my query. Here is the result from the query. As you can see, I have here all the movies that I have in this table. I only limited this to 1,000 rows in the output, so if I go down here, I'll only have 1,000 rows. This null line is basically to indicate where my table finishes or where the results finish. Okay, so we've just selected everything from secular.film. Now, a uh, typical question is, what if I only want to select a specific column or one or two columns? That is extremely easy. I'm going to copy this query, and then I'm going to put the query below. This means that now when I run this statement, I'll have several results that will be ran. Here, if I run with this button, I don't have anything selected. So right now, I only want a table instead of using this select all from secular.film. I'm going to use uh, just the title. So instead of having this everything or asterisk, I'll have title and then I'll have release here. So this is the simple way to select multiple columns by name. The difference is that here in this first query, we return all the columns. In this one, we just return two of them, title and release here. Let's check what will happen if I select this code and just run here. Now, as you notice, the result is a bit different. We only have two columns, although we have the full list of movies. Of course, we are only limited to a thousand rows again. You can also don't limit the rows. I'm going to do that. If I do here, don't limit the rows and hit run, I'll have all the movies. And here, if I do that, I'll also have all the movies. In this case, I think the Sequila database actually has only 1,000 movies. So <laughs> it's actually prepared for these types of examples. If you have more rows, they will not show. By coincidence, this table only has a thousand rows and I can do that don't worry about that with count asterisk and running this code so I have a thousand rows on this table and don't get confused with what you are seeing on the console and what the table has underneath in this case in this example they match so you have thousand rows on the table and as you are limiting to thousand rows you will you also see the entire table here or the entire data here on my SQL for example, if I limit to less, if I limit to 200 and I run this one, I only have here on the console 200 rows. That doesn't mean that the table doesn't have the thousand rows that we've seen before. You can also do these limits in code to learn them uh, further ahead. Okay, I'm going to leave again thousand rows. Now we've seen how we can subset columns it's with this statement, super simple. I'm going to run this again. Let's see what happens if I run these instructions without having anything selected. As you will notice probably here, these two queries ran at the same time. You can notice that they were run at the same time. Well, if I just select this one and run it, and let me push this a bit up, I don't think I can zoom this in, so I'm sorry about that. But you can also see this in your console, is that the only one that runs is the one that I've just selected instead of both queries. Okay, this is the execution, so the log of the executions that we've been doing. And here we have the number of the execution, so the query that we've just ran, and the time where that query ran, and what was the action, in this case the query itself, and the message of returning, in this case 1000 rows returning, 
200 when we've limited those rows. Notice here this extra limited that was given by the UI when we ran that query. Don't worry about this uh, for now and the duration of the query. For example, if I misspell the release year and call release year one, which is a column that doesn't exist in the skill.film table, what we will see when I try to run this is a different message. You see an error. This means that our query is wrong. And you can see here in the message that messages in SQL are pretty self-explanatory most of the times. So you see here error code 1054, an unknown column release year one in fill list. This is self-explanatory. This means that the release year one is a column that doesn't exist in our table. Okay, I'm going to return this to the original name and run here SQL release year. Let me also bring the log down. Every time I call log, I'm speaking about this action output right here. And now I have here the table that I want to check. There are also other things which are really simple in SQL, which are called the alias. Alias are a really important concept here also in the language. Alias is basically just calling something as another thing. So basically, they're just renaming stuff. And you can rename columns, you can rename tables. An example. I'm going to rename columns here, for example, renaming columns. And what I'm doing here with this hashtag is doing comments. They are pretty common when you are developing to add comments just to explain logic or to explain something that you are doing regarding the business requirements. Super common to do. There's also another way to do comments that I'll show you after. Just know that every time I'm entering an hashtag means that I'm commenting something and this code will be executed as text, not a SQL code. It will be pure text. Okay, so I'm going here, select title, and I can now do something. Title as title one. What this means is that the output will return me a table with the column title named as title one, okay? I can rename the column from the output of my query. I'm not changing anything in the sequilo.film. What I'm doing, just renaming this column for the output, okay? And I can call, for example, release year as year of uh, rel. Let's call it in this way. I know this is a pretty uh, dumb example, but it's just for you to see how this changes the output itself. I'm going to run this query. And now, as you can see, the column here, this one is called titled underscore one, and this one is called year underscore rel, okay? Now, also, we have alias for columns, but we may also have alias for tables. So if I go here, I'm just going to let me remove this output and call alias for tables. This is pretty common in SQL queries. So select title and release here from sequila.film. If I don't want to refer to this table, sequila.film, in everywhere in my script, and when you have like a really big query, this is extremely convenient, what I can do is, for example, as F. And now every time I call this F in my query, it will be read as the sequila.film. For example, select F.title and F.release here. This is extremely interesting when we are doing joins or combining tables, as we will see. Right now, it doesn't seem to have many practical implications, but you will see that this is really convenient. I'm going to close this query, run it, and this will run all the same. As you will see, here it is. So here are our returning results. If you want to change the font here, you might have noticed that the font here changed the size of the font. I just went here, show preferences dialog. This was something that I've done uh, also and change here a bit of the font size. Just adjust this to what's more convenient for you. I'm going to change this, for example, to 12, scripting shell to 12, and this SQL editor to 14. And now this probably in the next execution is going to change a bit of the results. Let me see if changes a bit. It changes. We have like bigger fonts here. It's convenient because you will also be able to uh, view better what I'm doing here. So that's why I've done this change right now. As you can see, the alias also returned title release here, but I've just called this f dot title and f dot release here. When we have multiple tables in the query, you'll see that this is pretty convenient. 
And that's it for the first lecture on SQL. So I hope you're excited to continue with this course. We are going to learn a lot of SQL instructions. These are, of course, the most basic ones, but most SQL queries that you will do throughout your journey will be based on selects and froms. They'll always contain these two clauses or mostly contain these two clauses. So these are, of course, the basic ones for us to study. So here we've just filtered columns. Let's proceed with our study and understand how we can filter rows in the next lecture. Thank you very much for enrolling in this course and I'll see you in the next lecture. Hi everyone and welcome again to this SQL course. Here in this lecture we are going to check filters and how we can use filters to manipulate our tables. So I'm going to ask you to open SQL and the script that we are going to use is this two simple filter statements that's inside the second folder of our course materials. Let's start. I'm going to close this one and then open here a new query file here in this button that you can see, SQL plus, this means that we are opening a new query. Now, this is because we are going to code along in this lecture and we are going to start the script from scratch. Now, I'm going to go here to reconnect to DBMS. Don't forget that if you are not connected to your database management system, that means that you can access those tables when you do your queries. So this is a really important step. Let's go here, local, don't forget, click OK then we should connect if you have your password set in for every time you connect to the DBMS. You just have to enter the password that we've defined when we've done setting up the local environment to work on our database management system. Okay, now let's go and learn a bit more about filters. So we are going to work again with our uh, Sakila database. So, so if I go here again to Sakila.film, let me just take out my headphones to be a bit more comfortable. Okay. Now, if I go here to my sakila.film and now from the last lecture, what's missing here in this query. So we are selecting everything from the sakila.film, but there's a keyword missing, of course, the from keyword, as you might notice, then dot and comma. Let's run this one. Okay, cool. So here is our full table. As we were seeing, we have here around a thousand movies. How can we filter, for example, a specific movie by name if you only want to check the row or return the row that has that movie name? Well, for that, we have a really important clause, which is the WHERE clause. The WHERE clause comes right after the FROM clause, and here you can filter the table as you want. There are many ways to do filters. There are filters that are more complicated to understand, others that are more simple to understand, but we are going to start building this concept uh, as the course goes by so that we are comfortable with more advanced concepts. We are going to do a really simple query here. We are going to do a really simple filter here where we are going to check, for example, where the title of our movie is going to be equal to something. And this something will be, for example, let me pick up this anonymous human, uh, which is the name of the movie. Notice that I'm passing here anonymous human between quotes. Why is that? Because this is being interpreted as text by SQL, okay? Here, title, as we are giving, so I want everything from Sakila.film where the title is equal to something, but this something needs to be the text because that's the data type. We'll see more about data types in the course, but because that's the data type that this column contains in the table. As this is a text data type, we need to pass everything in commas. This is really similar to other programming languages. We are talking about text most of the times. Okay, so here what we are doing is just saying, hey, please return me all the rows where the title is equal to anonymous human. I think we only have one movie with that name. Let's confirm. There you go. Only one movie. It's the row or the film ID number 27. So this is the most simple query that we can think of. Here we are filtering on rows, reducing our table on rows. OK, we can also do that on columns, as we've seen, for example, removing here the asterisk, which is again, it's not the best practice and just selecting, for example, title and release here. In this case, we are going to return only the row for uh, the title equals to anonymous human, but we are also going to return only two columns, the ones that we are filtering on our select. Okay. Now you might be thinking, okay, here we have a case, I'm going to do some comments of equality. Now, what about inequality? So it's also common for us to want everything other than something. 
Well, in that case, I'm going to just copy this query here, put it here below. In that case, we just have to change the sign. So the equality sign. And here, this equality sign, instead of having title equals to anonymous human, we have title an exclamation mark equals anonymous human. So equality is represented with a single equals, inequality is represented with an exclamation mark and a symbol of equal. Okay, if I run this one, what I'm going to have is 999 movies because the one that was removed is exactly the anonymous human. If you go here, this is sorted alphabetically. So if you see here, we have any identity. After any identity and before Anthem Luke, we should have the anonymous human. It's not here in the query because we are selecting everything except this anonymous human movie. So remember here, you can do pass the column that you want to filter by and then pass the clause that you want to apply to that column. Okay, this is the most basic filtering that we can think of. Of course, there are other filters that we can do. For example, what if we want multiple filters? There are AND OR clauses that we are going to learn a bit uh, next. And also we are going to go a bit more deep into advanced filtering in a chapter of the course. Here are just having our first approach at filtering. But if I want to select, for example, two movies, so I want to select the anonymous movie and the Armageddon Lost, for example. How can I do that? Well, I'm going to put here multiple selections and I can do, for example, I want the title right now, the release here. Again, I'm going to use the same columns from sequila.film where, in, he, and this is the important part, title, and we use the keyword in. So the keyword in enables us to do multiple selections for the same column. So I can do anonymous human, and notice that I'm again passing the quotes because this is text, a comma, and pass the new title that I also want to filter, Armageddon Lost. So this is read as I want where the title is equal to Anonymous Human or where the title is equal to Armageddon Lost. This is an OR clause because we want one or the other. We don't have really have a movie that has two different titles at the same time. That is impossible. So that's why it doesn't make sense to think about this as an AND clause. What's this is title is anonymous human or title is Armageddon lost. If I close this query and execute it, we'll have two rows, exactly the two rows with the names of the movies that we wanted. Okay, AND clause. But the AND clause is a bit more cumbersome when we have several examples that we want to filter going to copy this one and show you how we can do this with the AND clause. So the AND clause would be where title equals to anonymous human. And instead of having this comma, we'd have AND and we would have to repeat title equals to Armageddon lost. And now here with the AND, we are not going to return anything. Okay, because the AND clause requires that both conditions are correct. And if I run this one, I have nothing. Why? Because I've done a small trick here, which is introduce a new concept uh, based on the concept before. This isn't really an AND clause, as I've told you. This is an OR clause, okay? So if I do this, OR, I have where the title is equal to Anonymous Human or the title is equal to Armageddon Lost, okay? I'm going to change it here for an OR clause. Now, repeating what I've done before, if I go here, change to end, I'm looking for a row where the title is equal to anonymous human and the title is equal to Armageddon Lost. That's impossible. There's no way that a movie has two titles at the same time. Okay. So a really important part is that you can use end, for example, if I do release here 2006, notice that I remove the quotes. Why? Because this is a number. This should be treated as a number. The release here is not text. And here I can run this one and I'll have a returning value of the anonymous human and also the release year that I've selected because these two conditions can be the same at the same time. Don't get too confused about it. We'll explore more in the advanced filtering. Just know that here you are using multiple selections. Okay. With this in, we are asking for the column is equal to A or equal to B. Okay. That's the same as doing this. But imagine this is a bit cumbersome when we have several clauses. For example, if we wanted 10 movies, we would have to repeat this or title or title or title 10 times. That would be a bit weird and a bit hard to uh, understand also for someone that would be reading your code 
while this form, the in form, is a bit more clean. For example, we can do another experiment with the here with the end clause. I'm going to release here, and I can also select title. For example, select title from sakila.film where the title. I'm going to remove this and say, for example, where the rental rate is less than 1,999 and the release here is equal to 26. Let's see if this will return us anything. And it does, so all these movies that we are seeing here are movies that have a rental rate less than $1.99 and have their release here in 2006. If I change this to 2007, what we'll have is a different set. In this case, there are no movies that match this condition. Okay, so that's why we have an empty query right here. You might have noticed that I've used this symbol right here, less than. This is because we can also do these filters based on mathematical operations. Less than, less than equal, greater than, greater than equal. Let's explore them. So mathematical operations, and they can only be done, or at least they make more sense, on mathematical columns or on integer or numeric columns. For example, if I select the title of all the movies, and I'm going to put title, I'm even going to commit <laughs> this, which is having a select all from sequila.film where the rental rate is less than 1.99. Let's see what we will have. So basically, these are all the movies that match this condition, less than 1.99. I may have, for example, we have rental rates of 0 0.99. If I put less than equal, I'll also include the 1.99s, okay? Because Without the equal, they're just doing less than without including the value. If I have an equal, I'll include the value also. And this will change a bit of my table because I think I'll have here from the rental rates. I don't know if there's any rental rate with 199. I think there's not, so nothing will change. Let's see, for example, 299. There we go, we have here 299s, as you can see, this is a better example. If I take out the equal to 2.99, what we'll have is then less movies, because there are some of them that are on the 299 threshold. Okay, let's see, for example, this experiment, which is doing this with, I don't know, the title, title less than 2 or less than equal, I'll put less than 299, let's check. And this will basically translate this query into a bit more uh, into something a bit more strange, which is trying to order characters by their order in the alphabet, which is a bit strange. Uh, typically, it's not that used. For example, if I do less than B in the title and run this one, I'll have only the movies that start with A. Everything that starts after B will not show up. This is not that much common, I would say. Uh, so the less than, greater than, less than, equal, greater than, equal are more used with integer columns than really with text columns, at least in most use cases. So if I go, for example, for release year over 2005, what we'll have as I run this one is all the movies that were released after 2005. I think all of them were released after 2005. Let me change here for example length makes sense to see the length length over a hundred so all the movies with more than 100 minutes if we run this one we'll have a subset of the movies only the ones where this length right here is over a hundred this is the symbol for greater than okay we are comparing each row uh, to check if the row matches the condition in this case if the column length matches this condition row by row and only the examples only the rows that match this condition will be on your output query okay on this value right here the movies that have less or equal than 100 minutes of length will not show up in the result from this query okay just make sure that you understand this and that this is not the original table this is already a filtered table as we are seeing it and only contains the movies that have more than 100 minutes of length. All right, so I think this was uh, just a basic introduction on filtering. We'll use a lot of things with filtering throughout the course, and also we'll have exercises on filtering for you to practice filtering the table that basically shortens your uh, original table based on some condition. Just to recap, what we've seen is then equality, 
here, inequality with uh, character values or with character columns. We've seen multiple selections, the AND and OR clauses, and then we've seen the comparisons of greater than, less than, greater than or equal, and less than or equal. Of course, there's also equality for the integer columns. If I want here, just to uh, wrap this up, if I want here to check select title from secular.film where rental rate is equal to 199, nothing prevents me to do that. And I'll check there's no movies as we've seen with this rental rate. But if I change to 2.99, now I'll have only the movies with uh, that rental rate. And for us to confirm it, let me put the column here and run this one. As you'll see, only the movies with this specific rental rate are in the output that we see here on the console. Of course, if we can use this equality with character columns, but also with integer columns, okay? Uh, no worries about that. Uh, so you can use this equality and inequality as you want with all the data types. We'll also see data types again in the subsequent uh, section. Okay, that was it for filtering. Next, we are going to learn how to create new columns and also how to create columns that are derived from existing columns in our table. So far, we've seen simple select statements, also how to subset columns, we've seen aliases, and we've also seen filters here in this lecture. So I hope you've enjoyed this lecture. Let's go to the next part, which is building new columns. Hello everyone and welcome back to the SQL course. In this sequence of lectures we are going to deal with new columns and how we can create new columns based on information we have already in the table or completely new columns based on new information. The script that we are going to use is this three new columns and calculations that you can find on the course materials. I'm going to open a new script file and connect to my DBMS. Okay, cool. So let's start now with another table called Sequila. So let me put select all from Sequila.actor. So this is the table on the Sequila database that contains the names of the actors that were in the film or in the movie. So as you can see, we have here all the names. I think these are uh, made up names, so they are not real actors, as you might have noticed. And here we have several names. So first name and last name. Now. One of the things that we might do to create new columns is just to give some type of value to this new column. One of the most common things we can do is, for example, here it makes sense to have a role. Everybody in this table is an actor, so what we can do is just give actor, and now I'll give an alias as, I'm going to put person role. Now here I'm creating a new column called person role. This is the alias for the new column. Notice how this is similar from creating or renaming columns that as we've seen in the past lectures, an actor is going to be the value for the entire column. So for all the rows that we have right here, everyone will be assigned to this value actor. We'll learn further ahead how we can do conditionals, but that's a more advanced expression that we can use. And now what I can do is of course put here sequila.actor and run this query. As you can see, now we have all the columns, check that I'm selecting everything from the origin table and then I'm adding a new column called person role that contains this actor value. And as you can see here, we see actor for every row that we have on our table. So now we have a new column in our resulting query that we've added just by using comma and assigning an expression to an alias. I can also do this, for example, adding another comma and putting more values that will be added after the table here ends. Okay, I'm going to close this. So this is how I've created a new column on my table. And just to recap, value as, by Elias, the name of the column that I'm creating. In this case, this is just assigning a single value to the entire column. So every row will have the same value. Okay, so as I've said, we are also going to learn conditionals in uh, subsequent lectures. Don't worry about it because that's a bit more advanced. Here we are just assigning a single value. Now another thing that we might do is like creating columns or new columns based on existing information. So based on columns that already exist in our table. Here it makes sense, for example, to have the full name here for the actor. So we have the first name in a column, last name in the other column. Let's create a full name column. And I'm going to do the following. I'm going to do 
select all again so everything that's already in my base table and now notice i'm not selecting the person role why is that because here i just created the person role for the output of my query i didn't change anything in the table that's a bit more advanced as we will see in a couple of sections where we are going to manipulate base tables themselves okay so here what i can do then i'm going to put as full name from and I'm going to say secular.active. Now I want to compound on information from these columns, so from first name and last name. And this is where I introduce the concept of functions. So functions are things that we can do inside our SQL tables that take arguments, and there are a ton of functions that we can use. Here we are going to search for the first one called concat. Okay, if you have any question regarding functions, you just go to Google and search, for example, SQL functions, and you'll have here, for example, SQL server functions or SQL functions. And here in the first link on Google or the second one, you can find a lot of functions that you can use and try for yourself. Of course, we are not going to go extensively through every function because that would be a bit boring. But what we are going to do is to uh, use these functions in subsequent lectures and also throughout the exercises. So there are probably some exercises where you'll need to search these functions for yourself so that you are able to also learn how to search new functions and insert the arguments for those functions. So without further ado, let's uh, test our first function and develop it. So the function that we are going to use as a spoiler is this concat function. Look at the description adds two or more strings together. This is exactly what we want to do with the full name. Because right now, if I go to my SQL, what I want to do is to pick up the first name and add the last name to the end. So I'm going to use that concat function. Now, this is how we give arguments to the function. We open close parentheses and inside there will be the arguments that we want to add to our function. Okay, so every function has its arguments and the arguments are different. The number of arguments are different, the type of the arguments. For that, we need to go to the documentation of the function itself. Here, if I go to concat, as you can see, I have here select concat, an example. So a string, this takes a string, as you can see, string one, string two, until string n. By string, I mean characters, okay? I mean text. And then you can see here the parameter values, this website, W3 Schools, has a lot of information regarding the functions. So here I already know how I can give arguments. I need to pass concat. And then I, what I can do is pass a string and all the other strings that I want to concatenate in the same string or in the same text. Again, when I'm referring string, I'm referring text and character. This will be a bit more explicit in the data types. You'll understand and get more familiar with this string concept. So here now, what I can pass? Well, I want to concatenate every first name and last name that we have right here. So what I can do is just pass the name of these columns. What's going to happen is that this function will be applied row by row, okay? Because for example, if I do select concats, a, B, and I run this query, and now notice, I don't have a from. That's because I'm not getting any information from any table. An A is an A, it doesn't come from any table, and a B is also a B, it's just the letter B, it doesn't come from any table. So here, I don't need to pass the from. It's rare that you do this uh, select without a from in most SQL applications. When you are using SQL, you are, of course, getting some information from some table. This is just something that's enabled by the language. You can use selects just to see outcomes and you don't want any information from a table. I'm going to run this one and here, as you can see, concat AV doesn't have an alias. If it doesn't have an alias, it will get the expression as the name of the column, which is of course a bit weird. But then we have AB. If I add here a C, what we'll have when I run this query is ABC. I can also, of course, change for an alias as concat alias. Now what we'll have is the value abc and concat alias. Concat underscore alias, abc, of course, this doesn't mean anything because it's just an output from uh, a no table, okay? So 
if I substitute this from the information that comes in the table, for example, first name and last name, and run this one, what we'll have is a new column called first name that has the combination of both strings, of both the first name and the last name, okay? So as you might notice, we have here Penelope Guinness, which is a combination of the two. So as the full name, we might want to have a white space between the first name and the last name, so that it makes more sense for us to read it. So I'm going to add a new argument here, and this will concatenate the three strings altogether. Notice that this is applied row by row, which is exactly what we want. Okay, so first name, we concatenate with the last name, in this case, Penelope Guinness, then we have Nick Wahlberg, then we have Ed Chase, and when we run this query and this function itself, it will be applied row by row because we are picking up some information from a table. If we don't have a from, we'll have only a single result, okay? And as you can see, we have here the full name as the new column. Notice that I've also given an alias. If I take out the alias, what will happen is that the full name will have uh, this uh, expression as the column name, which is a bit weird, of course. So that's why the alias is so cool here because it already names our column as we want, full name. So this is how we've done a new column based on two things, information existing on our column and also a function. So remember, function will take arguments and the arguments will be applied row by row, okay? So we'll have first argument is the first name of every row, then we'll have a blank space, which is a space that will be applied also for every row, although this part will not be picked up from the table because it's just a blank space. And then we'll have the last name, which will be picked up row by row again. And this concat function will be producing a full name for every row on our table. Okay, I hope this was explicit and you could understand this concept of applying functions. Applying functions using open close parentheses will have opportunity to practice this in the practical lectures. Okay, now what we also can do is do mathematical expressions. For example, I'm going to use here mathematical expressions. One of the things that we can do, I'm going to do select all uh, from sakila.actor and what I can do is, for example, multiplying this actor ID by 100. Doesn't make much sense, but let's just try it. Actor ID times 100. Now what we'll have is a new column, and I'm going to give an alias as calc. What we'll have is a new column that will have for the first row 100, for the second 200, for the third 300 and so on. Doesn't make much sense in terms of the table because this is an ID, but it's just for you to see a mathematical operation happening. As you can see, we have here the calculation will be applied row by row. All the actor ID will be multiplied by something. This is extremely useful for when we are doing several calculations. For example, if we have a table of orders from customers and we want to apply some discount to those orders, we can do this calculation for every order, row by row, as an example. Now, one of the cool things is that SQL, just like R or Python, uh, conveys the mathematical rules that we know about. For example, if I go here for select actor ID times 100 uh, from sakila.actor, this is just exactly the same query, I'm going to run as calc. If I do the following, if I enclose this in parentheses and then add hundred or it will be more interesting to see in this way plus 10 times 100 what will happen is that this actor ID plus 10 will be computed first the multiplication will only happen after uh, we've done the first calculation and if I run this one you will notice that this for example actor ID plus 10 will be done first instead of multiplying first 1 by 100 and then adding 10. So the precedences from the parentheses apply here also in SQL. Everything that you are used to do with mathematics before with the parentheses rules and precedences are translated here in SQL when you do mathematical operations, okay? Just make sure that you remember that. Main operators that I'm going to put here just an example. I'm going to take out the parentheses just because it's not the core now. And for example, we have division. So actor ID divided by 100 
which will divide and the division is this bar lean to the right we have the minus I'm going to do here minus and minus one so that I don't have any problem with the output and there you go so we have the minus and then we have the plus as you can see here I'm going to add a plus here plus one and as you notice we have here the calculation done so division multiplication as uh, adding and subtracting okay cool so we've done new columns here first based on uh, value for example actor as person role then we have uh, new columns based on information on our table with this concat function we've computed the full name of the actor we've done a few calculations here using mathematical expressions that we can use also to create new columns based on information on the table last thing is that there are also some functions that are mathematical functions the concatenation was done to concatenate several strings we might have for example select log to apply the logarithm of actor id as calc from secular.actor as you will see if i run this one i have here the logarithm of all the actor ids of course again this doesn't make much sense in terms of the table but it's just for you to see that the logarithm is being applied for example logarithm of one is zero and we have this function log that we can apply to every row on the table notice that the way of calling this function log is exactly the same as calling the concat log you pass the name of the function you open close parentheses and that's it you enter the arguments inside and you have as a return the resulting value from that function okay so there are also multiple mathematical functions that we can use we'll also explore some of them throughout the course so this was a lecture on creating new columns manipulating uh, data to have new columns in our table next we are going to continue with this basic querying entering the concept of querying clauses which is a really really important baseline concept here for sql so let's continue forward i hope you are enjoying this course and i'll see you in the next lecture hello everyone and welcome again to this sql for absolute beginners course so we've spoke about several query clauses and by query clauses i mean the select the from and the where clause that are the basic clauses that one can use when coding in sql now there are also three other commonly used query clauses that are super important for you to understand and to study by mastering these six query clauses you'll probably be prepared to work with the majority of the use cases that use sql okay they are really really important and they usually show up uh, in most use cases we are going to use the script for dash query clauses that you can find in the course materials i'm going to open a new query i already have my connection uh, done but if you don't have don't forget to go to connect to database press ok if you need to set up the password the system will give you a pop-up just enter the password and you're good to go okay so as we've talked about we've seen the select clause that enables you to select something the from clause that enables you to pick up the structure of a table or data the select you can also in the select for example create columns and we've seen the where clause that is used to filter data coming from a table now the next query clause that we are going to see is the group by clause now the group by is a really important clause because it enables you to produce some statistics or some data for a specific group what do i mean by this well imagine that we have a table that contains several months for the sales of a store you may be interested in having the average sales per month for a specific store in that case you need to go to the group by when you are building a use case everything that contains the uh, sentence or similar to the sentence i want to do something by something is normally treated using a group by clause for ourselves we have here several information in the secular.film let's go to the secular.film again and check the information there are certain things that we might want to do for example the uh, rating that we have right here which is the rating for example pg basically gives the range of the ages that can watch this movie you have the pg 13 so for people over 13 are able to 
see this movie we have the rated r's which are the ones only for people over 18 and this rating enables you to understand what's the content of that movie we may want to do for example a question which is does the length of the movie change according to the rating well what we can do is then to have the average length by the rating you see this this sentence is key because what we want is i want to have the average length of movies by rating in that case we can solve this with a group by clause and let's see that group by example so i'm going to select first of course the select keyword which is our first query clause and then i'm going to do the following avg which is a function okay avg stands for average and what we want to do is to build this function by a specific group so i'm going to say avg of the length and call this using an alias avg length notice one important thing we are using a function again so function open close parentheses and in this case this function needs to be grouped by a specific group okay so what i'm going to do is now from somewhere and in this case i'm going to say from secular.film of course i don't need a by if i want the average for all the movies in the database okay so if i want for example in this table to check what's the average length of all the movies in the database i don't i don't need to do a by column if i do the by for the key of the movie for the title that would be to have the own length of the movie unless there would be two movies with the same name it doesn't make much sense so what we can do is then to run this one without the group by and let's see what will happen in this case we have the average length of all the movies in the table is around 150.27 what we've done is this clause that aggregates the information for the entire table this is an aggregator function okay it's different from the functions that we've seen before although it's uh, called in the same way but this only produces a single row as you can see that by the, the average function only produces a single row doesn't apply the average function row by row which uh, of course would not be meaningful for this case so there are certain functions that are applied row by row and there are certain functions that are aggregators by themselves such as the average but connecting this with example of group by what if i want this average but obtain for each type of film for each rating of film in that case i need my new query clause group by the group by comes after the from in this case i need to say by which column i want to group by i have to add something first i need to add the column itself so i'm going to add rating on my select in this case what i'm doing is to add the rating as the aggregator column okay the column that we are going to use to group by our result and then i have to say in the group by what i want to group by so i need to select that column and then name it in the group by so if i run this one select rating and the average length what we'll have is not a single result we'll have the different lengths by each rating so it seems in this sample that the pg-13 has the highest average length as you can see now what will happen if i select the rating and also the length and also the average or the aggregator function let's see i'm going to go here and i'm going to run this one it doesn't make much sense i only have here first row 115.17 and the first rating that i have because i didn't give any group by so this result is really not the best result that i want because if i take out this rating and then run again I'll have that value 150.27 that's the average for the entire movies and if i put the rating it seems odd right because i have the rating pg it seems that the rating pg has this average length but it's not because this is just the first rating that we get so be really mindful of adding your group by clause because only with the group by clause it makes sense for us to do these aggregator functions such as average max or minimum as an example group by a specific column okay i'm going to run the group by again here and you will see now it makes much more sense the real average length of the pg movies is 112 minutes okay not the 150 that we were seeing that's the global of all the movies that's why the group by is crucial in this example 
there is also another thing that people commonly do in the group by I'm going to copy this one put it down here which is instead of naming the column in the group by they just give numbers so if I group by one this means that I'm grouping by the first column that's not in the aggregator function okay in this case I have rating and I put here group by one this is going to pick up the first column that we have right here so if I run this one I'll have exactly the same result okay this is of course it depends people tend to use this one because it's easier to write it may be a bit harder to understand because it's easier to see the columns that are being grouped by instead of having one two three something now if I want to group by multiple columns I'm going to pick up this one and if I want to group by multiple columns I can just do a comma and add the new column to group by for example I may want and let me return to the secular film to see another column that would make sense I may want to group by this uh, rental duration for example let's check rental duration so I can head here group by rating and rental duration now I can run this and we will see that we have for example several different PG's as you can see here PG PG and another PG and this is giving me different average lengths by each rating but now I have the ratings repeated why is that because I'm grouping by this column but I'm not adding this column to the select to make more sense I need to add the rental duration to the select statement and now I'll have rating rental duration and average length if I omit the rental duration here from the select is it's as if I'm hiding this column from the select although the calculation itself is being done because the group by is done before outputting the result so the group by calculation is done underneath in this table although it's not shown to you as a user that would be a bit hard to understand because you would not know which rating for example the different G's that we have here which rental duration they were uh, referring to if I take out this one just to see it again there you go I just have G G G but we don't know uh, which rental duration this is supposed to represent so don't forget add the column that you need here and now the select you have the rental duration in the end this is a multiple group by with two columns so more functions to use group by I'm going to pick up uh, this one the, the group by with only with the rating I can do for example max uh, whoops let me just change here max of the length this will give me exactly the maximum minutes of each type of movie or of each movie rating okay we can also use the mean is another example the mean will give me the minimum minutes or the minimum length of each type of movie each rating each movie rating and so on these are important aggregator functions if you take out the group by don't forget you'll get the, the average the maximum or the minimum for the entire table okay we'll have plenty opportunities to use group by throughout the course we'll also have some exercises for you to train this concept of group by just remember that group by is used to obtain some result by a specific dimension when I mean dimension I mean some specific column that you want to visualize the result by you'll hear people commonly refer to this as dimensions okay so if I want to group my rating I'm grouping my data by the dimension rating and I'm visualizing some data by that dimension in this case the rating of the movie I hope this was explicit on how you can use group by to do multiple things here in SQL again we'll have plenty of opportunity to work with group by throughout the course just uh, make sure that you practice this concept because it's really important and this is one of the query clauses that you'll probably use a lot when you work with SQL next we are going to work with another concept which is similar to the where concept but it's the having concept and I'll see you in the next lecture hello everyone and welcome again to the SQL course so we spoke about the group by clause now it's time to speak about the having clause which is a clause similar to where with a small difference that we are going to investigate here so let me pick up the last query that we've done where we've calculated the minimum length of a movie I'm going to put here having example and instead of the minimum length I'm going to calculate average length as we've seen let me run this query again remember that we are doing a group by here the rating so 
can also make this a bit more explicit instead of the one it's a group by a rating now if i want to build a where clause for example i only want to show the types of movies or the, or the ratings that contain an average length over 120 minutes of uh, film we can try to do that with the where clause so i'm going to do where average length is higher than 120. Let's see if this works or not. So as you can see, we have here an error because we have one problem, which is using the WHERE clause after the GROUP BY clause is not enabled. Okay, the WHERE clause must come before the GROUP BY clause. So let's test that. I'm going to put here WHERE AVERAGE LENGTH OVER 120. Now let's check. We have a new error. And the new error states that the average length is not a column of the table. Why is that? Because the summarized columns, or even columns that we call an alias, don't work with the WHERE clause. So the WHERE clause is not being able to read this average length because it's not in the original table. So as it's not in the original table, how can we go around this problem? Well, for that, we have the having clause. So just think that the having clause is similar to where, but it's to use any column that is created by an aggregator function, for example, or by an alias for something that you calculate and you need to use after the calculation was done. As an example, let me put here, instead of the where clause, I'm going to write after the group by having average length over 120. Now let's run this one. And as you can see, I have a result because the average length is created during the query. It's not in the original table. Let's test this with a simple alias. For example, select rating as new rating from sequila.film. I'm just uh, renaming the column. So I'm just going here, select, and we have just a new rating column, okay? And now I'll want to select all the ratings equal to G, but I'll use the name where new rating is equal to G. Let's see if this works. It does not. Why? Because the new rating is not in the original table. If I change this to a having, let's see, I'll have a result, okay? Because I'm using the alias. As I'm using the alias, which is what's on the output of my query, I can use the having uh, here to filter the data. Okay, so just make sure that you understand this. Where is to filter rows based on the original table where you are filtering from. Having is to do things on the aliases, new columns or aggregator functions or results from aggregations that you are creating in your query and that are only sorted in the output. It's as if we have here a process, the where we can use before processing our query and the having we can use after processing our query, in this case, the new columns or new names that we are having on our query and in our output table. This is a really important clause because mostly it's used in this question right here or in these types of uh, examples where we have a group by and an aggregator function. So you use the group by and then what we'll have is, is that we want to filter some specific rows based on the aggregator function that is already calculated, okay? So we can do this in multiple steps, but here with the having is really, really cool. In this case, by reading this query, and let's read it together, we are selecting the rating and the average length of the movie for each type of rating, where we are grouping by the rating from the Sequila film. And then what we are doing is just filtering the ratings that have an average length of over 120 minutes. So this is what we are doing here in this query. Having seems a bit cumbersome in the beginning, but as you get used to it, you'll see that this becomes almost second nature. Using where or using having, uh, you'll understand clearly where you have to use one or the other. So I hope this was clear. Let's continue forward with the order by clause. Okay, so this will be the, probably one of the easiest examples that I'm going to show. So this is going to be a really quick lecture, which is the order by clause. I'm going to select everything from the secular.film and let's check it. There you go. Now I want to order the movies and this is where the order by clause enters. 
I want to order the movies by their length. So I want to sort this table by this column right here. What I can do is do order by length and then just run this one. And there you go, we have here our table fully sorted. As you've noticed, the movies that have less length are in the beginning and the movies with uh, more length, so the movies, for example, we have here a movie with 185 minutes that is at the end of the table. So we sorted our table by this column. What we also can do is to sort it descendingly, starting on the highest value to the lowest value. And I can run this one using the keyword desk, desk from descending. And in this case, what we have then is the movies with the more minutes on the top and the movies that have less minutes here on the bottom. So we just flip our result using this keyword desk from descending. The default one is ascending from ASC. If you omit this keyword, you will have the table ordered from lowest value to the highest value. What happens if we sort for, for example, description? So I'm going to put here description and let me run or title, let me put title order by title. In this case, what we'll have is an alphabetic order. Okay, so we start on the A's, we go until the Z's. If there is any Z, there is a Z here. So it goes until the end, until the Z's. And if we do order by title descendingly, what we'll have is then the Z's come first and the A's are here at the bottom of the table. So if we sort this just alphabetically by the title. Okay, so we can sort by numeric columns or by text columns. Another thing, we can sort by multiple columns. For example, I can sort by the length and then sort by the rental duration using a comma. So my table will be sorted first by the length and then the ties where we have a tie in the length will be sorted by the rental duration. As we will see here, if I run this query, what we'll have is, for example, here, there are several movies that have the same length, as you can see, so 46. And then the next column of sorting is the rental duration because we've specified that this is the second column that will sort our table after the first one, which is of course the length. So order by comes last in the table that you are doing. I can even do a query that contains all the clauses that we speak so far. And for example, I'll do the following. I'll select, I'll do for example, select rating. Let's do again a group by the average length from, and let me write as AVG length, from the secure.film. And now what comes next? We can use a WHERE clause to filter the rows that will come before the aggregator function. So what will happen is that we are excluding movies. For example, if I exclude here the movies that contain where the length less than 100, removing those from the calculation with the WHERE clause. Remember that the WHERE clause is applied before you do the calculations, before the aggregator functions. And then WHERE length, I can use group by rating. And let me run this until here as an example. Let me run this. Oops, I had a typo here. It's AVG, it's not average. Sorry about that. Average is from another language. Now let me run this one. There you go. So as you can see, I had this average length only considering the movies that have less than 100 minutes. I'm selecting only the movies that have less than 100 minutes. That makes my average come down basically on the movies because I'm only doing the average for the movies that have less than 100 minutes. Okay, so what I've done is here a group by, as you can see, these are the averages that we have. So we have averages that are pretty low, lower than when we use, for example, here, uh, let me go here to the average. Here we'll have much higher averages. Why? Because we are including every movie. In this clause right here, we are filtering before doing the average. We are filtering those movies that have more than 100 minutes. So or equal than 100 minutes and they will not enter into the calculation. OK, so we have here the group by. We have here, for instance, R has 75 minutes, G has 69 minutes, dot 86. Now, what I can do is uh, do an having, for example, having average length over 70. And in this case, I'm applying a filter to the calculation that was already done with the aggregator functions. 
Okay, let me run this one. And then here on the output table, this G rating will be removed because it doesn't match the condition that we have on the having. Let's see. There you go. So it went away basically. Now we can also do order by what? Average length. And in this case, we'll sort this table by this average length. Let's see it. There you go. So as you can see, the order by can be done for the output of the query itself. The order by is normally used for the, the columns that we see on our output in the query, and it comes at the end of all the clauses that we've studied so far. To recap and finishing this section, select to select what you want for the table, functions to create calculated columns or columns that you want to aggregate by, from to indicate the table that you want to pick up the data from, where to filter the rows before any calculation that you are doing, group by to group the data by any function that you are applying, an aggregator function such as average, mean, maximum, having to filter the data after the calculation is done, so to filter on columns that you are creating in your query, and order by to sort your final table by any column that you have on your output. Okay, so this was a recap on all the query clauses that we've seen so far. Don't get too confused by them because this question of having where group by are specifically tricky for beginners. Don't worry about it. Uh, it's totally normal to feel a bit confused if you are at the moment. We'll have opportunity to test this during the practical lectures and also to learn a bit more about these clauses throughout the rest of the course. Thank you very much for being there. Let's continue and go now to the practical exercises where we'll study and practice everything that we've learned so far. I'll see you in the next lecture. Hello everyone and welcome again to this SQL course. Okay, so now it's time for our case study. Let's go for the practical part. And in this case study, we'll have uh, plenty of practical exercises for you to study. I hope you have also completed the quiz that I've prepared for you before this lecture. So I'm here in the course materials. We are on two basic querying. We can go to case study folder and open this Word document that we have right here, case study basic querying. So here we are going to practice everything that we've learned so far. So let's go forward and understand what we have to do in this case. We are part of this company called Books and Books, a company that sells uh, both books in retail stores, physical stores, and also in online stores. So you are the first hire of the IT department at the company. So the first exercise, you have to open and run this BooksDB SQL file to create and populate a sample of the tables from the Books and Books database. This will enable you to train how to open SQL files and also run them similar to what we've done when creating the Sakila database. The second exercise, you have to select all the books released after the year 2000. Exercise three, you have to select all the books where the first name is Stephen and you only have to subset the book name column. In exercise four, you'll calculate the average of number of pages by author first name. The output mean column or the average column output of this one should be named mean underscore pages. In exercise five, you need to filter all the authors whose mean pages is higher than 600. So until here, we will be dealing with a lot of clauses and query clauses that we've seen so far. In exercise six, you'll order the rows from the books table by number of pages in descending order. So the exercise seven and all the exercises that contain this little flame means that these concepts may not be approached during the course materials itself, so a specific function or any other concept. In this case, you need to rely on Google search to find the solution, or at least to understand how you can do this solution. This is to mimic what is commonly used or commonly done in real life when we are developing code, which is we don't know all the code on our mind. Of course, we don't know every function available here in SQL or any other language, so we have to develop this skill. Okay, so in exercise seven, you have to select all the authors, first and last name, that have more than one book in the books table. Exercise eight, select all columns and rows from the books table and create a new column named full name consisting of the concatenation between the first name and last name. Use a white space to connect the two names. This should be easy because we've done something similar in the practical lectures. Exercise nine, build a column where you divide the number of pages of each book by 10, you don't need to select anything else, just name the column nb underscore pages underscore div. 
have a go at these exercises. Uh, the next lecture will be on the solutions. I will go step by step by each question uh, and you will be able to solve them with me, but attempt first on your own so that you are able to practice because this practical part is really important for you to become a bit more hands-on here on SQL and it will be a lot of the value that you get from this course. I'll see you in the next lecture. Hello everyone and welcome to the SQL course. Here in this lecture we are going to solve the exercises that I've left for you. If you haven't solved them by yourself I advise you to do so then go through this lecture if you want to check the solutions or if you are having trouble in a particular exercise. Here we are going to solve them sequentially. Recapping, we are part of the Books and Books company and we are a member of the IT department uh, where we are working with the databases and the data that Books and Books has about the books that it has in stock. Okay, so first exercise we need to open and run the BooksDB dot sql file to create and populate the books and books data into a sql table or into several sql tables to solve this exercise really simple just go to the folder of the course materials opens this books underscore db dot sql this should open a new mysql window connect to your database enter your password and then just run this code you can use all the methods that I've shown you to run. I'm going to select all the queries that we have here. It executes the selected portion. And now we should have here, if we go here and hit refresh all, we should have here the books and books with two tables, the author's table and the books table. So this exercise had the intuition for checking if you already know how to open SQL commands and running them from top to bottom. Now we are also going to use these tables throughout the rest of the exercises. I'm going to open here a new SQL query or a new SQL file where we're going to solve the other exercises. Let me go to exercise two. I'm going to return to SQL. So going into books and seeing the columns, we have here a column called release here. We just have to apply a filter because we want to apply a filter to the rows. We want to apply select all from R books and books schema and what's the table the table it's books and now we apply a where clause so where the release here is greater than let's check so released after the year 2000 just have to hit released after 2000 let's now run this query and let's see the result we have three books sapiens by yuval harari the Black Swan by Nassim Taleb and Under the Dome by Stephen King because these three books were released after this year, in this case 2011, 2007 and 2009. So we have three books in that table that match this condition that we've just done. Here we've practiced the WHERE clause where we apply some condition using a filter and do this row by row and just return the rows where our condition is matched. Okay, now let's go for exercise three. On our exercise three, select all books where the author first name is Stephen and only subset the book name column. While here we've used the asterisk to bring all the columns, here we just have to select first the book name. Because notice, only subset the book name column. In this case, we are doing an operation in the columns of the table and we just want the book name column. So select book name, from books and books dot books where the author first name is equal to Stephen. Notice now I'm applying a filter and what I'm giving here is a character or a text because I'm putting it inside uh, these small quotes that we have right here. These quotes are used also for dates as we will see in the next chapter of the course but for now just know that as a general rule except dates when you give something inside these quotes you are giving pure text into sql let's run this one and check what's the result so we have here two books where the first author is stephen this also happens to be where the last name uh, is king because we only have stephen king books where the first author name is stephen in this table so we have the shining and under the dome two books by stephen king 
Now notice that we've just returned the book name column by selecting it specifically in the select clause. Okay, now let's do an exercise that's a bit harder. So we have here calculate the average of number of pages by author name or author first name. The output mean column should be named mean pages. Now we have here several concepts that we've studied so far. Let's uh, start this bit by bit. So we have calculate the average of number of pages by author first name. Remember that this construction of the phrase that we are doing here all immediately should ring a bell to group by because we want to do something by a specific column. In this case, by the author first name or by a specific dimension. In this case, what we need is the average of the number of pages by this column. So let's try to apply a group by using this. And here, I'm going for exercise four, I'm going to start with the group by author first name. We know and we've already learned that before the group by also comes a from, so we can go to the books and books. And here we are going to the books table and we also have a select before. So I've started with the group by first, just for you to get familiar with this. So if we have on the group by the author first name, we need the author first name here for sure. And now we need a function, an aggregator function. Remember, AVG, so average for the average, what? Number of pages. So average number pages from the books and books dot books table group by the author first name. So we are using the author first name on the select and also on the group by. Closing this query and seeing the result, let me run this one. There you go. So we have Yuval, Harper, Herman, George, Frank, Nassim and Stephen and the average number of pages for the books of these authors. So if an author has more than one book, in this case the Stephen author from Stephen King had two books, we are getting the average from those two books. There's still one thing missing from what is asked in the question, which is and let's check. The output mean column should be named mean pages. What happens when we want to name these objects? We can use the alias that we already learned. So if I go to my SQL, I can do as mean underscore pages. So I'm renaming this AVG number pages that right now it's the name of the column. And it's not that ideal to have these parentheses inside the column name. So we rename it using an alias. And now if I run this one, we should have a correct name for the column mean underscore pages. So here we applied three concepts that were extremely important during the lectures and if you could do this exercise that means that you are on the right track on understanding more complex things about SQL because here we applied aggregator functions such as the average, we've also applied the alias using the as mean pages and we've also applied a group by statement by grouping a specific information by another column or dimension. So we've done these three things which are essential to understand more complex things here in SQL. Let's continue. I'm going to exercise five. Now let's check. Filter all authors whose mean pages are higher than 600. We already have these mean pages. We have already calculated this query. We just need to filter the output where these mean pages are higher than 600. So basically, we are just going to subset this output table that we have right here. I'm going to ask you what's the clause that we need right now here in this query. Pause the video and see if you can know it for yourself. And then I'll help you, of course, in developing this. Okay, assuming you've paused the video for a bit, let's now develop it. So we can't use the WHERE clause here. Why can't we use the WHERE clause? because the mean pages is a column that is created on the output of our table. So we have another clause that we can use, which is the having clause. Remember that the having acts on columns from the output of the query itself and not on the input table. So if we were doing something on the number of pages that is already on the input table, we could use the WHERE clause. But here we want to filter only the authors in the group by column, so the column that contains the average number of pages. And in this case, we have to use the AVING because the average number of pages by author is created in this query itself. Okay, so having mean pages higher than 600. And in this case, I'm going to run this one. And there you go, we only have 
two authors that match this condition. So this doesn't mean that we are only including the books that have more than 600 pages. What this means is that we are just filtering the authors that write on average more than 600 pages on their books. Okay, and these two authors, Ehrman from Ehrman Melville, because I think we only have Moby Dick, which has more than 600 pages in this table, and also Stephen from Stephen King that also tends to write uh, longer books. And here what we are doing is that, for example, Stephen on our base table, the mean pages of the books that Stephen King wrote is 760. And if I go to the table itself, let me go here to the table, select all from books and books, dot books, where author first name is equal to Stephen, I'll see two books, one of them will have, let's check, one of them will have 447 pages, the other one has 1074. These two books are entering in my query to calculate the average between these two values. And what we are doing right now is checking this average and then only filtering the authors where this average is higher than the value that we give on the having clause. Remember, having is always applied on the columns that are created in your query. So here we can also check. Well, another cool thing is that you can do mathematical expressions just in a select. So I can do 447 plus 1074 divided by 2. You can only do this even without the from. And I'll have as a return 760.50. Okay, so this is what we are doing here on this average with the group by clause. We apply just an, a simple arithmetic mean. Okay. Let us go to our exercise seven. And the exercise seven contains this little flame. That means that probably we didn't approach this concept throughout the video lectures, but let's try it all the same. So we want to select all authors, first and last name, that have more than one book in the books table. So here we can go to Google and search. And so immediately if I see this, select all authors that have more than one book in the books table, I know that I need to count the number of books by the authors. So I can search here for count by using SQL. And let's see, so we have here several functions. We have the, we can go to W3Schools. Normally these are cool resources that we can find. This website is pretty cool. And let's see, for example, select the count function returns the number of rows that matches a specified criterion. Here we can use select count. So this is a new function that we haven't learned, which is the count function. And so if we want to count the books on this table, we can go here and apply again a group by. But in this case, we'll have author first name. Notice that now the exercise asks us to have the first and last name. So I need author first name, author last name, and then I need a count. I can do several things. I can do, for example, count asterisk that counts all the rows on the table by a specific column, or I can do count directly count book name. Okay, and this will count me the distinct book names, and you can use both of these methods. Let's do count book name because it's more meaningful. So count books. And now what I can do is from books and books dot books. And now, of course, what's missing here, it's the group by. And I'm going to do a group by with one, two, which means that I'm doing one author first name, author last name, okay? You can also use numbers to represent the column orders that we have on the select, just to be a bit more fast. And we don't have to write author first name, author last name again on the group by. Okay, let's leave it on that way and run this one. And let's see. So the only author that has two books on our table is exactly Stephen King, which were the two books that we've seen before. And now if we only want to filter the author that contains these two books, what we need? Having again, because we are acting on a column that was created during the query. So having count books over one, which means that we'll have all the authors that have two or more books in this table. Let's check it only. Stephen King, that's it. The only thing that's different here that we didn't approach is a new function, the function count. We've used average, max, and minimum, but we've never used count. That's why this is an exercise that's a bit more difficult than the other ones. Okay, 
Exercise 8. Select all columns and rows from the books table and create a new column called full name, consisting of a concatenation between the author first name and author last name. Use the white space to connect the two names. This is really similar to what we've done with the Sakila database. What I'm going to do is exercise 8. While I'm writing, see if you remember for yourself what is the function that we use to do this. So select and I'm going to do select all, and then we'll have here blah, blah, because we still don't know what we're going to have from books and books dot books. And that's it. So now we have here, instead of our uh, placeholder blah, blah, let's uh, put here the function. I hope that you've remembered the concat function, which is the one we've used before. And now we need to give the arguments to this function. So author first name, we need a blank space or a white space and then author last name that's it so here we are going to concatenate these two columns with something in between as an extra argument in the concat function and now something missing which is of course the alias full name or else we would have this huge expression as a column name that's not the best practice of course so running this one there you go full name Yuval Harari, Harper Lee, George Orwell. Now we have the first name and last name concatenated in this column. And this is, of course, a bit more meaningful for us to understand the author itself because we now have a column that concatenates both fields, in this case, the first and last name. So here we've also created a new column based on information that is on our table. This is, of course, a really fundamental concept to work with SQL. Now, exercise nine. Let's see, build a column where you divide the number of pages of each book by 10. You don't need to select anything else. Name the column and be pages div. This should be pretty simple. So select and we have to number of pages. And now we'll have to do something here. I'll do it a little bit later. Books and books dot books. So here we are selecting the number of pages itself of each book. Now the question asks us to divide this number by 10. What we can do to apply it row by row, we've already learned it's just a simple division operator. This is a simple mathematical expression that SQL accepts and that applies this calculation uh, row by row. In this case, in each row that we have right here, we'll divide it by 10. Now we also need to give an alias to this column and that alias is nb pages div. So I'll go here as nb pages div. Now let's run this one and we have our pages divided by 10 and we finished the exercise so i really hope you've enjoyed these exercises we'll have plenty more throughout the course uh, probably the next exercises are going to compound on information we've learned in this first section this was the first chapter on basic querying really important things to learn here in this in this part because here we've learned the basic query clauses we've learned how to filter rows, how to filter columns, and also how to create new columns based on existing information or new information. And I really hope that you could do some of the exercises that I've prepared for you. Don't worry if you couldn't do some of them, that's completely normal. We are here in a journey to learn SQL, and this will take time, and you will, of course, gain more experience by having more exposure to the language, which I hope that we will have uh, during the rest of the course. Don't worry if you couldn't do some of the exercises. Don't be frustrated about it. No worries, because that's completely normal and part of the learning process. So I hope you're enjoying this course. Let's continue now for data types, another really important concept for SQL and to manipulate databases. I'll see you in the next section. Hello everyone and welcome again to this SQL course. I hope you've enjoyed the exercises that I've prepared for you in the past section. Now here in this part of the course, we are going to deal with data types, a new concept that I'm going to introduce here and that we are going to explore with more detail in this section. As you might have noticed in the past section of the course, we've worked with different types of data. So we've worked with numerical data, we've worked with text data such as names. Remember, for example, the columns where we've used the concat function to join the actor first name with the actor last name. Those are text columns. And the data types that each column contains also has impact 
of how the functions that we were going to apply are going to work on uh, these data types. For example, if we want to make a square root of some number, it doesn't make sense to apply a square root to the letters A, B, C. So there might be some way for us to differentiate between these types of data that compose a full table. And as we've seen then, different columns might have different types of data. That's what we are going to explore here. We are going to work again with the Sequila database. I'm not going to introduce many different databases in this course because I think that uh, that would be an extra layer of complexity that is not needed. We already know the structure for the Sequila database. We already know the structure, actor, movies, and etc. So we'll reserve different tables for the practical exercises. During the code along lectures that we are having here, we are going to explore this database, uh, the Sequila one. Okay. So here in SQL, don't forget, connect to your local, and then we can start then to do our queries in the Sequila database. If, if you don't have it loaded on the environment that you are working on, don't forget to recreate it using the scripts that I've also gave you in the course materials. So the query that we are going to follow is this data types numeric one, and you'll see this in the course materials you have there in the second section here in this case in the three data types second section of course with content regarding sql so if you go here to three data types you'll see here the different scripts that we are going to use in this section let's go and code along to understand how this works okay so first command that we will learn in this section is the describe command so the describe command gives you more detail on the structure of a table that you want to analyze so if you have a table and it contains different information about the columns, uh, also called metadata or metadata or whatever how you want to spell it, but that's also information about the columns themselves, such as the data type, such as uh, the size and other properties. You can access it with the describe clause. Let's see it. I'm going to pass sequila.film in this describe and then I'm going to execute this query. And notice now the output is a table, but is a table with this metadata regarding the table itself. So for example, we have here film ID, small int five as a type. So the five here, this is just when it's uh, with numerics, it's just for a question of display width. Don't worry about this number right now. It sometimes seems a bit confusing. Uh, so don't worry as a beginner about this number. We will probably explore it uh, down the line in the course. What's more important is that you understand that this is a numeric column, okay? Because we have small int for small integer. Now, one big confusion because of this number right here is that the small int is that you look at this and you say that this will have five digits at maximum. That's not true. This number doesn't mean that. So the small int is actually a fixed range of numbers that you already have for numeric types. It goes from a certain amount until another certain amount. And what defines this small int is the number of bits it can occupy in memory in the computer. So what means is that now we are having a number in this column and this column has this type small integer and let's check what's the range for small integer so i'm here on my sql documentation i'll leave this in the resources as well but as you can see if we are here on the small int this takes two bytes and then you know that we have at most the maximum value that we can have on that column is 32767 if the column is sign, that means the column can have negative values. So as you can see here, we have here another characteristic, which is the unsigned one. This means that there can be negative values for this column, okay? There can be minus one, minus two, minus three. Those values don't fit in this column right here. Now notice this is a film ID, so it makes sense. It doesn't make sense to have an identification of the film or the ID of the movie as minus two or minus three. That doesn't make much sense. That's why I have this extra characteristic here, unsigned for our small integer. A small int means that we can only go, and if I go here, until the 65,535 ID, or in this case, there can be a movie with ID equals to 65,536. That can't exist because small int doesn't support it. If we need that, we need to go to the medium int, which is the other type, data type, right next to small int, that takes a larger portion. What's the trade-off? Basically, you occupy more memory into space. Each number that you save will take more one byte instead of the small int. 
That's why, particularly for uh, management of resources, it's important to set the minimum appropriate level or the minimum appropriate data type in terms of the integers. Uh, notice that these are all integer numbers um, that will take up less space, but, but will also not ruin your database. If you are expecting to have numbers as big, for example, as these ones around uh, more than 200 billion, well, in that case, makes sense to use the int, uh, although it will take more space okay so this is always a trade-off between what type of numeric type we use in this case between tiny int and big int and knowing that if we will want to allow a larger number or a larger range of numbers in that column we need to occupy more space in memory so there's always a trade-off here in our secular database we only need the f the film id we only have thousand movies we are not expecting to add more movies so we can use, of course, small int because the tiny int only goes until the 255 when it is unsigned. In that case, it wouldn't match what we need for our secular database. That's why we have small int. Okay. So I hope this was clear between the types of integer columns or data types in terms of integer columns that we can have, starting in tiny int, small int, medium int, int, and big int. And as we increment, we'll allow more numbers to be stored in there. In this case, it's not more rows, okay? Don't confuse it. It's the number itself that can be larger. It can be bigger in this case uh, because we can go for larger numbers. At the expense of that, we'll also have more storage. Each row that we have with data will take up more space uh, using another data type that also allows for larger numbers. This is probably a bit confusing when you start to work with SQL. Don't worry, we'll see more examples in uh, subsequent lectures. Just know this property also unsigned. When you have unsigned, you won't allow negative values in your column. That means that then your range, instead of your range of numbers, moves from the negative value, in this case, for example, the tiny int moves from the less 128 to the zero, allowing more space for this uh, tiny int, okay? Okay, returning here, what we have, film ID, small integer, and then it's an unsigned integer. That means no negative values. Also notice we have here key, uh, primary key. This means that is the key of this column. It's the identifier of each row of this table. This will be important for when we combine tables using joins. It must be unique, okay? Then we have auto increment. We'll also explore this when we are creating our own tables. So I'm not going to go too deep into it right now. And then we have, for example, another tiny int, as you can see here, language ID, we have tiny int uh, unsigned. Again, this tree is just for display purposes, okay? Nothing regarding what's the size of the column that we have inside, okay? And what are the values that the column can store? No, that is defined with the tiny int itself. We have here tiny ints. Notice that tiny int then only goes until 128. If it's a signed column, if it's unsigned, goes to the 255. Again, if you have a number 300, you can put it in this tiny int. I think it will have a null value or it will have an error when you try to insert those types of values, not recalling right now. And then we have here another small int for the length of the movie. Makes sense to be a small int because I think that if this is in minutes, it uh, the maximum minutes that the movie can go, let's go here again to our reference, is 65,000 because it's unsigned. So a movie can only go to 65,535 minutes. I don't think there's a movie that's uh, longer than that. Uh, if it is, then it's probably a really long movie. So it's a good data type to put because if you, you can put, of course, medium int, but it will take one byte more for something that's highly unlikely, if not impossible. Okay, so we have here small ints. Let me see if we have here another thing that might be meaningful for these integer columns. I guess not. So let's just explore something. Now with the integer columns or with numeric columns that we'll explore in the next lecture, we can do mathematical calculations. We can apply any mathematical formula that we know to these types of columns. An example, I'm going to go here, mathematical calculations. And of course, this is enabled because of the property of mathematical numbers and we have them stored as numbers in this column. So if I go for select as an example, uh, film ID, the original one, or the length to make more sense. So length and the length times four from the secular.film, 
and I run this code, what we'll have is then the original data, 86, the original data for each movie. For example, there's a movie here that has 86 minutes and the multiplication 86 times 4. And if I want to do this, for example, here, I can also apply some functions such as the logarithm. I think that the logarithm is also enabled for this column. As you can see, we have a number, so 86, and the mathematical calculation over that number. This is enabled because this is a numeric column, numeric data type. If I try to do this, for example, with the title, select title, let me just recall what's the title of the movie. It doesn't make sense to apply a logarithm to the title of the movie, right? So if I go to log title and try this on a non-numeric column, I'll have a null. Null means no information at all. It means, it just means that SQL can do this calculation by itself. It's impossible to do this calculation because you can't apply a logarithm to a character column. It doesn't make any sense. And how does SQL know that it can't apply this calculation, the log to this column? It's because of the data type, because it's a non-numeric data type. Okay, so if you want to store numbers, uh, something that you want to calculate, you use a numeric data type. Numeric data types are also common for identifiers, IDs, primary keys that you are creating on the table, and that identify a single row. Because also, uh, if you don't want to store pure text, then by default use the numeric data type because it takes much less space than a text column. Okay, that's important. And it makes your table much more efficient. Okay, so let's recap a bit on integers. We have five data types, and there they are. Tiny int, small int, medium int, int, and big int. So these are numbers that we can store, but these numbers are also integer numbers. So you might be thinking, well, where are the decimal numbers? How can we store them? That's what we are going to see in the next lecture and see another subtype of data types, which is the decimal and float data types. So that's what we will explore in the next lecture. Welcome back to the SQL course. So now we are going to see the decimal numbers or float numbers. These are also common ways to call these types of columns. We are going to see here, I'm going to describe again our circular.film table. Let's go and check it. So there's a need for storing uh, numbers that are not only integer numbers, such as 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on. There's a need, for example, to store 1.5, 1.7 in several databases. An example would be where you have prices for specific goods. So most goods don't cost a simple 1 euro, they cost 1.5. 30 cents or 1 euro and 30 cents or 1 dollar and 30 cents and you need to have those decimal points so that you are able to store the number and not have it rounded in databases it would be extremely difficult to work with databases if they only enabled integer numbers so there's data types that will help us let's discover them in this lecture we have for example here the rental rate now see this decimal that we have right here decimal for Two, these numbers are relevant for the decimal uh, data type. Not so for the tiny int or small int data types. They are not that relevant for those. But here they are because they are reflecting how these numbers stored in the database. So the four that we have right here is normally called the P precision. So this is the amount of numbers that you will have. Is the amount of digits that you will have in your floating or decimal column. And the two means the number of digits after the comma, after the decimal point or after the dot, no matter how you represent the decimal point, it means after that decimal point. So in this case, the rental rate will have four digits and will have two digits on the left of the decimal point, two digits on the right on the decimal point, because we have a precision of four and we will have two digits on the right. Okay, so this is our first introduction to data types and we'll explore them when we are creating our own tables. Don't get too confused by this, just important that you understand the difference between what's an integer, what's a decimal. And here on the decimal, we have then these two numbers, P and also D for P, the number of total digits that we have on the number, D, the number of digits that from those total digits will be on the right side of the decimal point. Okay, so if I go to my Sakila, for example, here on the Sakila, if I select 
So if I select everything from the circular.film, as we will see, I'm going to run this, you will notice that we will have here on these rental rates, we have, uh, in this case, we'll have four digits, but most of them don't have four digits because uh, most rental rates are 0 0.99, 4.99. But now notice, you always have two digits after the decimal point that we see right here in this decimal number. Okay, that's because we've defined it in this way when we've uh, created this table and we gave that data type. Here in the replacement cost, it also should be, I don't think there's anything here with more than four digits because we have one, two, three, four. I think this is also a decimal for two. If we check the describe in the replacement cost, let's see it. Let me hide here the output log and replacement cost. It's actually five, two. There might be movies that have three digits on the left. Okay, here on this table, it is enabled by the data type that we have right here that we have those numbers. So if we have 290.99, that's enabled in this uh, column because we have right here this decimal 52 and that is relevant. So we'll do more experiments with data types when we create our own tables. Okay, when we are creating our own data, don't again, don't worry about it. The decimals are then to represent uh, numbers with, of course, decimal points. But I can do for mathematical calculations also with these columns. For example, I have here the rental rate. If I do select rental rates and rental rate times four from sequila.film and run this one, I'll have a numeric calculation applied just the same as I've done in the small int or integer types that we've seen before. So there's no null like uh, we've had when we applied some type of calculation to the title that is a character column. If I try to do a logarithm also here, logarithm of the rental rate and try to run it, we'll also be able to apply that uh, calculation to the column that we have right here. Okay. So you also have numeric as a data type, which is quite equivalent to decimal. They do almost the same thing. There's no relevant difference between decimal and numeric. And you also have another data type, which is the float data type. It's less precise than the ones that we are doing here with decimal and numeric, but it's faster to do calculations on. If you are not worried about super tiny decimal points in the calculations that you are doing on your table, you can use float because the calculations that you apply on that column will be faster. But if you are worried on those super tiny fractions that may cause trouble in calculations, then uh, refer to decimal or numeric. For example, for accounting purposes, for numbers that represent money and accounting purposes, you have to have a numeric or a decimal data type because the tiny fractions that uh, may fail in the precision with the float may cause a lot of troubles to financial systems. So uh, it's uh, required that you have the highest precision possible when storing the number in the database. Okay, so this is a really important data type, not only the decimals that we see here, but also the integers that we've seen before. On these columns, we can apply mathematical calculations. We've seen different characteristics of these uh, data types. For example, the question of the precision, how many numbers can we store or how many digits can we store in a single number? We've approached them here. This is supposed to be the first light approach to data types because when we are going to work in the next section with our own tables and creating our own tables, we'll be doing much more experiments with these data types. I just think that uh, it's better to approach data types first and getting to know what are the differences between numeric and uh, text columns, then only experiment with these data types at the same time that we are creating tables so that we can work around with our own data and not trying to do something on the Sequila database because this is just a toy database. It's not something that we are creating. So it makes sense for us to experiment further down the line. Uh, this further down the line is just in the next section where we are going to work in creating our own data. Okay, we've seen numeric columns, mostly integers and decimals. Next, we are going to see another common type of uh, data types, which is the text data that's uh, really commonly used throughout databases, as we will see, and I'll see you in the next lecture. Hey everyone, and welcome again to this SQL course. Until now, we've seen numeric data types in the form of integers and also in the form of floats. So here in this lecture, what we are going to approach are text variables. 
or text columns. Text columns are used to store other characters that are not numbers, and you can even store numbers in them, although if you pass those numbers in closed in quotes, you are treating those numbers as text and they will be interpreted by SQL as text. I'm going to describe again the sequila.film to exemplify and don't forget to connect to your local database so that you are able to describe the sequila.film table. I'm going here and run this query. Now notice we have here something interesting which is the varchar data type. The varchar is able to store characters or text, free text, in this column. For example, here we have the title. The title, of course, can be a written text with characters and something other than numbers. So that's why you need the varchar to store these types of information or these types of data. So if you have something like A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and so on, you'll have to store them, of course, in these data types because you can't store letters in numeric or float columns, and that makes a lot of sense. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to compute mathematical functions on those columns. So here, the number that we have after the varchar is more straightforward because it actually refers to the number of characters that this column or each row of this column can have. So here, a movie title must have at most 128 characters. After that, that text will be truncated, meaning that the rest after those number of characters will not show up in the column. So pay really attention to that. A higher number here will mean that you will allow more characters to be in your column, to be fit in your column. Let's continue and see here what's the title on the sequila.film. This query, of course, should be pretty familiar, just to select from statement. As we can see, we have here several movie titles. The concat function, if I go here and try to do a concat function that we've already used to concat the full name, remember, from the actors. If I use concat oops, title title, what we'll do is create a new column that will concatenate the title with the title. This doesn't make much sense, but as you can see, we concatenate each string. Uh, also, these are commonly called strings. If you hear this name, it's when we, uh, strings are, is when we are speaking of text, of uh, data that is interpreted as text. So we are concatenating these two pieces of strings or these two pieces of text, one with each other. So you have these functions that are more relevant for strings, but can you do this with, uh, for example, the rental rate numbers? Let's see what will happen. Remember when we try to apply certain mathematical operations to text, we would get a null. Is that the case here? It's not. What we have is an implicit conversion. What happens is that SQL is able to implicitly convert this rental rate into a string. It converts it to a string, turning the 0 0.99 into pure text and not numbers. Okay, so we've done here a conversion, and what we have when we concatenate two numbers, it doesn't sum them, uh, although that's what you might think that it happens. It concatenates 0 0.99 with 0 0.99 and treats it at, as if it was text. Remember, you can have numbers as text. When you have a column that only has numbers, it makes more sense to store it as float or integers, also because of the space that that column will take. There's also another type of column that takes up the maximum space, which I think is 65,000 characters, which is the text type. Let's see if there is any text type here in the secular.film. There is the description. As descriptions are more volatile, you can have movies that have really, really long descriptions. The idea was to have this column as text, which would be a column that would take at maximum 65,000 characters here. So that's why we have this data type that's text, which by default makes it as if it was a varchar 65,000. And to be more precise, it's 65,535. The main difference between both of these, there are smaller differences that you don't need to know now. You need to know the difference between a maximum varchar, for example, a varchar 65,535, you can use that as an index, while the text data type you can't use as an index. That's a relevant difference. So just know that when you have like probably more volatile text, but you're not sure what's the data type or the fixed data type that you want to use, just use text when you know for certain that most probably you will not have more than X amount of characters. Just use Varchar. It's easy if you understand it in this way. Okay, so there are also here more two data types related to uh, text, which is the enum and the set. Okay, so let's see the sequila.film just for you to check what these data types really mean. They are actually really handy 
and let's see. So the set basically allows you to choose multiple values from a fixed list. For example, the special features, as you will see, is a set data type. That means that here we have a fixed uh, a range of values that we can use. For example, trailers, deleted scenes, behind the scenes, because these are characteristics of most movies. So you don't want to have free text in this column. That's why you use the set. And enum, basically it's the same, but you can only use one value. That's for the rating, because you can have multiple ratings by default for a movie. A movie either it's PG or it's G or it's rated R, so it only has one rating, okay? So that's why I use the enum. The difference between both, enum takes only one value, set takes multiple values. Both are used when you want to control the input of the data that will be stored here. You don't want to allow free text, although it's a text variable because, uh, of course, PG are two letters. This should be treated as text, not as a number. The same for the special features. Let's just confirm here on the secure.film that will have the rating as enum, as I've said, so only one value allowed. Special features, it's a set of several examples that we have here, a list of values that we can choose. Think of it as follows, like enum is probably more uh, resembling a combo box that we would see in websites where you can choose one value, and set is more like a checkbox where you can check multiple values of a checkbox. This is probably an analogy that, that will help you to memorize what these two types are. Okay, so we've seen four data types here, varchar, where you give a fixed length for the text column, text that takes by default the maximum amount of characters that the text can have here in SQL, which is 65,535. And then we have enum and set. You control the data that will be given here to your table. In enum, you allow one single value from an array of values. In set, you can choose multiple values from an array of values. Okay, so this was the data type text. Again, don't worry about this. First introduction to data types. We'll, of course, have more opportunity to work around these data types and create our own tables and make choices on which data type should we choose, because that's exactly the choice that you have to do when you are creating a table or modeling some real world data. So let's continue and see another data type, which is the time or date time uh, data type. That data type will enable us to store hours, minutes, days, so it's more related to time features of SQL, and it will be really important for us to store those values for most operations. Let's continue, and I'll see you in the next lecture. Hello everyone, and welcome again to the SQL course. Let's continue now and understand what are time data types or date data types. Let's check again our secure.film so that we can continue on the same example. So let me describe this table, and let's see if we have any timestamp or date data types here in this table. So we have two interesting data types. We have here this year, which is something that we haven't covered yet. And we also have here this timestamp. I'm going to select both of them from this table. So release year and also last update. So these are the data types that we still haven't covered in this table. The rest of them we already know because we have already seen small int, varchar, text, also tiny hint, decimal, and enum and set. So we've covered most of the data types that we see here. Now this strange year and timestamp we haven't looked yet. Now notice, these are two interesting columns. One of them is the release year of the movie. This is a here column. You can have four columns that relate to dates. Time, date, that has the format, the common format year, month, day. Date time, that contains the format year, month, day, plus the seconds and the minutes of a specific row timestamp which has also similar information regarding the date time format it's really similar but only with small uh, differences that are not meaningful for now uh, we'll discuss them probably in the future and also the year which contains a year as the name implies so here we have a year date type okay where we just have a single year and here we have a date time with a full date now imagine last update, it contains all the minutes, hours, and also seconds of this last update date of the row. So this is particularly important, for example, for transactions, either retail transactions, financial transactions, really common that you want to store a date in a specific row. As we've already discussed, there are certain functions that are more relevant for certain data types. For example, the date diff, which is a really common example here in SQL, returns the difference between two dates. Let's see it. So select, I'm going to do date diff between the following 2019 
2019-0201 and 2019-0201. Notice something, I've entered these dates in between quotes. This is the only case or one of the few cases where we put something in quotes that is not a string. Here, SQL is able to interpret because of the format that this is a date. So it will be able to compute things on this date. Let's see that. So I'm not going to give a from because I'm giving it directly in the select. And I have the difference in days between these two. This is super relevant because now SQL is able to interpret this as a date type. And as it is a date type, it is able to calculate differences between dates, which are really common operations that we do with databases. We'll also explore more functions like this in the future. Here, just know that the date diff is really relevant for date data types, okay? We can do, for example, the difference between our last update date and I'm going to put here uh, 2021.1. And now as I have the last update date, I need the from. So from secular.film. Let's run this. And as you will see, we have, of course, the same last update date. So we have the difference in days between the last update and the date that we've given to SQL. So this is extremely cool to use this function such as date diff. This is only enabled, of course, in date data types or data types related to dates. When I'm saying date data types, I'm saying data types that are related to dates, such as date time, date, or year. Let's uh, do an experiment. What if I pass here a date diff between ABC and DEF? What is the result? As you might imagine, it is a null result. This is not supported because you can do a date difference between two columns that are characters, of course. What if I do between two raw numbers? So, so 2,500 and 2,502. Will this work? Let's see. We also have a null. This is, of course, also not supported by this function. So just be aware every time you are working with the function, you have to know how the data type will react or what's the type of data type that's supported by that function. Okay, so we finished. We've covered most of the data types that we have on our Sakila.film. This will make much more sense when we create our own data. But now you are armed with the knowledge of what's the data types that we can use to create our own data. This makes more sense to go and create data when you are already armed with this knowledge because you'll make better decisions and we'll be also able to think through this process of understanding what's the data type that we should use. Okay, so to finish this section, let's just understand how we can convert data types back and forth in the next lecture. I'll see you there. Hello everyone and welcome again to the SQL course. Here, we are just going to check how we can convert one data type to the other. Of course, we'll have more examples like this throughout the course. I'm going to do something here really simple. So select one, two, three. The query file that we will be using now is the four casting columns that you can find on the data type section in the course materials. Let me do something. Let me first connect to my local server. And now let's run this select one, two, three. Notice something, I have here one, two, three, but this is enclosed in quotes, means that now this column that I have right here, or this data that I have right here, I'm going to call this and give an alias as call one. I'm not selecting this from anywhere, I'm just creating this data for you to check. Now, as you can notice, I have one, two, three uh, here between quotes. The important part is that this is a character variable. Although what happens when I try to apply a log with this one, two, three between quotes, SQL will do an implicit conversion. What this means is that SQL behind the scenes is trying to apply a logarithm to this value that's inside the quotes, converting it to numeric before doing the logarithm function. That's why we have a value here, because you can convert one, two, three that is enclosed in quotes uh, that's a string to a number. You can do it because one, two, three are numbers, although they are being used here as strings because they are given in quotes. If I take out the quotes, this will give me exactly the same result, but now SQL is not applying some implicit conversion. For you to check how the implicit conversion is working on a background, I'll add here an A. And now if I run this one, two, three A, something weird happens. So SQL implicitly converts this number, takes out the A from the equation. This is a bit odd. That's why you need to be confident when you apply certain functions to character text 
just to make sure that you are not converting or implicitly converting something that doesn't make sense. If I check now log of ABC, there's no implicit conversion. Okay, so more than the data types that are defined by you in the table or that is defined on the table, the data that are contained in those data types define the functions that you can apply. Okay, so not only the data type, the data type is more of a guideline for you to understand which functions can I apply. If you only have characters in a character column, of course, you won't be able to apply, for example, a logarithm function because there will be no implicit conversion to any number. Now, if I put here a one between these values, I'll have also no value. What happens is that this trims a specific beginning of a certain number. If I write one, two, three before, I'll have logarithm. If I take out the one, two, three and have two, one between two letters, then what we'll have is a null. Okay, so pay attention to this implicit conversion. Let's now test at the end what will happen. Also, no implicit conversion at all. Okay, so if the string starts with a letter, there will be no implicit conversion, or at least the implicit conversion will not work. If it starts with a number, the function will be applied to the beginning of those numbers. I don't see many cases where this is used. Just know that when you are applying something to a character column, you must pay attention to how that character column is uh, specified, what are the expected values in that character column, because you may be doing some implicit conversions when you apply certain functions. Implicit conversions are common in SQL. I've just uh, put here this lecture for you to understand that sometimes these conversions happen throughout a specific column. We will see this also in the practical part. In the practical exercises, we'll have a specific example of this. When you apply a logarithm to a column that's a text and there's a single value that's only composed of numbers, the logarithm will have no for all the other text, for all the other characters on the other rows that contains characters, and the logarithm will be applied only to that single row that can be implicitly converted. Okay. So that's why these functions are applied row by row. Okay, I hope this was clear. Just know that this, every time we are giving something in quotes, we are giving characters. Then if uh, SQL can convert it implicitly or not, that's something that's defined by the beginning of the string. If I write here, uh, John, of course, I can't apply a logarithm to John, null, no. again, just to exemplify. And I can take out the quotes and give John. This will give me, of course, uh, no output and an error I have here the output there you go so we have here an error because I can't pass uh, letters on other than SQL instructions with no quotes so the quotes define that this is a character again the other example where we give quotes or at least one of the uh, few examples is when we give dates okay when we have dates as we've seen in the dates data type lecture Okay, so this was implicit conversion and just an overview on implicit conversion. Let's go to explicit conversion, something that we can do using SQL functions. I'm here again on SQL. Let's check another example. I'm going to select one, two, three, four. I think, and let me call this S column one. And now I can do something interesting. So I can convert this into another data type. An example would be using convert function. And then what can I give after the convert? I can give integer and for example, signed. This will be a signed integer, meaning that this value expects negative values. So this will convert this string. And when we write this in the table, we will convert this into a numeric data type when I run this query. And uh, whoops, I think here it's signed integer. Sorry, the sign is first and then it's integer. Let's run this one. And as you can see, they seem the same, although of course this is a bit uh, different. As we've learned, uh, SQL is able to convert this because one, two, three, four is before of the A. If I put an A here, what we'll have is then a conversion to zero. Now notice when I've applied a function to something that was not a number or did not begin with the number, I had null. When I apply convert, this converts something to zero. So it doesn't make much sense. Just pay attention when we are trying to convert something into a number. If we have, for example, imagine a flight, one, two, three, dash, A, B, C, D, E, F. And if I try to convert this to a number, I'll have flight number one, two, three. So I'll just pick up 
the first part that contains numbers until the first non-numeric character. Although here we can't really visualize it, but we'll see it when constructing our own data, this is indeed a conversion from this data type to an integer data type. Let's do some experiments. Now, we know that sign enables negative values and sign doesn't enable. What if we try to convert minus one between quotes to an unsigned integer? What we'll have is some really weird value. What means is that we are getting back to the end of the bytes of the integer data type because we have unsigned. If I put signed, now this converts to minus one, okay? Just notice the difference between signed and unsigned. When I use unsigned, that doesn't make any sense at all. Basically, it's giving me the last number available in this integer data type uh, by those ranges that we've seen for the tiny int, the big int, the small int, etc. Why not convert to a big int? Let's check. And I'm going to try it. It doesn't work because these data types don't work with these functions convert or the function cast that we are also going to see, which is similar function to convert. Convert data into these data types, you have to physically alter a specific table. You have to modify a table to be able to do these conversions. Uh, to do these explicit conversions, you can only use seven data types, which are binary, char, date, date time, time, decimal, and integer. No other data types are supported with this convert function, okay? So just make sure that you are aware of that. This is something that's a bit confusing uh, first, because why do we have a convert or cast function if we can only use these data types to do conversions? Well, that's the way uh, MySQL was developed. I really don't know the answer behind the rationale of just enabling these data types, but surely there should be uh, some rationale for that. But now let's check. I'm trying to convert this. I'm going to convert to signed. If I convert to integer again, it's also supported. I can also convert it to decimal, for example. And here, I don't need a signed. So to decimal, I have here minus one. But if I try, for example, as we've seen for the numeric, now here, I'll have again an error because this data type is not convertible to, okay? To have the other data types and convert some column into other data types, we have to physically modify the table, as we will see in the next couple of sections. Also, we can do the following, which is select convert and a number 2017 to char, which is basically, I can put here as called one, which is basically the reverse conversion, picking up 2017. And now 2017 is stored here as a string. Okay. Let me also go here and do the following, which is showing you the cast function, which is kind of similar to convert. The only difference is that instead of a comma, we have an as. So here in convert, we have what we want to convert, comma, and the data type that we want to convert to. In this case, with the cast, we have the cast function, what we want to convert as the data type that we want to convert to. Okay, so if I check here, there you go. This is exactly the same. You may not notice because there's no quotes involved here, but if I write this to a table and then describe that table, this will be a character column, not a numeric column, although we are seeing here a number. Okay, so these are the functions to convert back and forth. Really important things to understand. We have convert and we have cast. We have implicit conversions, which happens when we try to apply a specific function that needs a specific data type. For example, logarithm on text doesn't work. MySQL will try to convert that text implicitly. When I say implicitly is that we are not giving that instruction explicitly to MySQL. It is MySQL that is doing that on the background. So MySQL will try to convert that into a number so that it's able to apply the logarithm function. Then we have the explicit conversion, which are done based on our functions, such as the convert and the cast function. To do this, we only have seven data types to which we can use these functions to convert to. Okay. I'll also leave some links in the resources about both this convert and cast function so that you are aware of how they work and why they work in this way. Let's move forward. Now we'll have a couple exercises and quizzes before moving to another really exciting part and where we'll be able to apply most of these concepts that we've learned right now. I know that probably you may feel a bit confused right now because data types are really cumbersome to understand in the beginning. There are a lot of tricks uh, such as this implicit conversion and explicit conversion. Don't worry because we'll have the opportunity to apply 
most of these concepts. And now we are armed with this knowledge of data types and we can build our own tables. I advise you to do the quiz and do the case study for this section. I'll see you in the next lecture. Hi everyone and welcome again to the SQL course. So now it's time to practice a bit about data types. This case study will be a bit different from the other ones in the course. It will be a bit more theoretical than practical. We are not going to code that much in this case study. This case study will be centered around understanding the data types of the books and books database. So now that we are familiar with this books and books database, let's investigate what's the data that it contains. The IT department is really not sure what's the data type that the database contains, and they've asked you to help them understand what are the implications behind the data types that the books and authors table contain at the moment. If you don't have the books DB loaded in MySQL, return to the first case study where we've done some basic querying and run the books underscore DB dot SQL file so that you are able to create this database and then being able to visualize the tables. So let's see what the IT department of books and books has in store for us. The first exercise is just used to describe the books table from the books and books database. We know how to describe a table with a simple command. That's what we need to do in this exercise. The second one asks us what is the data type of the book name variable. So in these types of exercises where you don't have really to code, you can just write your answer as a comment on a SQL file where you are solving the exercises, and then you can check the solutions on the exercise solutions file. So here you just need to write what is the data type that you see on the book name variable from the books and books database. Now to do that, you just need to rely on the result from the exercise one. On exercise three, another question, what's the maximum amount of characters that each book name can have? And so most of these exercises will rely on the result from our first exercise. Exercise four, what is the primary key of the books table? We didn't speak that much about primary keys that we'll do in the next exercise, but you have in there in the result from the exercise one, an indication of what's the primary key. See if you can check it for yourself. Now a more rhetorical question. Is the author first name, data type, and size appropriate for the expected values in the field? Let's see if you can develop some rationale in justifying your answer. Why do you think it's appropriate or not appropriate? You can also check the correct solutions in the exercise solutions file, as I've said. Exercise six, apply the logarithm to the column book name times five. So you have book name times five and you apply the logarithm. Do you think this is a valid calculation? Now exercise seven, something really interesting regarding, uh, regarding implicit and explicit conversions. Which book will have a logarithm applied to the book name as SQL is able to implicitly convert it? Uh, let's see if by looking at the book names, you are able to say which book will have this implicit conversion and have a logarithm applied to that. Exercise eight, you just need to describe the author's table. In the exercise line, you just have to say if the author ID can have negative numbers. So this is the case study for us to get a bit more familiar with the data types on this database. By answering these questions, uh, you will be sure that you are understanding most of the concepts regarding data types, and you will be ready to go into the table creation and data inserting that we'll explore in the next section. So try to do these exercises by yourself, and then you can continue and check the solutions in the next lecture. I'll see you there. Hello everyone and welcome again to the SQL course. Let's now solve our case study on data types. So I'm going to open the exercise solutions. That's right here in the case study folder. You can open this one and check the solutions for yourself. Also try to understand if you got your answers correctly by looking at this file and comparing the answers with yours. So the first question asked us to describe the books table from the books and books database. If you go here to MySQL, you just have to run describe books and books dot books. I'm going to run this one and here we can check the data types and you can see, for example, other information regarding the columns of our books table. Okay, here we can see the data types also if it's a primary key or not. And this information will help you to answer the questions after this one. So again, to describe our table, just use the describe command, the name of the database dot name of the table. On exercise two, we are asked what is the data type of the book name variable? And here we can see that the data type, it's a Varchar 255. So we have a text column with maximum 255 characters uh, in it. What's the maximum amount of characters that each book name can have? In that case, we'll have the 255 because that's the length we've given in the Varchar data type when we've created this table. 
Exercise 4. What is the primary key of the books table? In this case, the primary key is the book ID. How do you know that? Because here in the key column of the describe, we have a PRI, meaning primary key. That means that this column must be unique for this table. We'll explore more on primary keys next. I've just put here this exercise so that you have first contact with primary keys. Is the author first name, data type and size appropriate for the expected values of this field? Let's check. So we have author first name, we have Varshar 100. Arguably, this is not the best length to use for this column because it's unlikely that some author will have a first name with 100 characters. Of course, there may be one author out there that have this large name, but it is highly, highly unlikely. So probably you can go for less characters in this column and that will be a bit more optimized in the table, uh, particularly when doing sorts and other types of operations on top of this table. Always go for the field that represents the least possible characters according to what you understand of the business problem. Here, as we are talking about the first name of a person, having 100 characters is probably a bit overstretched, so probably we can diminish a bit this number of 100 to around 50 or something like that. So exercise 6, apply the logarithm to the column book name times 5. Is this a valid calculation? So let's see. We have here the calculation, so log of book name times 5 from books and books dot books table and I'm going to run this one and let's see the result. Do you think this is a valid calculation? No. Why? Because the book name contains characters, a lot of characters. It's the name of a book. Doesn't make sense to apply a logarithm to it and that's why mostly this will not be a valid calculation with any meaning. So exercise 7, one really interesting. Which book will have a logarithm applied to the book name a SQL is able to implicitly convert it. Let me start this a bit uh, reverse. So let me do a select on the books and books. And I'm going to go through every book so that you understand which book will be able, we will be able to apply a log to. So we have Sapiens, To Kill a Mockingbird, Moby Dick, 1984, Brave New World, Dune, Black Swan, The Shining, and Under the Dome. Now, SQL will try to implicitly convert all these rows when it applies a log. So if it applies a logarithm, which is a mathematical operation, it will try to convert every string that we have right here into a number. Only one of them will work, which is 1984. Why? Because this is a name of a book. We know that this is a name of a book and should be treated as such, but it is also a number, 1984. So that means that when the logarithm will be applied to this column, only this row will have a result which is the log of the number 1984. That doesn't make much sense in terms of what we want to do in this column. Even so, SQL is able to implicitly convert this row only. The other ones, as they have letters, or they start with letters, for example, the other ones are only are written text, uh, SQL will not be able to apply anything to it. Let's confirm this, of course, here by running the logarithm here. As we can see, times 5, but as you can see, only the fourth row, which happens to be 1984, is able to have a value here because 1984 is a book name, but is also a number. So we can apply that implicit conversion here. The other ones, of course, will be null because logarithm of text is indeed null. So exercise 8, describe the author table from the books and books database. And here I'm going to run this code which is basically the explanation of the author's table. So I'm again using the describe command. And finally, can the author ID have negative numbers? Let's see. So here are the details for the author ID. We see here a type. It's a primary key. Uh, do you think this can have negative numbers? Yes, it can. Why? Because it is a signed column. It's not an unsigned column. If it was an unsigned, it couldn't have negative values as we've seen as it is signed by default, because we don't have here the unsigned characteristic, then the meaning is that we can have negative values in this column. Therefore, they are not expected because it doesn't make sense to have an ID that's negative, but underlying in the table, they are supported. If you insert a negative row here, you will see that that will work because this column is signed by default. Okay, I hope this was clear. I know that probably you are a bit confused right now about data types because we've explored plenty of concepts here. Don't worry, we'll have more opportunity to explore them in the next section where we'll create our own databases and insert our own data. 
let's jump right into that section. I hope you enjoyed this section of the course and I'll see you in the next lecture. Hello everyone and welcome again to the SQL course. We are here in a new section where we are going to explore how we can create our own databases and our own tables. This is probably one of the most exciting sections of the course, so let's jump right into it. You'll find the course materials for this section here in for creating and modifying tables. The script that we are going to explore right now is the script number one, creating and inserting information. So as I said in the past uh, section of data types where we've explored most data types or at least a significant part of data types that we have here in SQL, here is really where we are going to apply those concepts. So first, let's learn the command that we can use to create new databases. Know that we have here Sakila, Books and Books, Sandbox, Test Database, Test Database, and World, and also Sys. So all of these are databases. These databases or schemas, as we've already uh, talked about, contain different tables. The command to create one of these databases, which is a collection of tables with its own relations, is create database. Okay, so if I go here and write create database and then give the name of the database that I want to, remember that to do this, you have to be connected to your local server and I'm going to call this create database countries. What will happen is that I'm not going to create any table. I'm going to create a schema called countries where I can create later more tables. But this command is an important one, create database. This is how we can create a new schema. So just like we've been doing in our exercises working with the Sakila database, if you check the first command of the script that creates the Sakila schema, the first command is of course creating that database so that we can populate it with data after. So I'm now going to run this one, create database countries. You can check that this was successful. If I go here and hit with the, a right click on my mouse and go for refresh all, there you go, we have our countries. Right now, we can start to create tables inside this countries database. So this is a really important command, create database. It's as simple as straightforward as that. Okay, so now for one of the most important instructions that we will learn in SQL, which is the create table command. So this create table, just like you are probably imagining, if I'm going, if I write here countries dot countries, I'm going to create a table named countries and oops, I have here a typo. I also have a typo here in this country, so I'm going to drop this database and write it again. There you go, now it's named countries. Uh, don't worry because we'll learn how to drop things and delete things here in MySQL next. As I was saying, we have here countries, which is a database dot countries. I'm creating a table countries inside the database countries. Just by coincidence and because it makes sense for this example, they have the same name, but they may have different names, the database and the table. This is extremely similar how we called, for example, in a select all, how we call the sakila.film. We go for the database sakila and the table film, okay? Remember, if I go here, I'll have here the film table, which can be used to perform queries on just like we have here countries.countries, .countries, what we are doing is creating this table. Now to be a table, we know that we must give something to SQL or to MySQL so that MySQL is able to populate that table. And first and foremost, we need to give the columns that this table will contain. Before inserting rows into the table, we need to give the structure of the table, which columns and information is this table going to contain. This is where our data type knowledge will come in handy. So I open here the parentheses, and then I can start to write the columns that I want to populate this table with. And for example, I'm going to use country ID. Now notice country ID will be the name of the column that I'm creating in this table. And now I have to give some properties to this column. Just like we've seen that there are certain primary keys, there are certain data types for specific columns, this is exactly the space to give those instructions to SQL. So, here I want a country ID, it will be the identifier that, that will be used to identify each country in a unique way. Here it should make sense to be a number, it could be the country code, for example as a text or as a varchar in this case, but here we are going to use an arbitrary number to represent multiple countries. And so what I'm going to do is call this an integer. But I know that I'm not going to have that many countries in this table, I want to have the maximum 10, so I can use a tiny int. 
This is something that's extremely common for us to do when we are building SQL tables. Understand what are the expected values that we are going to have in this integer column, and then using the scale that uh, we know from the past lecture, from tiny int, small int, and so on. So I'm going to use tiny int, and now I want this to be in a primary key. What is a primary key? Primary key is something that identifies the row in a unique way. That means that this primary key can't be duplicated. For example, if we have a table where the name of the person is an ID, we cannot have two John Doe's as an example, because as the name is a primary key, it must be unique for each row. So we can have two repeated rows with the same name in that database when the column is defined as primary key. Primary key is what identifies a single value in the table. Here is the country ID because each country will have one ID associated with it. Common primary keys, for example, an invoice number may be a primary key because uh, some because most of the times it's a unique number for a single invoice. A tax ID, for example, is an ID for you as a citizen in your country. It's your own number and no one else has the same tax ID as you. So that's your unique primary key in your country, transposing these examples to real life. So here in the table, it's exactly the same rationale. We need a column that is identifier of the table. Of course, it's not mandatory that the table has a primary key, but it is common when we are modeling data to have tables with primary keys because they will be used as a relationship with all the other tables. So I'm also going to add here something, auto increment. This will create a new index. So if I have a country ID one on the table and I insert a new row, it will automatically create a row number two uh, and with the ID two. So I'll leave here this property auto increment. You'll see how this works in a minute. And I'm going to say primary key. Okay, I've defined everything that I wanted for this country ID. Now I could also define here, for example, three or two. I'm not going to define it. I'm going to leave it in this way for you not to get confused right now. Country ID is a tiny integer, meaning that will go until, and let's consult the documentation. It will go until the value 127 because it's also a sign column. I can make it an unsigned column. Let's also add that property to this primary key. So I'll have here, it can be after the tiny int, unsigned. Okay, cool. I'm going to put here a comma. Now I've defined my country ID that can only have values until 255. That means that as this is the primary key, I can only introduce 255 countries in this table or at least 255 lines. So after this, I can have the name of the country. So this name will be a Varshar. And now why is it a Varshar? Well, because uh, of course, names of countries have letters and it's normally a text, free text. I don't think there is a country in the world that has only numbers, so it makes sense, of course, to be a Varshar. And here, I think the longest number of characters for a country is around 40 something or 50 something. I'm going to give 60 just in case. So I think this is enough. This means that I can't go over 60 characters here on this column. Remember that and we'll check more examples next. And here, I don't want a country to not have a name. Uh, I think that in this table, it must be mandatory that the country has name. I can use a property called not null. What not null contains is that this column can be a null value. In that case, when I insert data into this table, I must have a country name. This property not null is also added after creating the field. Now notice, this is something really interesting because the concept and the syntax is mostly the same. You give the name of the variable, you give the data type, and then you give additional properties to the field that you want. We've learned a couple of them, for example, auto increment, primary key, and also not null. And you can check more on the internet, more properties that you can use for the columns, but these are some of the most common ones that we can use when creating tables. Okay, I want a new column. Notice that what I've done is just comma new column, and I'm going to say foundation date for the date where the country was founded. And in this case, it makes sense to be what? A date, of course, as we've learned. So here, as we are dealing with dates, we should have this format date. That's the data type of this column. And finally, I'll have population, and I'm going to do something here, put it as a small int just for you to check. Does it make sense to be unsigned? Of course, it makes sense to be unsigned. There are no countries with negative population. So I'm going to put it unsigned. Cool. 
So here is my create table statement. So super simple, as you can see, this syntax is really straightforward. We use create table countries dot countries. We start with the name of the columns and then we put data type and the properties that this column will contain. So as you can see, this is pretty straightforward. And now I think it rings a bell. We spent a bit talking about data types in the past section because this was much easier to explain because we already know, or at least we are familiar with the data types when we do this command. So now you can focus on the create table command itself and not understanding what are the data types and why they are in this way. We spoke a bit about it before and now the concept should at least merge together. Okay, so I'm going to give here our final part of the query, which is the, of course, the dot and comma, and I'm going to run this one. Let's see if this was successful. And there you go. We have create table countries dot countries successful. If I do select all from countries dot countries, I'll have, of course, an empty table, as you can see here, because I don't have rows. I've just created the table structure. And now let's see what the describe that we also learn will give us about this table. I'm also curious to see what we'll have here. And of course, it's exactly the structure that we've defined before. As you notice, we have here the columns that we've set as not null are here with no, and also the primary key because the primary key can't be null by default. We have here the primary key indicating that the country ID is the primary key, auto increment with our extra properties that we use, and also our data types. So as you can see, this is exactly the same output that we've seen before in the data type section. And we've created our own output, so to say. So this is how we can create tables in MySQL. I hope this was explicit. Don't worry to drop me a message if you are having some trouble understanding this. Let's go to the next lecture where we are going to insert our own data, which will also be a pretty exciting part. Hello everyone and welcome back to the SQL course. So now let's fill our countries table. So we will want to add countries to our table, namely we want to add the name of the country, what's the foundation date of the country and also the population. I'll start here with a new command called the insert into. This command enables you to insert rows into a specific table. So in tandem with the create table command, it's a really, really important command here in SQL, particularly for modifying data inside tables. So I'll start with the following. As you might have imagined, this is the same syntax that we've used for other SQL commands. Insert into countries.countries .countries, and then what we'll do is opening parentheses to give our instruction. So now what we first need to do in, in insert into command is giving the columns where we'll be inserting information on. And these columns must be by the order that we'll set in the next statement, which is the values, okay? So I'm going to insert by order. I'm going to insert name, foundation date, and also population. So here, notice something. I didn't set a country ID because I'm not going to insert a country ID into this table because this country ID will be added automatically. Why? Because of the auto increment property. So the auto increment means that when I insert a new country in this table, the count of this country ID will start on one. When I insert the second, it will auto increment another value. So we'll have two and we'll see that uh, when we insert data. I have to close this one and close this parenthesis and give the values that I want to insert into these columns. In this case, I can pass values, open parentheses again. Notice the syntax, insert into database.tableName, then give the columns that I want to insert data into, and then passing values. And after the values, as you might have imagined, we need to pass the values that we want to insert in this table. I want to insert, uh, well, my home country, and sorry about the home bias here. So name Portugal, foundation date, it's on the year 1143, on the 5th of October. And now the population, at least the last known population, is around 10 million people. So not that many people compared with a lot of countries in the world. I'm going to try to insert this row into my table. What we'll have is now a new row in the table with Portugal. Uh, in this case, the country ID will be one because there are no rows in there. So we'll increment zero by one and we'll have one. Then we'll have the foundation date and the population. 
Now notice, the population is this large number, over 10 million. It gave here a data type small lint. Let's see what will happen when we try to run this query. We have an error. Now this is extremely important. When you put a data type and you overflow that data type, in this case we are overflowing the maximum number that is allowed in the small int, because the small int only goes until 65,535 when it's unsigned, as our column is. 10 million is over this value. What happens? SQL can't insert the row because of this type mismatch. Now, this is extremely important because when you set these data types, you must be sure what is the data that you are expecting, or at least the largest amount possible of data that you are going to put in these integer columns, or else you are going to have an error in your queries. And this can be extremely bad for your data pipelines. Here, as you might have noticed, SQL is actually pretty good in giving error statements out of range value for column population. That means that this value that I'm giving is out of the range of the data type that I've given. So let's correct that. I'm going to use the UI here oh, actually to delete the table. So I'm going here and to do here drop table. This is one way to drop tables in MySQL using the user interface. We are going to learn next how we can do this in code, of course. I'm going to do drop now. So my country's table is no more. Let me run again our country's table. I'm going here and create a new table. But instead of creating it with small int, I'm going to check what's the appropriate type that I can use here. And I have here the medium int, it goes until the 16 million. Now there are a lot of countries with over this value in population. Here I think this is 4 billion. If it's not, I think that this should be enough. Int. So let's use int. I'm going to use int here and create my countries again. There you go, create table, countries, countries was done. Now I'm going to run the insert into countries, or at least our countries table, my row. Again, notice that I've modified, and let's confirm that if I describe my table again, if I describe my countries.countries, .countries, what we have right now is this int, okay? Before, we had a small int, and our value overflew that small int range. It was successful. So now I can go for select all from countries dot countries. Let me get this a bit here. And if I run this one, now notice we have here one country in our table. Country ID 1, name Portugal, foundation date and population. And we've successfully inserted our first row into a table. In the next lecture, we are going to insert multiple rows at once and also check more examples of what happens when we do type mismatch between the rows that we are inserting and the data types in our table. So I'll see you in the next lecture. Hello everyone and welcome again to the SQL course. Let's continue with checking how we can insert data into tables. Here I'm going to recap where we were at. So I'm going to select countries from the countries database. And there you go, we've only inserted Portugal until now. There are two things I would like to tell you in this lecture regarding inserts. The first one is that we can insert rows only in specific columns. For example, the only ones that we have to insert data and they are mandatory in our insert into clause are the ones that are a primary key and also the ones that are not null, that have that extra argument not null, because those are mandatory that have some data. When we insert uh, data only to specific columns, the other ones that we don't specify in the insert into will have the rows as null first, and then we are going to check multiple inserts. I'm going to use the insert into clause that we've checked in the last lecture insert into countries dot countries and here i'm just going to insert name and population i'm not going to insert the foundation date for this new country that we are going to insert in this table so the new country that we are going to insert is going to be france so i'm going to use values and now you already know how we can insert things by the order that they appear here in the insert into clause so in this case i can give what's the name of the country it's going to be france and then i have to give the population Notice, I'm not giving the foundation date right here because I'm not naming it in an insert into clause. So as I'm not naming it, I don't need to give values here. I don't need and I can't because if I do that, I'll have an error because I'll have three values to insert and only specify in the insert into two columns. So here we are. Here is where we control which columns will get the data that we are feeding into the table. 
Now here the population is around 65, be more precise, this is the number, and then I can close my parentheses. So everything is equal to what we've done in the last lecture. We have an insert into clause into a specific table. Then we have the columns where we want to insert data to, or the columns where we are going to insert data. And then we pass the values, which will be the real data that we are going to insert in this table. Can you guess what is going to happen with the country ID? We are not giving country ID, but country ID will be inserted into the table. Why? Because of the auto increment feature that we've defined when creating the table. As that auto increment is on, what's going to happen is that SQL is going to add number two here in the country ID because it's going to increment by one the value that it already has in the table. Okay, so for the next countries, we would have value ID three, ID four, and so on. If we didn't specify the auto increment feature or the auto increment parameter when creating the column, that means that here we needed to have a country ID that was mandatory because we've defined that as a primary key. Uh, columns can be primary keys and don't have the auto increment feature, okay? So that's totally normal and it's uh, super common to happen. I'm going to run this one, insert into countries. The insert was successful, as we can see, and let's now select all from countries dot countries. Cool. So let us take a look into this table. As you can see, we have here new row, two, name France, no foundation date at all, null, and then population, the population of France. Okay, so uh, just notice that here we've selected the columns where we wanted to insert two, except the ID that had the auto increment feature in the metadata of the table. Okay, cool. So we've seen that we can select or specify the columns where we want to insert data. We can remove some columns where we don't have the information. For example, here, let's assume that we didn't know the foundation date for France, so we left it out. Now, it would be a bit cumbersome if we would have to insert things row by row, right? So there must be a way for us to insert multiple uh, rows in a single instruction. Let's check it. I'm going to insert into. So as you might imagine, this is exactly the same. And here, I'm also going to skip the foundation date. I'm going to put name and population. And now values. And now here is the new part that we can use, which is multiple inserts. These are extremely easy to understand. I'm going to insert Spain with the value of population. And then I'm going to give a new comma and insert a new tuple of values. So I open new parentheses again and I can pass a new country. I'm going to insert Canada. So notice I'm inserting multiple values in a single insert into instruction. Okay, here I'm also lacking these countries dot countries. And now I can give also the population of Canada, which is around 38 million. So 38 two zero five eight three whoops zero there you go so let's recap this instruction insert into our table with the columns that we want to insert data to the values and then instead of only having a single tuple or these values in between parentheses we add a comma and a new tuple so we can do this multiple times we can for example go here if we needed to insert another country we could copy and paste this and then change here the values that we wanted to insert and we will insert three rows in the table okay i'm going just to insert two right now let's run this one and confirm that this will go to the tables so the query is correct we have it syntactically correct it ran let's see if it added the countries that we wanted to our table okay let me run this one now there you go we have spain canada its population notice the country ids incremented for spain which is the next row three and for Canada country ID four. So the auto increment is really working as we are expecting. Don't forget that also because this is a primary key, this row must be unique. We can have here two ones or a value of one repeated two times. That's not possible with the primary key. Okay, cool. So here you've seen a couple of properties that are super interesting regarding uh, adding data to tables. Namely, we've seen how we can subset specific columns and also we've seen how we can introduce multiple rows at the same time. In the next lecture, we are going to finish this part of inserting rows into tables and just check some of the behavior that MySQL will give us if we insert invalid rows, just like we've done when we try to insert something bigger than the range of the small int that we've defined for the population. So I'll see you in the next lecture. Okay, so welcome again to the SQL course. 
Let's continue now and try to insert new rows that will probably be not valid according to what we've defined in the data types. This is a lecture that will connect a lot with what we've done in the past section and also it will enable you to understand the impact of having heal defined uh, data types in your table. So let us jump right into insert new rows in our country's table. So here we'll try name population again and try to insert new values. So an example would be, let me describe also that table countries.countries. Okay, this describe will give us the data types that we've defined. One of the examples, what happens when you try to insert negative values in the population? We have defined the column as unsigned. What will happen here? I'm going to do here United Kingdom and then minus 10,000 of population. Let's see the output from this query. It's an error. Notice, out of range values for column population at row 1. Here, as we have defined and signed, we can't insert this row and normally this will lead to an error. Be really mindful of the data types and conditions that you have on the table because this will be extremely important when you are trying to insert new rows. But when you have done sign, as you can see, SQL will return an error when we try to insert negative values on that column. Another one, what if we pass text to this population? For example, Will we have an implicit conversion? Let's see, ABC. So now my population for the United Kingdom is the string ABC. What will happen here? Let's check. As you can see, incorrect integer value ABC. That means again that this is not supported. See the difference in data types and why it's super important that they are very well defined on the table because if you are introducing things that the data type does not expect, you will definitely have an error and that will probably break your data pipeline. Another thing that we did not try was checking the impact of having the length of the varchar. I'm going to create a new table, which will be uh, something that will have country code, which is going to be a varchar with three letters. So it's those codes that we are not normally used to see for countries. Normally, some codes have two letters. Uh, there are other formats with three letters. Let us use a three, for example, and create this table. So I'm creating a new table inside the database countries with the name codes. I'm going to create this one. And if I go here and hit refresh all, I will definitely see here two different tables, the countries that we've been working on and now the codes, which is a completely new table that we've created. Now, let me try to insert values into this table. So countries.code and I want, or codes, and I want to insert into country code the following values. I'm going to insert PRT for Portugal. Let's see if this is supported. It is because uh, it has three characters, right? So you might expect this is completely valid and uh, legal in terms of SQL. If I go here to select all from countries.codes, what we'll have is then a new row with the PRT for Portugal. What if I try to insert something with four letters? Notice that we've defined Varshar with max length equals to three. What if I try, for example, here germ for Germany or an NETH for Netherlands, which uh, might be a good example. Notice now that I have here data too long for column country code at row one. Okay, uh, this is not supported because we have an extra value. I think there are some conversions that truncate the value. So they cut off at the maximum length. In this case, when we are inserting data, we have an error automatically. Because what SQL is saying is that, hey, you have too many characters for the definition that I have on my data type. So this is not supported. Now, another thing that's common is what will happen in this text value if I try to insert a number, for example, one, dot one let's see this was inserted correctly that might seem strange but remember that here sql is able to implicitly convert the one dot one into a text because you can convert one dot one into something of a text now really important if i go here and check select select all from countries dot codes and visualize it i have prt one dot one does that mean that this column is a number now? No. What SQL did was implicitly convert this 1.1 into a text. Even though I have sent a decimal here, that doesn't change the underlying structure of the table. 
Okay, what SQL was able to do is convert that 1.1 or implicitly convert into a text because if I describe my countries.codes here, we'll have Varshar 3. So exactly the same data type that expects text. Implicit conversions in this case don't change anything in the underlying table. Just make sure you understand that. So that's it for inserting data. Now let's see in the next lecture how we can delete certain rows from our table. And that's what we'll explore in the next couple of lectures. So I hope you're enjoying this section. This is a really practical section where we create tables and insert data and check the behavior of data types, which is tied to the last section. I hope you're enjoying this course and I'll see you in the next lecture. Hello everyone and welcome again to this SQL course. Okay, we've learned how we can create and insert data into tables. We've also learned well, what are the common pitfalls that we may face when inserting new data into a table? In this case, pitfalls related to the data types that we've defined on that table. Here in this lecture, we are just going to investigate how we can delete data from a specific table, because that's also a super common operation. Also, we are going to understand how we can delete a table altogether, wiping it out from the system with a simple command. This will be a more destructive lesson, so to say, because here we are going to learn how to remove data from tables or also remove tables from databases. Let's start. And here I'm going to start with deleting data from tables. So we can start by wiping out the entire table and retaining the structure of the table alive with the simple command that I'm going to show you, but I'm not going to run it. So if I type delete from countries and I'm going to use countries.codes because I'm going to delete all the codes that we'll have in this codes table that we've created. Let's just confirm what we have right now. So select all from countries.codes and let's check. So we have a code PRT and a 1.1 that was used to exemplify the implicit conversion. So if I run delete from countries.codes, probably we are going to have an error because of a property that we need to set here on MySQL, which is this SQL safe updates. This is just something that is set by default when we open MySQL. You can also change it here in the properties. I'll leave a link in the resources, but we can run this command so that we are able to uh, basically use these more destructive commands, so to say, because doing a delete from is a really, really, uh, is a really, really, uh, is a really, really high risk command, because if you are doing this in a production setting, it will, of course, have uh, many troubles as you will delete all the data from that table. Even so, let me now run again, delete from countries.codes. And as you can see, two rows were affected. That means that right now we have no data at all in these countries.codes. So I ran this delete from and I enter the name of the table. In this case, I'll wipe out the entire table. But notice the table is still available, or at least the structure of the table is still available here in my SQL because I still have the structure alive. If you can say it in this way, what I don't have is any data inside this table because I've done the delete from countries.codes. Again, remember that I had to set this property. Also, this is how we set some properties here on my SQL. In this case, I'm setting this SQL safe updates to zero so that I can use these more destructive commands. This is just a safety measure by default in my SQL so that you can apply this delete from without being conscious that you are applying a delete from again, because this is a really dangerous command. So this is how we can delete. We also learn a new SQL instruction here, which is the delete from. Now, a cool thing is that we can also delete something by a condition. Let's now pick up the countries.countries. Let's go to the countries.countries. And here, as you might have noticed, we have Portugal, France, Canada, Spain. So these are columns that we've been using. I don't have here in this version the foundation date, but no worries because we don't need it. But now what I want to do is what if I only want to delete a specific country from this table? For example, I want to delete Portugal from this table. How can I do that? Well, I just have to use delete from and here countries.countries. .countries. Notice that the syntax is similar as when we want to wipe out the entire data. And I add, just like we've done in filtering, a where clause. In this case, I'm going to do delete from countries.countries .countries where, and I need my condition. In this case, country name is equal to Portugal. This will wipe out only the rows that match this condition. In this case, this row right here. Let's confirm if I run this one, only one row was affected. Why? Because it's the only row that matched the condition. 
in this case the row where the country name is equal to Portugal if I go to my select all countries dot countries I should only have around three countries here of course France Spain and Canada Portugal is no more in this table so this is the common usage of delete from and here I've showed you two ways to delete data one is to delete the entire data from a specific table the other is to delete based on the condition okay so now the most destructive command of all the delete from is destructive but at least it retains the table structure now this command that I'm going to show you does not retain the structure completely wipes out the data and the structure of the table it no longer exists in our system and that command is called drop table okay so if I use drop table on countries.codes uh, imagining that this would have data the data would also go away but the more important part is when I use drop table and drop is a really common verb to use here in SQL it means delete when someone says I'm going to drop a table it means I'm going to delete the table I'm going to drop a column I'm going to delete the column what I'm going to do by running this one is removing the codes altogether from our SQL environment notice it's as if this table never existed in the first place so we just completely wiped it out here from our database so bottom line be really mindful when you are using these instructions because they are utterly destructive as you have seen and if we do this on the wrong tables probably this is going to cause a lot of trouble Okay, so that's it for this lecture. In the next lecture, we are going to learn how to change tables because we probably only don't want to insert things or remove things. We are probably going to want to change our tables, the data and also the structure of our tables uh, live. We just want to make changes to tables that are already created. That's what we are going to see in the next lecture. I'll see you there. Hello everyone and welcome again to this SQL course. So here in this lecture we are going to learn how we can change some things in our table, particularly in the table structure. So here I'm going to show you, for example, how you can drop a column, how you can rename a specific column, and even how you can modify a data type of a specific column. The script that we are going to use is this three deleting columns and altering tables that is contained in the SQL for Absolute Beginners for creating and modifying tables folder and here we are going to continue with our table countries dot countries which is the one that we have been using so far okay there you go we have france spain and canada this is a compound on the last lecture where we deleted the row with the country name portugal now imagine that i would like to drop the country name for example here from this uh, table how can i do that well there's a really simple command which is the alter table now the alter table command is a command that is a generic one to modify something in the structure of the table and in this case i can use alter table countries dot countries and then i can give extra instructions to this alter table namely i'm going to use the drop column so the drop column is a sub instruction inside the alter table in this case we have more things that we can do with the alter table as we will see next with the drop column what we can do is just remove a column from the table if i do drop column country name and then run this i'll have a successful query and now if i go to select all countries dot countries i no longer have the country name so this is the instruction if you want to drop specific columns we've seen how we can delete specific rows or drop specific rows in the past lecture here we are seeing how we can drop specific columns there might be other things that we would like to do for example changing the data type of a specific column that's also relevant with the alter table command again remember that alter table is like an umbrella term to encapsulate something that we want to change in the structure of our underlying table and so here what i can do is another instruction modify with modify i can for example change an underlying structure of a table in this case imagine that i would like to change my population to small int i use modify space the name of the column that i want to change and then the new data type that i want to change or in this case the data type that i want to change my data column to do you think this is going to work changing this to a small int let's see what sql will tell us when we run this instruction so we have an error why do we have an error because we have 
values in these countries dot countries that overflow a small int. Right now, this column is an int. So uh, we have here, for example, 65 million. As we've seen in past lectures, the small int can support numbers this large. So in this case, when we try to modify the column, forcing it to be a small int, we can do this because we already have values in the column that we can't fit in the small int data type. Okay, but what we can do, for example, I'm going to copy this instruction. Let me describe the table right now for you to check what's the uh, data type that we have right now in this column. So checking with the describe, what we have is what an int, so an int data type. If I do a modify to a big int, for example, now the big int is the data type that comes right after int. So it even holds larger numbers, so we will not have a problem because we, right now, all the values that we have in the population fit inside the big int, because if they fit in the int, they will definitely fit inside the big int. Now, we've changed the column type. If I do describe again, what we'll have now is a big int, because I've ran this code, alter table, countries dot countries, and modify the population column to a big int. In this case, it's this instruction right here. So I hope this was clear. See how we've changed the underlying data type of the table. When we've done conversions, when we even have done implicit conversions or insert new rows that contain different data types, we never changed the underlying column. We never changed anything in the data type. We would or create a new column that would have a new data type, or we would get an output with a query from our result. Now here, it's a bit different because here we are changing the table itself, the underlying table, and all the queries we will do on this table will now return something with the big int data type because we've changed the underlying table. Make sure you are aware of that difference when you are running code that's returning a query and when you are running code that's changing the underlying structure of your tables, everything that we consider physical tables, there are tables that we can see right here on our database. Another thing that I might also do here with the alter table, as you might imagine, is that if we can take columns out, we can also add columns in. So I can add column, a new, for example, name, and then what I can do is, for example, varshar20. Now, if I run, or let me call this country name, makes a bit more sense. Okay, so I've added with add column inside the umbrella alter table again. I've added a new column and right now what we'll have, if I go here, select countries.countries, .countries, I'll have three columns, but the last one is always null. Why is it always null? Because this was a new column that I've inserted right after the table was created. Now, there will be some instructions that we'll see in the future of how we can update these rows with the uh, if conditions or with uh, where conditions, as we will see. But in this case, we are just going to leave this country name as no. Now, something that I advise you to do, for example, to experiment is to create again this table with all the countries that we had in the country name and try to do a modify here to a varshar that doesn't fit the number of characters that you have in there. You'll also see that you'll have trouble and an error in MySQL by the same logic of changing an int to a small int when the values that you have on that column already overflow the small int data type. So try that for yourself. You also have those experiments in the scripts in the course materials, but I'll let you uh, do them also for yourself for you to train these instructions. Two last things before we leave. Here with the alter table, we can also do something really cool. Here, alter table, countries dot countries. Then I can do change column. So you might have noticed also that I'm doing these instructions sometimes in uppercase, sometimes in lowercase. Ideally, one would do them all the time in uppercase. That's a best practice. Uh, but here, uh, as I'm teaching at the same time, sometimes I forget and then I do everything in lowercase. So sorry about that. But most of the times when you have these instructions, particularly the ones that are highlighted in blue, it's a best practice to have them uh, uppercase so that everyone knows that these are SQL syntax or at least that these belong to SQL syntax. Okay, so I can do now, for example, country name will change to just country. And then I have to give also the data type. I'm going to do data type. It's exactly the same. Now what I'm doing is renaming my column 
country name to country this is what this instruction will do and then i also have to give when i do this instruction of renaming always uh, saying the data type up front also in this instruction so that's also mandatory that's why we have here you can use the same data type when you are renaming a column from one name to the other now the cool thing is that i change the name of the underlying column in this table if i go here right now the column that i have with country name is called country and this was how I rename the column, the specific column, here also with the alter table. So see how this alter table works, right? So this is an umbrella term that we used with sub instructions that can do several things. Change column names, add new columns, modify the data type of the column, and also drop columns. When you use the alter table, basically know that you are changing the underlying structure of a physical table that you have right here. Another thing that you can also do with alter table is renaming the table itself. So if I go for countries.countries .countries and I do the following, rename to, I can, for example, rename this to countries.country summary. This will change the name of the table itself. So now notice again, alter table, blank space, the table that we want to change, and then the underlying instruction, in this case, the rename to, countries dot country summary okay i'm going to run this one and let's check it right now it's called country summary no longer countries if i call select all from countries dot countries i'll have an error because that table no longer exists in sql because i've changed its name as i've changed its name no way that sql now understand what's the countries dot countries it only understands the countries dot country summary. Okay, so now, now let's recap a bit of these altered table instructions. They are pretty important and probably you'll uh, find them in a lot of SQL instructions. So we have the drop column that will enable us to drop a specific column. We have the modify to modify, for example, the characteristics of a column. In this case, we are modifying the data type of the variable or the column population. Then we have the add column to add new columns. We have the change column if you want, for example, to rename a specific column. And then we have the rename to, which renames not the columns, but the table itself or the name of the table. So alter table is this big umbrella term that enables you to do a lot of things with the physical table and change a lot of the parameters that you have defined on the columns or even on the table name. That's it for this part where we've uh, investigated a lot of things regarding adding information, removing information, changing the underlying information of our tables, and also how we learned how to create our own tables from scratch. I advise you to do the next use case so that you can really practice these skills and learn to build these SQL instructions by yourself. After doing this, you'll be probably ready to start to create your own tables and modify your own tables so that will be really important skills for you to become a sql programmer okay so i hope you're excited and let's go to the use case hi everyone and welcome to this creating and modifying tables case study here is where we are going to practice our skills of creating data and also inserting and deleting data from a specific table so let's jump right into our case study and understand what we'll have to do now our challenge is to create the stores information on the books and books database. So as a part of the IT department, what the company asked us is to model this stores table and also insert some information into it in the database because they want to track the stores that the company has. On the first exercise, what we will do is create that table. So we'll need to create a table named stores inside the books and books database. And this table should have just three columns. So a store ID, that is an auto-incremented integer primary key, and then a not null store name, that will be a varchar 30. Finally, we'll have a capacity, an integer column that will tell us how many books is this store able to store. On exercise two, we need to change the type of the capacity column to small int. So this will be an exercise focused on understanding how the alter table commands work. Then we need to insert new stores into the table. So we need first to insert the booksy store that has a capacity of 500 inside the stores table. In the exercise right after it, we'll need to insert two stores at the same time, the pagey and the leaflet stores. They have this name and these two stores can have in its warehouse 200 and 250 books respectively. So 
Exercise 3, inserting a single row. Exercise 4, inserting two rows at the same time. In Exercise 5, we need to set the SQL safe updates clause to zero. If you don't remember this, go back to the lecture where we needed to delete data from a specific table and check the clause that I've ran in there so that I was able to do that, or just search on the internet to check what's the clause and how you can run it. Exercise six, we need to delete two stores at the same time. This is something that we didn't check in the practical lecture. So uh, of course we have all the ingredients right now to do this exercise, but they were a bit separated between the past sections. So you'll need to compound on the concept of deleting information or deleting data from a table and multiple selection. Check the internet if you need some help on this. Here you need to delete the leaflet and the books it stores from the store table. And this is in a single SQL instruction so that you can use a multiple selection instruction. Now on exercise seven, we need to insert a new store named library. And this has a capacity of 2000 books on the storage table. Here we return again to practice inserting into. And then on exercise eight, we need to change the capacity column name to book capacity. Here we are also going to practice something regarding alter table. Finally, we need to add a new column, which is the region column to this stores table. Of course, this region will not have any data at all, but at least we'll have information or at least we'll have the column in there so that we can store data later. This column should be a Varshard 100. Okay, so this is the case study for us to practice this section. Of course, we also have the quiz uh, to understand some of the concepts, but here you'll be a bit more practical and you have these nine exercises that will help you to get more familiar and gain new skills when manipulating tables in SQL. If you are having trouble, check the next lecture where we are going to solve these exercises at the same time. So I'll see you there. Hello everyone and welcome back to the SQL course. Let's now complete the case study here in this lecture. Let's cut along and check the solutions for uh, this case study. I hope you were able to do the exercises by yourself. If you are curious, also stand by for you to see the solutions that I've developed here for uh, this case study. So let's go to exercise one, which asks us to create a table named stores in the books and books database. The table should have the following columns. Store ID, that is an auto-incremented integer primary key, a not null store name, that is a varchar 30, and capacity, a tiny int column. So here I'm going to write exercise one, and then we can use create table. So the create table command, books and books dot stores, we open parentheses and we start to define our column. So we had the store ID, remember the name of the store, or it should be store name, and then the capacity. Now let's see what are the properties of these columns. So the store ID is a not incremented integer primary key. So I know that this is an integer, I know that it should be primary key, and I also need to add the auto increment. So I can add right here, auto increment, right before the primary key, and we've defined the integer column that is an auto incremented one, and it's a primary key of the table, meaning that it's the identifier of this table. So the store name is a not null varchar, so let's go for data type first, varchar 30, and then we can add the property not null that we've already learned. And then we have capacity, a tiny int column. So I'm going here, capacity should only be tiny int, close our parentheses and close our query. So if you run this query, what you'll have is then a table created here in the books and books called stores. I'm not going to run it because I've already ran this command. So uh, I have the table already in my database. But if you run this command, you'll see that this command will work creating the structure that you want. So let's go for exercise two. Just recapping before going to exercise two, create table command is the command that enables us to create tables from scratch. Exercise two, we need to change the type of the capacity column to a small int. So here, remember, we have to use first alter table, then we pass the table that we want to change, and then we need the sub clause or the sub instruction inside the alter table, in this case, the modify. So remember that we have several instructions that we can use here inside alter table. In this case, we are using modify. Modify can change a specific column type. So if I hit capacity small int, what I'm doing is changing the data type of the capacity to a small int. That's just what you need to do here in this exercise. Remember here you are training how to use this modify inside the alter table. Exercise three. 
let's go here for exercise three we have insert a new store named booksy with a capacity of 500 in the stores table so a new command that we've also learned insert into so i can insert books and books not stores and now remember i have to pass the columns where i want to insert into so store name and capacity again why am i not naming the store id because the store id is an auto increment column don't forget about that no need to name it when doing the insert into because sql will automatically increment a value in that column by itself as the auto increment feature uh, tells us in its name it will be auto incremented so here i'm going to put values now because i have store name capacity and i can pass the values that i want to put and here the, the values as you know are booksy which are the name of our store and the capacity 500 again remember when you are passing strings pass the quotes uh, either single or double quotes when you are passing numbers don't need any quotes at all so you just pass the number okay can close this query not going to run it also so most of these commands are not running them but if you run these commands you'll see that they will work exercise four which is kind of similar insert two new stores with names pagey and leaflet with a capacity of 200 and 250 respectively i can copy this command because we'll also use the insert into but now we have something different we have to insert two stores in a row so the first one is pagey pagey that should have 200 200 of capacity and now remember that i can add a new store for example just here with a simple comma and giving a new tuple of values so here a leaflet which has 250 this will insert into my table two rows at the same time okay so the two rows will be inserted or one after the other but the same query will insert the two rows and we don't need to have multiple insert into instructions to do that just use comma and then new tuple of values in this case new pair of values between the parentheses okay cool so exercise five it's a simple one it just set the sql safe updates clause to zero and here i'm going to do exercise five then we can use set remember set is setting a property we didn't study this like in the uh, with so much detail during the course but set is just setting some property in sql that's why we also flag this exercise as something that wasn't approached in the lectures but even so here is how you can set specific properties in sql so sql safe updates equal to zero here we are changing this property that's enabled by default in mysql when we work with mysql workbench you can also change it in the options directly but with code you just use this instruction of setting this property this will enable us to delete uh, objects or delete elements from the table and also remove or drop tables which is something that we will need for the next exercises so on exercise six is a bit tricky because we have to delete the leaflet and booksy stores from the store table with a single instruction so we already know that we can use the delete from command so delete from books and books dot stores now how can i delete two stores at the same time to do that i can use a where clause remember when i just use delete from without a where clause i'll delete the entire table so it's a really really uh, powerful and destructive command but here with the where clause i can use where the store name because i want to delete by name right as you can see leaflet and booksy but now i can use an operator that we've learned before which is the in operator that lets me select several elements from a specific table remember when we've done the sequila.film examples that's what happened here so store name in and i'm going to put leaflet and booksy this will basically delete me from the books and books store all the rows where the store name is in one of these two so in leaflet or in books in this case the two of them will be deleted now notice that this where supports all the clauses that we've checked in the basic querying section okay so this where supports general sql syntax everything that we've learned with the greater than less than or different than works here in this where clause because this where clause is exactly like a select all from because this where clause selects exactly like a filter statement a where statement in a normal select clause or in a normal select query if i when we close this one and if you run this one you'll check that 
these two stores will disappear from that table. Okay, so exercise seven is also easy, which is insert a new store name library with capacity 2000 on the stores table. Here, you've already done this. So this is a recap again on this insert into. I just wanted you to train a bit more uh, this insert into, so capacity and then values and we need library and 2000. Now we have to change the capacity column name to book capacity. So uh, the capacity column right now has the name capacity. We need to change it to book capacity. Again, we can rely on alter table. So alter table books and books dot stores. And now we need a new sub instruction of the alter table. And that instruction is the change column. So I'll change column and I can put capacity to book capacity. Remember, this is the syntax to use this change column. And then I can use varchar 30 and close this one. And this is the statement of the same data type that we've defined right here because we are not changing the data type, just changing the name of the column from capacity to book capacity. Finally, the last exercise, we have to add a region column to the stores table. This column should be a varchar 100. I'll go here to exercise 9, alter table, books and books dot stores, and then we can add column and in here region varchar 100. So here we have a new uh, sub instruction. We tested three here, the add column, the change column, and also the modify inside the alter table. We've seen here another sub instruction of the alter table that you can practice, which adds a new column to already existing tables. I hope this case study was pretty clear to you. This was a case study that I think it's a, like an easy level, but even so, it's a good one for you to get familiar with these instructions, the delete from, the insert into, the alter table, instructions that change the underlying data or structure of your table. Okay, so we've learned how to work on a single table. We've learned how to query the table, understand how we can select grouping data and also changing uh, the structure or the data of that table with these instructions. Now, there's some things that we did not do, which are super famous here in SQL, which are joints. Joints are the way for us to combine tables or at least combine tables horizontally, meaning adding new columns to the domain of a specific table. We'll see that in the next section where we are going to do two things. We are going to study joints, but we are also going to study how we can append data or stack tables one on top of each other. So let's go to the next section where we'll study different joints and I'll see you there. Hello everyone and welcome again to the SQL course. So here we are in a new chapter on our SQL for Absolute Beginners course. We are now entering an exciting new part, which is the part where we are going to combine tables. So this is one of the most common usages of SQL. Uh, and I think where most of the confusion may start to appear when you are dealing with SQL, because it's sometimes lectured a bit fast. And I think that we will spend a lot of time here in this course to really understand this concept. And we'll spend some time really understanding how these joins and union operators work. First, we'll understand how we can join tables uh, using a common key to expand our table with new columns or restrain the domain. You'll understand what this means in a minute. And then we'll understand how we can use union operators to also concatenate our tables one on top of the other. Those are a bit more simple, the union operators. The joins are, of course, the ones that are a bit more uh, challenging at the beginning, but as soon as uh, you get the hand of them, you'll understand that they are uh, extremely simple and they are a really cool concept here in SQL. So you might have heard about joins somewhere in your life. So left join, right join, inner join, these are some of the most common usages in terms of joins that you might have heard someone from IT or databases talk about. This is because this is a central concept here in SQL and in databases in general. Now, one of the main ways for us to connect different databases, and let's jump right into some example that will let us understand what this means. Now you can find the scripts that we are going to use in this part on chapter number five in the course materials. So if you go here, SQL for absolute beginners, five combining tables, that's where you will find all the scripts that we will look at in this section. Now we'll return to work with the Sequila database again. Now that we are not going to create our own tables, it makes sense for us to return 
to the table that we are most familiar with. We are also going to do some examples with our own created tables. So don't forget, first to start this, let's connect to our database system or server. Okay, so let me start by doing one thing, which is going here for our Sakila database and select just two columns, the rental ID and the customer ID from the Sakila.rental. So this is a new table that we haven't explored yet, but it's a really simple table that just has the information about the rentals that the customer has done, a specific customer, for example. Customer one has rented all these movies with these IDs. I've just subset these two columns uh, with a purpose which is if I have this information and we don't have the name of the customer in the rental table, I may want to know the name of the customer, for example. Does it make sense if I'm doing this for a specific customer and I want to call him, for example, to give him more information about the rentals that he has done, does it make sense to treat him as customer ID one? So uh, on the phone, like, hey, hey, customer ID one, how are you? I've seen that you've rented these movies in the past, blah, 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 blah. Doesn't make sense. We want to have the name of the customer here. So. What would be an easy way for us to get the name of the customer? We would have to have some table that would give us this decodification of the name. So we would have customer ID one is a specific name. We have that table because if I go to the select all from secular.customer, I'll have the information about my customers. For, in, for example, here I know that this is Mary Smith. It is my customer. It's the name of my customer. Of course, if you would do this by your own for every row by hand, it would be extremely cumbersome. We would like to combine both of these tables in some way. Have the customer ID, have the rental ID of the movie, and have the first and the last name of our customer. So what we can do is then combine these tables using a join. Basically, a join is for us to use some specific column to get more data to a specific table, in this case, additional columns, we can also do domain restriction as we will see next, but mostly the usage of joins is to do this, to pick up using a common key, picking up data that is on another table based on a specific column. As an example, I know that the connector between these two tables will be the customer ID. So if I go here, I know that I have customer ID on the table on the left. Let's start to use these terms and you'll understand why. The table on the left, which is the secular.rental, I'll have a customer ID. Table on the right, I also have a customer ID. And the table on the right will call the secular.customer. So I'm going to do the following. I'm going to start with a select statement, customer ID. And then I know that I'll have the following. I know that I want the rental ID. And I know that I want the first name and the last name. Of course, if I just use secular.customer on the table on the right, let's call it in this way, I'll have an error because the rental ID is not in this table customer. And if I do the opposite, if I go to the rental and run this one, I have an error because the first name and also last name, but the first name is the first that we have right here, is not on this rental table. And I want to combine them. So what I can do is do a new syntax, which is the inner join. And I'm going to do after the from. So the inner join will enable me to connect two tables based on the common key. Now I know that I want to connect the secular.rental with the secular.customer and I have a new syntax afterwards on. And you might imagine what comes on the on. It's the key that is going to connect both of these tables. So I can go customer ID equals customer ID. There is still a small issue here with this query because the customer ID is not referenced from what table I want to use the customer ID from. So if I want to connect the customer ID from the left table with the right table, I must name that customer ID. And this is where the alias enter because here I'm going to use the power of the alias to name what is the customer ID that I'm going to equal to what customer ID. For example, if I run this as it is, I'll have a mistake because the column customer ID is ambiguous. What this means is that this column is on both tables. So as I only reference it as customer ID, SQL doesn't really know which of the customer ID I'm referencing, okay? So I need to reference which table I want the customer ID. And let's call this in this way. So this will be the left table. I'm going to call it with this alias, and this will be the right table. 
Now notice, I'm doing an alias after the inner join. This is also enabled by SQL. I can do alias on the table that's on the from, as we've learned in the first section of the course. And I can also do the alias on the table that's going to be connected with this one. So now what I can do is, for example, name in my columns where I want the column to come from. I only have to do this in the ambiguous columns, of course, in the columns that are repeated, in this case, the connectors that are repeated in the tables. The other ones don't need that because SQL knows where it's going to pick up that column from because there's only one of those tables that have that column. So here I'm going to say left table. Of course, for this example, it's completely the same if I use left table here dot customer or right table dot customer because both of the tables have all the customer IDs. This doesn't happen in some of the cases and in left joins and right joins, what you put here really does matter and we'll see that in a couple of lectures. These ones don't need to have the table that I want to reference from because rental ID is only on this one, first name and last name is only on this one. So they are not ambiguous columns, they are not on the two tables. And also here on the join, this will still lead to some ambiguity because this column, again, is on both tables and I need to reference which one of them I'm referencing. And of course, here I want to equal the customer ID from the left table with the customer ID of the right table because I'm doing a join between both tables. I can also put here the right table, for example. I can also call that column, but this will be a duplicated column because this is exactly the same information in both of the tables. So let me run this one and as you will see, something almost magical happens, which is really cool. So we have, for example, customer ID, customer ID will be exactly the same, these two customer IDs, and then we'll have the rental ID and the first name of this customer, the customer ID one, and the last name of this customer. Now we have already information in the same table of the rental IDs that Mary Smith has done. And if I go here, start with Linda Williams, these are the rental movies that also Linda Williams has done in this case. So this was super cool because now we were able to augment our table. And this augmentation enabled us to bring more columns to our table. Now, what exactly is an inner join? I think that one of the best images to explain, and I'm going to go there, is this image right here. So if you check, this is from WQ Schools, a really cool website. But if you check, an inner join is a join that only brings the values or the rows that are matched in both tables. Imagining that we have a customer that didn't have any rental at all, so it means that it was on the customer table, but it wasn't on the rental table because that customer didn't do any rental, then that customer would not be in the result. In this query that we were seeing, if there is a customer that didn't do any rental on the left table, with an inner join, he wouldn't show here because he, he is not in both tables. An inner join only returns where the key or the key that connects both of the tables is in both tables. We also have here left join means that we bring every row with the key on the left table. That's why I was calling it a left table and independently if it is on the right or not. We'll explore this also next. The right join is the opposite and the full outer join is a bit more complicated will not get into it right now. So these three are ultra important, inner join, left join, right join. Let's see a bit more about inner join because next we'll have opportunity to explore the left and right. So now I'm going to create here two tables. You can go and pick these tables up from the course materials and this will be an example on how the inner join performs. So here, if you go to the course materials, you have here these two temporary tables. Temporary table is also a cool trick, which means that we are creating a table that will not store anywhere here. And when we close the section, it will not be physically stored anywhere. So it's just a temporary table. It's just something that you can do if you want to have a table that doesn't register in the metadata, that doesn't get registered here and occupy space, at least after you close uh, MySQL. So I'm going to go and create and insert into these two tables. Uh, if you want, you can also experiment and try to code these uh, instructions on your own uh, to train the creation of tables and also inserting into, as we've seen in the past lectures. I'm going here and running both of these tables. And now let us uh, take a look 
at both of these tables and I'll go here and do select all from sandbox customer country and let's see so what we have right here are customer IDs and specific countries from where these customers are from let's imagine that these are arbitrary customers for our business if I go here and check the other one which is the sandbox customers I'll have the ID of the customer and also the name of these customers so I have four customers in my business John Adam and and May now I would like to join again this term to join this data with the customer country so I'd like to have here the country of these customers now notice something I have here something extremely interesting which is I have customer ID one two three and four in this table but on the other table if I go here there's something odd I don't have the country for customer number two I have for customer one three four and five that means that there's a customer missing here what will happen when I perform an inner join using this data let's see so I'm going to write here select and then I'll want customers or cust I'm going to simplify uh, a common thing that you can use to simplify allies is call it a and b for left and right table I'm going to use that syntax right now so a customer ID a for customer name and b for customer country okay so right now I'm composing this query with a and B as soon as you see A and B two different alias in the references of the columns you'll know that there's a join somewhere uh, down the line so from sandbox.customers and now what's the alias for this table because it's the one with the customer's name it's as A an alias and then how do we perform a join inner join again this is a specific type of join and now what comes after the inner join comes the right table that we are calling B so I need sandbox dot customer country as B and now what we need after this we need to give the key of the join so on a dot customer ID is equal to B dot customer ID now I can close this query and let's run it so I hope this was explicit let's review it one more time so I'm selecting the customer ID from table a as it is an inner join it doesn't matter where I select this column because this is the column that will be used as a key for the join I'm selecting from table a the customer name and from table B I'm selecting customer country again different alias means that we'll have a join somewhere from the customers table that has an alias as a so we are already naming our table we are doing an inner join with the customer country that's been called B and then what we are doing is doing an on in this case what we are saying is that customer ID will be the connector between both of these tables let's see the result and something interesting just happened notice that we have John and May but there's a customer missing namely Adam why because Adam wasn't present in the customer country table that's why inner joins start to put your domain or at least start to narrow your domain of your tables because if the key is not in both tables the row will not pass the information about the row will not pass in this case if we just do this join we don't have any information about customer number two he is on the sandbox customers he doesn't disappear from the customers but he doesn't have a country assigned as it doesn't have a country assigned when we try to get the country of the customers using an inner join that means that this row will not show up in this case the row the information about Adam is not showing up in this uh, result right here because of that the inner join that takes us to the next lecture where we are going to learn about left and right joints that will give us some different details about this result that we see right here with left and right joints we'll see something a bit different let's continue then with this concept and i hope you're enjoying and understanding this concept of joints if not feel free to drop me a message and i'll be happy to support you on understanding this concept i'll see you in the next lecture hello everyone and welcome again to the sql course so in the last lecture we've seen how inner joints work and in this lecture we are going to understand how left and right joins work and how they differ from the inner join so i'm going to put here example left and right join 
Now I'm going to use again some tables that I'm going to pick up from the course materials. We are using this left and right joint script to slash left and right joints. I'm going to pick up these two tables that we are also creating. So those new two tables that should go to our sandbox database. Okay, I'm going to run both these tables. Just make sure that you run them also. We are creating this customers right left and customer country right left. Uh, these are also the examples that we are going to use in this section. Let's see what these two tables contain. If I go here to sandbox, customer country, right, left, what we have right now is exactly the same type of information or at least the same use case that we have in the inner joint section where we have some customers and also their countries. So the respective country of origin. And then, as you might imagine, in the customers right, left, which is analogous to what we've done in the past lecture, we have several names of different customers. Now we have more customers and we have two different types of situations. While before we had a customer that we didn't have a country allocated to, right now we have two situations. We have that same situation here, but, but we also have cases where we have the customer and the country, but not the customer on the customer table itself. Well, that may sound strange, this will be a good example for us to understand what right and left joins mean. So if an inner join only returns the examples that are in both tables by a specific key, the right and left join don't really care if the thing on the other table on the other side, and by the other side I mean that there will be a master side, a master side will be defined by the right or left join, that's why I've been also calling these right and left tables, so the master side will be the only thing mandatory in the join. If that customer, for example, is not on the other table, we will get the columns for all the other customers with data. And for that example that is not on the other side, we have a no. But now we don't filter this row. This row is not out as it was in the inner join. Let's see this in code. I think it's much easier than uh, me explaining it. Okay, so I'm going to do the following. I'm going to pick up the customer name again. First, of course, let me put this as right. I'm going to call it R for right table, L for left table. So I'm going to customer ID, and then I'm going to pick up from the right table. I want the customer name, and then from the left table, I want to pick up the customer country, of course, so customer country. And then from, we already know this, so sandbox dot customer right left so this table as r and then i'm going to put here an inner join first sandbox customer country right left as left so the customers is our right table that's what we are considering at the moment the customer country right left is the left table okay so the table that we will consider on the left it's also return to this visual element with right table, we are considering this one, left table, we are considering this one. Let's first start with the left join, just to start here on the left. So I have a typo here, and now I'll, of course, have to do our key. And our key is what? Is customer ID is equal to left, or the table on the left, customer ID. If I run this query, as we've seen, we only get, as a return, the customers that are at the same time in both tables, right? But we have here certain, for example, certain customers that don't have a country and vice versa. Actually, I'm sorry about this because I'm doing this, I'm doing this new alias on the spot. I'm going to switch this because it makes more sense because the left one is on the our left and the right one is on our right. So let me change this to make a bit more sense. In this way, we are starting with the left joint. So as I want all the customers, but it doesn't matter to me if they are on the customer country table or not, what I can do is do a left join. And you will see that when I run this one, I no longer have those two customers, in this case, Adam and Joe, as filtered on this table. They are here, but with no values. Means that we don't know this information for these customers. This is extremely uh, common in production setting. We only have certain information about certain customers or uh, other types of phenomenon that it's completely normal to happen in databases. So when you do inner joins, really be mindful of what's the domain of both tables. Understand if you are not filtering out something that is important for your use case. In this case, of course, when you do a left join, you also have a trade-off because 
you bring columns with no values and probably you have missing information and that's maybe a problem depending on your use case. As you might have imagined, we have here a left join. What will happen if we use a right join? Let me just return to the joins. The left join is this right here. Everything that is on the table on the left and everything that is common. What is not on the table on the right will be returned as no. Always take these visuals in your mind when you are doing joins. So if I switch from a left to a right, what will happen is that we'll have all the countries, now this is interesting, all the countries that are repeated on that side, we have here a customer, for example, customer seven doesn't exist in the customer's table. But in this case, we have one row with the UK, but without correspondence here on the customer ID and customer name. Of course, this is a more weird example because it doesn't make much sense to have a customer uh, with a country associated and not having it on the customer's table. It's a bit more weird, but even so, this is how this works. Now, one of the things that I've told you before is that in inner joins, the alias that you use here on the key doesn't really matter. Here for right and left joins, they do matter. So one of the best practices is to use the alias from the master table. What is the master table? Is the table that commands the join. If it's a left join, it's the table on the left. If it's a right join, it's the table on the right. So for example, if here I'm doing a left join, I should of course make the customer ID using the left table. If I'm doing a right join, I should use, and let me run this again with the right join, which will give us this. As you notice, we have a customer ID as no. And this doesn't make much sense in our use case because we know that there's a customer ID somewhere, which in this case is the seven, that doesn't have the correspondence on the other side. So to change this, we just don't know the name of that customer, basically. We can, to, to change this, in this case, the best practice is to use in this alias, always the master table for left and right joints. As there is no master table in inner joints, this doesn't matter in inner joints. And now, as you can see, when I use the right table, uh, you notice that the customer ID is already here. This really makes sense if you think about it, because here I'm bringing all the information that I have on the right table. Hence, here I'm bringing the column from the right. As I can find that correspondence with the join on the other table, my customer ID on the left table will be no, because there is no customer seven on that table. So here, if I bring the customer ID from the left table, I'll only bring the information that is available on that table, in this case, customers one to six. Okay, really practice this right and left joins here in SQL. You'll see that after you understand both these three joins, inner, left and right, you will power up your SQL skills by a lot because these are really common ways for us to combine tables in SQL. And of course, we are not tied to a single key, a single column. One of the things that you may be wondering is that if we can only use a join or we can only do a join by a single column. And before we go to the next lecture where we are going to see if that is the option, let's just recap what we've done here in this lecture. So we've created here both of these tables, a new customers table that I called customers right left because of the exercise that we are doing with a customer ID and customer name. And I also created a customer country right left that has the customer and its country of origin or where this customer is based. Then what I've done is just insert some examples in this case, these customers, John, Adam, Anne, May, Susan, and Joe, and then inserted some customers and their countries. The caveat is that we have certain customers that are not here on this country right left. So in this table, there is also here a strange example of a customer that has a country, but is not on the customer's table. So what happened is that then we performed a right join and a left join to understand how these types of join work and how they do not filter the end table just like inner join has done. Basically, they just consider that the information that wasn't found on the other table is considered null, no information. Of course, using right, left, inner joins depend on your application and what you want to do when you are crossing domains between tables. Okay. So let's continue and understand how we can do these multiple key joins in the next lecture. I'll see you then. Hello everyone and welcome again to the SQL course. So until now we've approached inner, left and right joins and we've only done some examples with one simple key. So one column acting as the connector between two tables. Now there are other cases and normally this also happens a lot 
during your life as a SQL developer or as a data analyst where you want to connect tables by two or more columns. That's what we are going to learn here in this lecture, and also we are going to approach the concept of a composite key, which means a key that contains more than one column. So I'm here in the script, three multiple key joins. I'm going to open SQL. Now let me create both these tables for us to start the lecture. So I'm going to copy this data, then paste it here. We have Again, two temporary tables created in our sandbox uh, database, and then we'll insert this data into each of the tables. I'm going to explain next what they are. Don't forget, of course, to connect to your server. Okay, so I'm going to run this code and let's see what these tables contain, both these tables, both the customer month and the customer balance. So I'll go here, select all from customer month. And oops, of course, forgot the database. There you go. Now let's go. Okay, so here what we have is then a position for each customer in each month. Notice that we have customer ID 1 and customer ID 2. We have three different months for John. The value of this column is replicated for all the rows for the same customer ID. And then we have the name of customer ID 2 of also replicated throughout four months. Imagine that this would be the table of the active customers per month in your store. Imagine that you have a bank and that this is the... Uh, active customers per each month. So John is a customer of your bank in these three months and May is a customer of your bank in these four months. Now, you might notice something here. So the customer ID is an ID, but it's not a unique column. So it doesn't have the parameters to be a primary key because it's not unique. We have three times the customer ID one and four times the customer ID two. Now that's because this is a composite key or a, a complex key or a multiple key, however you want to call it. So the identifier of this table is not only the customer ID, but the customer ID and the month. So two columns make up the key of this table. And notice something interesting because customer ID one in month 2019-03 is unique. There's no other row that contains this combination. Customer ID on March, customer ID on April does only appear one time. Also customer ID one on May, the same. Thing. So this is extremely interesting because now we may have several columns that compose a specific key of a table. By key, we mean the rows that identify this row. There's no way that we have here two rows for customer ID one with the month 2019-03. Okay, this is a relevant difference between the single primary keys that we've seen before where just one column was a column that was the primary key of that table. So how do we do this in code? Let's just check it really quickly. Imagine if we are creating here the table sandbox customer month, and then we have the columns right here, as you can see. Remember that when we wanted to uh, put a primary key in a single column, we would go here and add, for example, this parameter to the column or giving this extra argument in the column creation. Now, if we want to do multiple keys, what we have to do is at the end of the creating the table, or at least at the end of stating the columns, we have a primary key and then we pass the columns that will be composing that primary key inside these parentheses with comma for the different uh, columns that will be part of that key. For example, here the customer ID and the month will be part of the primary key of this table of a multiple column key. Here the only restriction is that these columns, of course, must be stated in the columns that we are creating in our table structure. Okay, so this is a relevant difference when you have a single primary key you use the arguments of the column to create and state that that column will be a primary key. When it's a multiple primary key, you have to use a new argument after creating all the columns, or at least stating all the columns, indicating that this will be your composite primary key. Okay, now let's see the other table that we have here, which will also have a composite primary key or a multiple primary key, which will be the customer balance. Now, as you are a bank, mostly at the end of the month, each of your customers will have a specific balance. Notice that we have here some months that are missing because there was no balance available or you couldn't get that information. And we have here the data for customer ID 1 and for customer ID 2 and even a new customer ID 3 that we didn't have in the customer month. Okay, this is on purpose because we'll do some exercise with this. But notice that now we have here several balances. For example, customer 1 had balance of 10 euros and then 15 euros. Customer 2 had 1,525 euros and then 225 euros in the next month. Now, this is interesting because 
what happens if we try to cross or to join these tables only by the customer ID? Let's see that first. So I'm going to go for the following. Select a dot customer ID, a dot month, a dot customer name. I think it's customer name. Let's check customer name exactly. And b dot customer balance. And then from what? From the table sandbox dot customer. What's the name? Customer underscore month as a. Then we can use, I'm going to use inner join sandbox.customerBalance as B. And now on A.CustomerID is equal to B.CustomerID. Now let's see what this will yield. Whoops, I had here two typos. B7, of course, should be B, and this column is called balance. Sorry about that. Let's now run this one. And there you go. Now something odd is happening. Notice we have, for example, customer ID 1 with the month repeated. 2019-0303, John John, and two times the balance. The balance that the customer had on March and on April, and that is repeated throughout the columns, right? Uh, notice that the both of the balances appear twice. Why? Because we are producing duplicates in this column. As we are only using the customer ID as connector, what will happen is that each time the row or the customer ID is on the table on the left will be repeated by the number of times of that that information is on the table on the right. So if I go here, for example, we see here, as an example, we see here that the customer ID is repeated six times. Why is it repeated six times? Because here I have three times the customer ID uh, for different months, and in a customer balance, I have two times. So the information will always be repeated, in this case, by the key number, so uh, as I have, 3 on the table on the left times 2 the table on the right, I'll have 6 times the result on the resulting query. And this happens because I have duplicated keys on my join. As I'm only using the customer ID as a key, and this is not the primary key of that table, this is not the identifier of that table, the join is basically multiplicating these rows because that's the number of times it will match this customer ID on the left with each customer ID on the right. So for each row that I have on the left, I'll repeat it two times because that's what's on the table on the right. That will create six rows with repeated information. Of course, this is not what we want to do. Let's just confirm how many times we should have on customer ID 2 just to uh, go a bit deep into this concept. So we have four times the customer ID 2 on the table on the left and on the table on the right, we have two times. So that means that in the end table, what we'll have is eight times the customer ID two. Let's confirm. So one, two, three, four, and then one, two, three, four, eight times, just as I've said. And the information is, of course, repeated several times. And this is not what we want. Now, this is where the multiple key joins uh, really enter, because, of course, I don't want this. I just want to have the name of the customer for a single line because the balances do not repeat themselves as they are repeated here. So the, the balance for 2019-3 was 10 euros, not 15 for John. So that doesn't make sense in terms of the information because I'm repeating the rows as I'm not naming what's the uh, composite key or the complex key that we are going to use. So we have to do some change here in our query. And that change is super easy. We just have to add another column to the join because that's the primary key of that table. And in that case, I'm going to use an end because the end will give me that I want to do a join by this column and by another column. In that case, I'm going to do a.month is equal to b.month. Now, this is extremely cool because as soon as I run this query, no more duplicated values. Now we have the right rows here. So we have, we are doing, of course, an inner join. That's why we have few rows for May here, because two of the rows for May weren't available in the other table, on the table of the balance. So in this case, that's what we have. We have four rows, but notice now that the balances are correct. And we also have the customer name for each customer. So that's what we wanted with this query to augment our table. But without producing duplicates, uh, this is one of the most common mistakes that people do when building data pipelines or using SQL to extract data and doing joints is to build duplicates in your data that will be extremely harmful for your analysis. Because imagine if you wanted to evaluate the balance of this customer throughout the months, as you are a bank, anal bank analyst or something like that, you would basically be multiplying the balance of these customers three times uh, for some of them and four times for the other. 
So this would be uh, extremely weird because the customer would have more money than it is supposed to. Of course, that would be good for the customer, but not for the bank itself. Particularly in terms of analysis, it will be a mistake. So now that uh, we've seen this, let's also test other things. What if I do a left join? What will happen? Well, the left join works exactly the same. The difference is the months that don't have correspondence with the balance will be null, just like we've learned before with the left joins, where the information is carried, but it will be null where we can't find information on the table on the right, in this case, because we are doing a left join. Now, another thing is that sometimes we want to produce duplicates on purpose with these multiple key joins, or even without these multiple key joins with a single key join. Let me explain this a bit better. Imagine that now we would only have this table that I'm going to create right here, which is this unique customer. Well, the name already spoils what we are going to see, but even so, let's see this table and you will notice something interesting. So imagine if I just have a single customer or a single ID per customer. Now notice that this should be a primary key in this table. I didn't actually, uh, no, I actually I used primary key here. Now notice, I can also use this syntax for a single primary key, although people find it more easy to do that way on putting the argument on the column right in there because you would avoid having an extra line. But even so, this is a primary key on this table, unique customer, where we just have one, two, three. So the customers that we have on our database without being replicated per month. So this is not the month image that we've seen before. Normally, you will also hear people speak about image when they are speaking about multiple rows. For example, an image per month means that we'll have multiple rows per customer per each month. Now, a cool thing is that we can also produce duplicates with this because imagine that I would want for each of these customers check their balance throughout the months. In that case, I can do that join. So select a not customer ID. Uh, I hope you're now familiarized with this A and B that I'm using. Normally when I'm saying A, I'm referring to the table on the left. And when I'm saying B, I'm referring to the table on the right. That's also a common syntax that you'll see with code throughout the internet. So I'm going here, A, customer ID. And then I'll just want to have, for example, B month and B and B dot balance. Oh, you might uh, be wondering why this is blue, uh, right? Why does month have a blue color because month is actually also a SQL table. I probably shouldn't name it in this way in the examples. I'm just naming it in this way. So that's a bit more straightforward, but it's a good practice not to name columns with the uh, names of uh, SQL functions. That's why this is in blue because it's a reserved word for SQL and SQL just shows it blue because it recognizes this, uh, that this may be a function. Okay. So if I go from sandbox.uniqueCustomer, right? And now I'm doing an inner join with the sandbox.customer balance on a.customerID is equal to b.customerID. Super cool. Let's run this one. Oops, and of course the alias and a bit sloppy today. Sorry about this. So there you go, the alias. Okay, now notice something we have, we are duplicating our customer IDs, but this information makes sense because on one of the columns we have a unique customer and we are producing duplicates, of course, in our query, but even so, these, these duplicates don't cause any harm. Why aren't they causing any harm? Because the balance indeed is not being duplicated and this happens because we don't have multiple keys in both of the tables. So we have a unique keys in one of the table, the table on the left, and we have multiple keys on the table on the right. But this makes sense in terms of what we are wanting to analyze in this table, right? Because we have month, month, because we are multiplying the customer by the table on the right. And this is totally okay, okay? So this is completely normal. Don't worry about it. This is something that happens quite a lot, you uh, wanting to do this, just make sure that you know what is the number of times a specific key appears on the table on the left and how many times it appears on the table on the right and never ever forget to check what's the result of your join because sometimes you may think that you are doing the right join. You are producing duplicates and that will lead to some confusion and error in your analysis. Believe me, this is one of the most common mistakes that people do when they are doing data analysis really important to understand the domains of the tables that you are working on and how they are behaving in the output. So that's it for joins for now. We've had here almost half an hour of explaining joins, inner, left, right, and these multiple key, really important concepts for SQL developers and for data analysts. Now let's continue and see how we can append 
data one on top of the other, the union keyword that we'll check next. We'll explore that in the next lecture. I'll see you there. Hello everyone and welcome again to the SQL course. Okay, so we've learned how to combine tables with joints. We've seen some examples of the inner, left and right joints and also how we can combine using multiple keys. So most of the use cases uh, using joints are done to combine tables horizontally. So we want to add more columns to our specific table. Of course, there are other usages for joints, but most of the times, at least 90, 95% of the times, that's the main usage. But what if we have two tables with exactly the same structure, or at least with fields that we want to use from a similar structure and combine them into a single table. In this case, stack one table on top of the other. That's where we use the union operators, something that we are going to learn here in this lecture. So I'm going to use this for dash union operator. This is going to be the script that we are going to use. I'm going to open up, of course, a new SQL file so that you can write from scratch. Okay, so for example, let me pick up this code that creates two different tables and you can pick it up from the script that on, that's on the course materials. So as you see here, we have uh, two different tables that contain store one and store two. Now store one, this is a brick and mortar store that, that sells products regarding pets, either food or toys or whatever. And here we have these columns that are the invoice ID. In this case, each store will have their invoices, the sales that they do, the customer ID, the item quantity, so how many of those products were taken by the customer, the order value, so how much did it cost, and also the product name. Here in the store two, we have this for a single store, for store one, where we are going to have uh, many invoices for this specific store. But then we have this also another table called store two that contains exactly the same information, but for another store. And the system where this database was set up was a bit older. Uh, the customer ID or a loyalty card wasn't implemented. So there isn't a customer ID on this table. This means that the structure of both tables only differs on the customer ID. But of course, they all contain invoices from different tables. How can we uh, append these data one on top of the other, even though they have a slight different structure? Let's create both of these tables and insert some invoices. Don't forget, of course, to connect to your local server. Okay, so running this one, it should create both tables and we'll have uh, the data from both stores. Let's also take a quick look at both of these tables. I'm, no, I'm not coding these create tables and insert into uh, instructions because they would take a lot of the time of the lecture and we've learned them so it would take a bit of time from our lecture where we would basically see the same type of instruction but if you want on your own you can code them uh, by yourself looking at the course materials seeing the structure and then trying to code the instruction all by yourself so that you can also train this skill a bit more so let's look at our store and there you go we have three invoices with ids 123 165 166 so they are basically dog and cat food orders, or in this case, purchases from customers. We have different customer IDs. In this case, each of these orders has a customer ID. So they are known customers by the store. And if we go to store two, as I said, and imagining and role playing here a bit, the system uh, was a bit older. So there's no customer ID. There's no way to know which customer purchased that. We only know the invoice. Now, I would like, for example, if I'm doing a report where I want to check the total amount of sales from both stores in my company, or in this case, in this pet uh, toy and food company, uh, I would like to join both stores. Of course, I would like to have an easy way to combine the sales from both stores. So what I can do to have this in a single table is a simple union operator. So the union operator is really, really easy. We just learn how we can do selects. So I'm going to do a select of these columns, for example, I'll want the invoice ID, the quantity, order value and product. Why am I only selecting these columns? Because these are the ones that are common between the structure of the two tables. We'll check also what will happen when we don't do that. And now I'm going to do from sandbox.store1. So if I run this, this should be what we are already familiar, select from our simple statement. Now a cool thing is that I can remove the end of my query and do union now the union will be an operator that will combine this query that we have right here with another query that we want and in this case i'm going to do a select here for store two exactly the same select but for the store two 
Now to do this union, we need to have exactly the same columns, or at least uh, we need for that to make sense, we need to do that. We'll see what will happen when we don't. Now I can close the query because of course this is a single query statement if we use the union, run this one, and there you go. As you can see, we have the three orders from store one, two orders from store two, exactly in the same table. This is the same result. And this is super cool because now I can use this I can use this information or do something uh, called subqueries using this information that will be something that we'll learn a bit ahead in subsequent sections. But now I have a single table with this information. So I have a single table with the invoices from both stores and I can compute stuff on top of this. Now uh, you might be asking what happens if I try for example to put the customer ID here in the select. If I just put it on the top side and I run this, I'll have a mistake. Why? Because the select statements in the union have a different number of columns. I can't do that. When I'm doing a union between both tables, the selects must have exactly the same number of columns and also the same type. If I try to put the customer ID here in coming from store two, you'll see that this will of course give me an error because there's no customer ID in that table. Now let me remove this one and do it all the same. Now, for example, we are not tied only to this union. Uh, there's a significant difference that I would like to tell you. There's the union and there's the union all. So here, union or union all will not make any difference because we have uh, distinct rows, meaning that there's no duplicate rows between our tables. If there is a duplicate row between our table, then in that case, the union all will retain the duplicates and the union will not retain the duplicates, will basically uh, collapse those duplicates into a single uh, into a single result. We can do uh, an exercise to see that. And for example, I don't need to have all these columns if I don't want to. A union can be on only a single column. For example, I, I may only want this column by doing select the product from the store one and the store two. And I'm going to now do an union all. The union all, again, will show this five values. Right now, this also shows the five invoices and union and union all do not make a difference because these rows are distinct. They have different values. For, for example, the invoice ID is always different. But if I do this here with the product store, oops, I have here a small typo, sorry about that. Let me run this. Okay, I have dog food, which has the first invoice product, cat food, dog food, cat toy, and cat food. These are the products in each of the invoices. But I'll notice if I do an union on this, instead of the union all, I'll have only dog food, cat food, cat toy. So these are the distinct values for this product alone. Because I'm appending only the products of the first table with the products of the second table, and I'm not selecting more columns. If I put here all the columns, again, let me repeat that. If I put here all the columns, now this will not happen because the row itself is distinct with the union because the invoice IDs are always different. If I have exactly the same invoice ID, item quantity, order value, product in both of the tables, in the result, we would only have one with union. If we have union all, we would have the two, okay? Just make sure you are aware of that. Now you can try here with several columns, for example, putting more columns, uh, taking out columns and seeing the behavior of union and union all. This is uh, commonly called a set operation here in SQL. There are also other set operations that are unfortunately are not available in MySQL, which are except an intercept. You can check on the internet what they do, because I believe that it will be easy to understand now that we've understood union, but unfortunately there's those operators are not implemented in MySQL. You have to do some workarounds to uh, get there. And I think that it's not a priority at the moment because they're also not that commonly used in most use cases. Okay, so we finished this combining tables section. I hope this was clear to you. You've enjoyed this section. Now let's go to the quiz and case study that I've prepared for you. After that, you'll be ready for most things here in SQL and you'll be ready to tackle more advanced problems using this language that helps you to manipulate data. So let's go to the case study and I hope you're enjoying this course. I'll see you in the next lecture. Hello everyone and welcome again to the SQL course. So let's go for our case study in combining tables. And in this case study, we are going to train everything that we've learned in this section, either joins or also union operators. And what we need to do in this case study is to build the structure for the invoices data. So we'll create some invoices data and then we'll cross that information 
with the products and also with the stores data that we've seen before. To make this not dependent on past exercises, if you have done the past exercises, you can just continue uh, forward. If you haven't been able to complete them, you can use this recreatebooks.sql. In this case, it's this one right here, this file right here, run it from top to bottom. And in this way, you'll have the databases that we will need to uh, perform this case study. Okay, so in this case study, we'll start a bit with the create table command. As always, this is also something normal when we start with case studies. So we need to create a table named invoices where we are going to store the invoice ID, the store ID, the book ID, the invoice date, and the price of that transaction. Exercise two, we'll insert three invoices into this invoices table. Now on exercise three, we'll really start the part where we start to combine tables. So we need to perform an appropriate join, and this is left ambiguous so that you are able to go through the thought process of using left inner or right join and in this join we are going to add the book name to the invoices table we need to only add the products or the common products between the invoices and the books table exercise four is a little bit of a stretch but here you need to perform a join on top of the join above now one of the things that you can do in sql is to use multiple joins one right after the other so you can use inner join on something and then the result you can use inner join on something right below to combine three tables as an example check the internet for more information on how you can do this we've learned 80 percent of what we need for this exercise during the lectures but this is also for you to go a bit forward and try to implement something that you will see on the internet because that's something really common that you will do throughout your life as a data analyst or sql developer so here basically we need on the top of join above add the store name to the result so we'll have a table with the invoices with the product name in this case the common products between these two tables and then we'll add the store name also on top of that result and i challenge you to get that result you'll see that this is fairly easy exercise six we need to perform an appropriate join to add the book name to the invoices table in this case we are going to retain all the books that were sold even if they don't have a match on the books table. On exercise six, we need to create a new table called invoices new, where we are going to have the same structure as the invoices table, but we are going to add a new column called discount, which should be a decimal 194. Exercise seven, we'll need to introduce these two invoices into the invoices new table. And now that we have invoices and invoices new, you are probably expecting this exercise eight, where we need to combine or create a query with the result from the invoices and the invoices new in the same table. We want to retain all the duplicate invoices and all columns common to both tables. Okay, so this is, of course, where we are going to check the union operator. Exercise nine, we need to do exactly the same thing, but instead of keeping the duplicates, or in this case, the invoices that are repeated, we want to collapse them into a single row. We have also learned this in the lectures. Exercise 10, add a column discount with type decimal to the invoices table on the result from exercise eight. And this is again, a bit of a stretch for us to check something new. You need to create a new column in the resulting set with the discount divided by price. Remember that here in exercise eight, you probably have the invoices and invoices new in the same table. And now on top of this result, you need to create a new column with a combination of select statements and what we've learned now you'll see that this is fairly easy. You need to name that new column price discount. A hint is that you probably can do this in the select statement, as I've said, but probably you'll need to do in both select statements of the union that you will have. Okay, so let's go forward. Now I advise you to do this case study and check if you really understood what we've talked about joins and union operators. If you want, you can check the next lecture where we are going to go exercise by exercise building the SQL instructions that we need to have these exercises correct. So if you end up going to the next lecture, I'll see you there. If not, I'll see you in the next section. Hi everyone and welcome again to the SQL course. Let's go step by step understanding what we need to do in each exercise and doing the solution uh, at the same time. So exercise one, we need to create a table named invoices with the following structure. Invoice ID, integer primary key. Store ID, integer column that is a not null. Book ID, an integer column, that is not null, again. Invoice date, a date type column. And price, a decimal 194 type column. Here, let's start with the create table command. We should create 
in the books and books dot invoices and then we can start with the structure our structure is invoice id so invoice id should be an integer primary key then we have store id store id which should be an integer not null we have the book id which is also book id sorry about the difference in the casing that we have here here we have casing with the underscore and here we have uh, what is commonly called camel casing sorry about that uh, it should be it should be coherent between both of these columns but as we've done the tables that we are going to connect here with different casing it's better that we keep it this way just to avoid confusion so book id with camel casing is going to also be an integer not null you can do for example instead of having here book id you can do book id in this way no worries just remember that when you are doing the exercise ahead with the join using this as a key you'll need to have exactly the same spelling okay because this is case sensitive so the upper and lower casing must be exactly the same now i need an invoice date so invoice date which should be a date and finally price so price is a decimal 19 for and i think that's it let me close this one i'm not going to create this table again so i'm not going to run this code but if you run this code you'll create an invoices table here in the books and books database okay exercise two let's now insert three invoices into our table so insert i'm going to put here exercise two insert into books and books dot invoices and i want to insert the following so i want an invoice id a store id a book id check that i'm inserting the ids because i don't have uh, auto increment in any of the columns okay if you don't have auto increment we need to uh, add them or at least use them explicitly in the insert into then invoice date and price okay cool and now values let's start with our values so invoice id 19994 19994 on store id 2 book id 3 so 2 3 right i'm using the same order of my insert into it's just a recap on what we've done before invoice date 1st of january of 2021 year comes first in this case in the normal format then 1st of january and then 19 dollars so 19 dollars okay I'm going to put it also in this way so that we can now do a comma and add a new invoice and i'll go here there you go new invoice and then also another one because we'll need another invoice second invoice we have 1995 then store id 4 on book id 7 store id it's 4 and 7 let's see the date so this was purchased on the 3rd of march of 2020 2020 3rd of March at the price of one dollar and a half so one dollar and a half next one is this invoice ID so invoice ID 19996 store ID for book ID 15 so 1996 store ID for book ID 15 of purchased 5th of April of 2021 so 5th of april of 2021 at a price of 21.5 okay you can run this one and you'll check that your invoice ids will look kind of like this so books and books dot invoices okay very cool we have store id book id but now imagine that i would like to know what's the name of the store id and the name of the book id that's exactly what we are going to do in exercise three and four so exercise three now let's check perform the appropriate join to add the book name to the invoices table only add the common products between the invoices and the books now this last sentence takes us where takes us to an inner join because we only want to add the common products between both of these tables and this sentence also gives us a hint on what's the key that we need to use in this case common products products must be the key what's the product it's the book id let's see here for example a dot invoice id a dot store id i'm selecting everything from the table on the left and then a dot invoice date 
I could use a dot asterisk, for example, to bring everything from the table on the left. Let me also do that uh, for you to check. So I can do a dot asterisk brings everything on the table on the left, b dot, and I think it's book name. Cool. Now, from, from what? From the books and books, and our table on the left will be the invoices as a inner join with books and books dot what the books table and these books should be as b now what we can do is where a dot book id because that's the column that we have available on the invoices table is equal to b dot book id this will give us the correspondent book name for each book id that we have here in this table in this case the 3 7 and 15 and of course here i'm missing an on uh, this is also cool when you see here this uh, cross or flag or flag means that uh, your syntax probably incorrect. In this case, my syntax is incorrect because I'm here missing an on to indicate that these are the keys that should be used as connectors between the tables. So that's why I have that with a cross there that indicated me that the query was clearly wrong. And there you go. I know that this is Moby Dick and the Black Swan. So these two books. Notice that book ID 15 is not here. Why is not here? Because I'm doing an inner join and this book ID 15 is not on the books table. I don't know the name of that book. I don't have any metadata regarding that book. So in this exercise, we don't use it to go forward, okay? Because we are only asked to perform this join in common products between these two tables. And common things, let's say in this way, always takes us to inner join, okay? So I'm going here, exercise four. On top of the join performed above, add the store name to the result. Now, we have an hint here, which means that we can stack joins by immediately adding a new inner join clause. I would like to have here also the store name. Do I need to do a new query to do this? No, I can stack joins one on top of the other. This is something that we didn't approach in the practical lectures because it's a more advanced concept, I would say. But even so, it's a good opportunity to introduce it here and also explain it. Okay, so let me pick up this one. So A, B, book name, using exactly the same join. I can now take this out and then use exactly the same syntax right below. Now I'll have a new table added to this join, added to the result or compounded to the result that we have right here. So this result. And what I can do is then to call a new table and in this case, my new table will be the stores table and call it with a new alliance, for example, C. And in the select that I'm using for these multiple joins, I can use C dot store underscore name, which will be the name of the store. Of course, there's still a thing that we need to change. I'm going to ask you to pause the video and understand in this query. Let me do this. In this query, what's still wrong and why this is not going to work yet? Okay, assuming you pause the video, let's go and check what's wrong. Of course, what's wrong are the columns that we are using to connect with the stores. There's no book ID on these stores, of course, and it doesn't make sense to perform the join with this table using keys that are present on the other two tables. So we need to use, of course, a join for this one. What we can do is then to use the store ID. So a.storeID is going to connect. Do you think it's going to be b.storeID? Of course not. It should be c.storeID because the c is the alias that's referencing the stores table. And in this way, we are compounding joins one on top of the other. Now, if I run this one, you'll see that magically we'll have here the name of our stores, pagey and library. Okay, now let's go slow. So select everything from the table A, select the book name from the table B, the store name from the table C. Then we name our table A, which is the invoices. We do an inner join with the books table using the book ID. And then on that result, we do a new join with the stores table, naming it as C and using the store ID as the new key of the join. Okay. So in multiple joins, when we stack joins one on top of the other, of course, we don't need to use the same key. We can change the key that we are using referring to that new table. I could also do this, for example, I could take this join out, of course, but now I can't refer here the book name. 
So I can do this. And in this case, my book name disappears, of course, because I'm not joining with the books table. And now notice, as I'm not joining with the books table, the domain of my table also changed because the book ID 15 is here. As the store that we have right here is available on the stores table, we were able to perform this inner join. But as soon as we have here a new join with the books where the 15 is not in the books table, that disappears. Okay, try for yourself what happens when you do multiple joins and why stacking joins one on top of the other is a great idea and it's also a good way to perform to do cleaner code. Maybe a bit confusing in the beginning, that's why I didn't go too deep into it in the lectures, but even so, this is a good opportunity for us to get familiar with this concept. Okay, so exercise five, perform the appropriate join to add the book name to the invoices table, retain all the books that were sold even if they don't have a name in the books table. So in this case, what we are going to do is pick up the same code that we have done here in exercise three, I'm going to name it exercise five, and we have to change something. And if I go to the question, retain all the books that were sold, even if they don't have a name in the books table. All the books means that I'm having a left or a right. What's the table that contain all the books, not only the ones that are in the books table, it's the invoices table. If I go here, the invoices table is the A, so the A should be to the left, in this case, left join. Running this one, we'll have 15, but book name as no. Why? Because this book is not registered in the books table. So exercise six, we need to create a table named invoices new with the same structure as the invoice table. In this case, we are going to add a new column called discount, which should be decimal 19.4. So if I go here, I'm going to copy exactly the same code, exercise six, and discount should be a decimal 19.4, that's it. And oops, of course, not only that, I also have to change the name of the table, of course. So if you run this one, I can't run it on my own because I already have these invoices new, but if you run this code, you'll be able to create your table. This is also something really common to do in SQL, creating tables back and forth. When you are doing some joins or in the use cases, these are pretty common uh, tasks. We need to insert two invoices into this invoices new table. So I'm going to do here, pick up the code from exercise two, but in this case, it's going to be an exercise seven. So this first invoice is exactly the same as the invoice that we already have in there. So the invoice with this ID, only difference is that we add the discount to zero. And here in insert into, add the appropriate discount column that we have here and also invoices new. Okay, going to take this out and then add the new invoice. So the new invoice is 1997 on store ID 2. So 1997 store ID 2 and book ID 1. So book ID 1 purchased on the 3rd of November of 2020. So 2020, November 3rd, with a price of $2, $2, and now there must be a discount, discount of $1, okay? You can run this one, and your invoices new will look something like this, from booksandbooks.invoicesnew. So this should have quite this look with two invoices, and of course, a new column that's not in invoices called discount. So exercise eight, create a query result with invoices from the invoices and in invoices new tables in the same table. Retain all duplicates invoices and all columns common to both tables. So I know that I'm, I'm going to need here exercise eight, and I'm going to need, for example, all these columns probably. Let's see if all these columns will be available. Select from invoices, and then we need what? An union union all because we want to retain the duplicates and then i need to select the same from invoices new now there's a thing the discount is not available in the invoices table so i can take it out here but i also need to take it out below because i need to have the same table structure in the union or in the union all and now of course i need to name the database don't forget about that books and books I've tried to run this without naming the database. Uh, of course, uh, sorry about that. So 
there you go. Now here we can see, of course, all the invoices, even these that are duplicated. So this 19,994, or invoice ID with that number, is duplicated, it has exactly the same information. Uh, we can solve that on exercise 9, because exercise 9 asks us to do the same thing, but only to collapse all these duplicate invoices into a single row. We just have to change something here in our query. I ask you to pause the video, and check what should be the change that we must do on this query. Okay, assuming you've paused the video, we just need to remove this all from the union all. And now if I run this, I'll have only four rows because my row was collapsed, my duplicate row was collapsed into a single one. Okay, so we're almost at the end, and here, exercise 10, we need to add a column discount to the invoices table, so to the original invoices table. I'm going to do here discount or exercise 10. This is also a small throwback to another section, so alter table, books and books, dot invoices, add column, discount, decimal, 194. So we've learned this when we were changing the structure of our tables using the alter table command. I'm going to run this and of course this is going to give me a new error because I already have the discount in that table but if you run it but if you run it you'll be able to add this column to your table. Final exercise is a, also a, an interesting one. So on the result from exercise 8 and adding the discount column create a new column in the resulting set with the discount divided by the price. Name that column price discount. Let's see how we can do this. So I can use or compound on this information of the exercise eight. I'm going to go here, exercise 11. And now I need to add the discount as the query asked. Okay, now let's look at both of these tables. Okay, so we have here this discount and the price, of course, for the discount that we've only added after creating the table will have no, because we didn't insert these values into the original invoices table, but we have the discount for the other ones. Now, what is indicated in question is that we need to create a column, a new column, with the discount divided by the price. Now, we know how to create new columns based on other columns in a SQL table, or at least in a select statement, right? So we just go here, use discount divided by price. And we know that we can name this column with an alias, as we've learned in the first section of the course. I know it seemed a long time ago, but this is what we've learned in the first section. So discount underscore price. Now a curious thing is that uh, if I run this as is, I'll have a problem, because the structure of the tables is not the same. Well, I can solve that using exactly the same calculation on the table that will be union to this first result. And now, what I can do is have this discount price column based on this calculation. So as we are doing a union operator, of course we need to have the same structure, but that doesn't restrain me from creating all the columns that I need right here, just like we've learned in the past sections when we were creating things on the select statement. Okay, so this statement is really super powerful because here you can create most of the things that you want regarding using the current columns and by using an union you just have to state the same thing in the select of the table that you are going to union of course to make the tables have the same structure so as long as you know these small bits of information about the instructions in sql for example the union all means that you need to union two tables that have the same structure then sql is really really flexible for example you can do a group by even a query with a group by right here, and then you can union it with another group by that has exactly the same structure. And in that case, you'll stack two group by results. That's super cool, and that's something that is supported here in SQL. We finished the combining table section. This is a really important section for you to understand how you can combine different tables in SQL, either horizontally by uh, joints or vertically by union operators. I hope this was clear to you. If there are some things that uh, you still aren't sure about these concepts uh, that we've been learning, drop me a message. I'll be super happy to help you and support you on your learning. I hope you are enjoying the course so far. I'll see you in the next section.
Hello everyone and welcome again to this SQL course. So we are here in another section of our SQL course. Here in this one we are going to check more advanced stuff on select statements. And as we've learned a lot of things here in SQL, we are now going to compound that knowledge in learning a bit more about select statements and particularly two things. We are going to learn about subqueries and we are going to learn how we can use select statements to insert data in a new table. So let's jump right into it. We are here in section 6. If you go here to the course materials, it should be this six more on select statements. This is the section that we are going to start right now. Okay, so subqueries are a really powerful concept here in SQL, and we are going to start by learning them. We, you can pick up this one subquery script and also connect to your local server. Okay, so let me start with the select secular film. Of course, this is one of the staples here in this course that we've been learning. Uh, remember that this is a table that contains different movies and also the description of those movies, the release year, the language and so on. And now, for example, I want using a join to pick up what's the language description for a specific movie. So if I go here, select, for example, I want so a.title, the language ID and the length. Now, I want something else. I want something extra. I'm actually going to put right next to language ID. I want to pick up, and there's a, a table here called language. I think it's language. Let's see. There you go. That has a decode between the language ID and the name of the language. So English, Italian, Japanese, and so on. I want to bring this column here. We've learned how to do this, of course, with a join. That's what we are going to do here. So b.name and this will go in this way from of course the table a will be sequila.film as a then we do an inner join with sequila.language as b and now we need the column that's going to connect this which will be of course language id is equal to b language id okay cool so we'll have this join, we'll run it, and now of course we'll have then these four columns and we have a new language name right here, English for language ID 1. So now one of the most cool things about SQL is that we can now query this result again. When we have a result here, this is commonly called the set result. When we have this set right here, we can now perform a query on top of this set. So uh, imagine that this would be a table that is physically created in your database. As we are doing queries, we can now compound on this query, on this result, and do a query on top of this. For example, I'm going to pick up this query again. I'm going to call here subquery. And it's called a subquery because it's a query nested inside another query. And now I can do, for example, one of the simple ways to do subqueries is to close this, call this an alias. So all this query is an alias, and I can do on top of this select all or my query dot all from the following statement. So the following SQL query that is being treated as this alias. So we are selecting from a specific query itself. If I run this one, of course the result is the same because I'm just doing a select all. Now, as you might imagine, this is extremely interesting because we can now do all the operations that we've learned so far in select with subqueries that we have also created ourselves in the same script. For example, if I want to do, imagine a group by, by language to check the average length of the movies by the language name, not by the language ID, I can do the following. So I'll pick up this my query, which will be the inner part of my query close this one and now what I can do is remember select name or I'm going to state my query dot name and then avg from my query dot length I know probably this is seems a long time ago but we are going to do a group by statement as avg length from all the query that is right here there's still a thing missing. Remember that to have these aggregator functions, we need the group by. So I'm going to do group by my query dot name. Now let's go a bit slow here. What we are doing is treating this query, this inner query that we see right here, with an alias. And then we are doing several things with this alias. We are doing my query dot name, an average of my query dot length as the average length. 
and we are selecting everything from this subquery. So we are performing, it's as if, imagine that this table would be created with the name myQuery, it would be if we would do, for example, uh, sequila.myQuery, but we don't have this table created anywhere in our database, we are creating it in loco, so we are creating it right here with a query as well. One of the things that will help you to structure this is to write your query, imagining what would be here, for example, uh, my uh, custom query as my query, and then just uh, do it backwards. Go inside this my custom query and start to do here inside some select statement. And let me return. That's can, that can also be a way for you to uh, think through these subqueries. You can do it starting on the subquery itself, applying the logic to the subquery and then applying something on top of that logic, or you can start to think about what you want to do and then applying a subquery on that statement, imagining that that table would be created. Now, if I run this, something super cool happens. I have the name and the average length for English movies. In this case, in this table or in the Sequila database, we only have English movies. So that's why we only have here this name. Now, this is really cool because this gives us a really, really good flexibility on working with SQL. We now can access subqueries or we can use subqueries inside specific queries to retrieve results. So everything that we have learned so far, basically we can use all the select statements, group bys and all that, on top of those results that we have already learned or everything that we've already learned so far. So this was the intro to subqueries. I hope this was uh, pretty explicit to you. How we are using a query inside a query. This is also commonly called nested queries. It's also another name for this subquery uh, concept here in SQL. In the next lecture, we are going to approach another example using subqueries because we are not going to see just one example. Of course, because uh, being exposed multiple times to this concept will help you to understand what we are doing with this uh, SQL concept. Okay, so I'll see you in the next lecture. Okay, so let's go through another example in subqueries. I'm going to write here example two. And now I'm going to see here and explore another table, which is the sequila.payment. Let's look at it. So here we have a payment ID, a customer ID, and a staff ID, and a specific rental ID and amount. This should be related to the rentals that the customers have done in this uh, video shop, in this case, in the sequila video shop. So I would like to do two things, and I'm going to do a double group by here using subqueries for you to also visualize this common operation that one would do in SQL. So we are going to do a first group by by each customer staff pair. So we are going to have customer staff and then the total amount that that customer has done with that staff ID. So that should be easy because we already know how to do this. So customer ID, I'm going to put customer ID, staff ID, and then sum of the um, amounts, and I'm going to do as sum amount from our sequila.payment, and to do group by one and two. Remember that you can use the numeric order of the columns in this group by statement. Let's see. So here we see that customer one with staff ID one between themselves, or this customer has done with this staff ID around $65 of rentals. One of the things that I would like to check now is that I would like to know how many customers have done rentals with each staff ID. For example, with staff ID one, I want to see how many customers did uh, this staff ID or this uh, worker at the store received and also the customer made a rental with him. I want to see if there is some unbalance. For example, if staff ID one has more rentals done than staff ID two, or at least has more customers that have done a rental with him or her. Let's see. So what we can do now is I can, for example, count by each staff ID the number of customer IDs, right? But now I can use this table, this result to do that. So I'm going to put this already and call this as result. And then I'm going to do select result dot staff ID because that's the thing that I want to count customers by and then count customer ID as count customers. And now count the customer ID, I can put result.customerID. So I'm going to count from this result the number of customers each staff ID had a rental with. And now what we can do, of course, is from my result. Let's not forget that we need the group by result staff ID. 
because I want to count the number of customers by each staff ID. I couldn't do this count directly in the first table. I couldn't do this directly here if I go to the Sequila payment, because if I wanted to count each customer ID by each staff ID, I would get a completely different result. I'm going to do that also for you to see. For example, staff ID count customer ID as count from the Sequila dot payments group by staff ID. You're going to see that this will be a different query when we run this one. We'll have like that staff ID has seen 8,000 customers and that staff ID too has seen 792,000 customers. Something here is not right because if you go to the Sequila.customer, for example, if I go and check select count all from Sequila.customer, I'll have only 599 customers. So it's a bit impossible that each staff has seen at least more than 599 customers. So there must be some duplicates produced on this count. Why is that? Let's see what why that is happening. I know that there's a possibility that you are getting confused right now, but no worries because this will make sense, I hope, in a couple of minutes. But as you can see what this select count customer ID as count is doing, is that it is counting each time a different row we have here with customer ID is appearing for each staff ID. So it's not counting the unique customer ID. It's not counting, for example, customer ID one for staff ID one in this case is being counted three times because we have three rows here per each staff ID. And also it will be counted here two times and also here more one time. So uh, this is counting the number of rentals each staff ID has done. Why? Because this is not the key, of course, of the table. The key is the payment ID. This is completely possible that the customer does uh, several rentals with the same staff ID. That's something that can happen in this business. So we could solve this with account distinct, but that's outside of the scope of this lecture. So to do that, we need to bring this table into one row per customer and staff. We can only do that with the group by example that we see here with our result. So if I run this, for example, again, of course, I'll have one as I'm doing a group by by customer and staff, I'll have a single row by customer and staff. And now as the customer and staff are the keys of this result, I can use a count customer to count the distinct customers per each staff ID, something that I couldn't on the original table because the, cust the pair customer staff was repeated multiple times throughout that table. So then I would have a lot of duplicates in that count, which was different than what I was trying to achieve. If we were trying to achieve the number of rentals customers have done by staff ID, we can do the query above, even though we have here count customer ID. But remember, count customer ID means that I'm counting the different time customers appear per each staff ID. The customers can be repeated in this count because this count enables that. Again, count distinct could solve this, uh, but let's not talk about that right now. So our other workaround is, is to first turn the customer and the staff ID a key of the result. So in this case, the key, because this combination only appears once in this table, uh, right? There's no other way that we have here another row with customer ID one and staff ID one. So as we now have the table oriented in this way, we can now count the distinct customers. And as you will see, if I run this query again, returning to our sub query, where we are counting the customer ID by each staff ID only group by staff ID. If I run this one, I'll have 599 customers per each staff ID. So it's important that you understand why this is happening, particularly it's always related with the underlying data that we have on the table. So keys, the keys, what identifies a row, how the, the rows are organized are super important for you to do good queries. So even more than using and knowing how to use the SQL queries, it's really important that you understand the underlying data that you have on the tables, because it's my understanding those tables that you will know which time you should apply a specific query. So this was another usage of the subquery, because here we are compounding on a first group by to do another group by on top of that. OK, so this is also super common to do. Another thing that we can do, for example, instead of having a double group by, I'm going to show you another example here before we finish the lecture, is that we can have the average that each customer spends with each staff ID, right? We can do that. We just have to change this average of the sum amount. Now, this is super interesting. See that I'm only creating the sub amount, the sum amount in the subquery. I'm 
only creating it here. But as I'm now manipulating this query, it's a new step because it's as I said, imagine that this would be a table that we've created somewhere in SQL and that we have it accessible right here. It's exactly the same thing. The difference is that it's a query in itself. And now I'm, I can use the sum amount as average amount. And now if I run this one, I'll have the average amount that each staff ID has done. So staff ID 2 wins in this case because each customer has spent almost $57 with this staff ID and with staff ID 1 each customer has spent around 56 a bit below, nothing major of course. And this can be only uh, due to randomness. I think with these results doesn't make sense to give a bigger bonus to staff ID 2. Okay, so this was the concept of subqueries. I hope this was clear. Always think of subqueries as if you are working with tables right here. So this is really the next step in working with SQL is when you can visualize a table even if it's not created here with this structure. If you can do that, if you can imagine a table, create a query for it, and then put it inside the from statement, as we see here, you'll be manipulating SQL subqueries uh, with no hassle and with success in no time. Okay, so we close here subqueries. Now let's go to the next lecture where we'll learn how we can use select statements to insert data into new tables. I'll see you in the next lecture. Hello everyone and welcome again to the SQL course. So we are again here on a more advanced select statements lecture and here we are going to see how we can insert data into certain tables using our select statements. So this section is a bit more advanced also, it's uh, one of the sections where we compound on a lot of things that we've learned in the past. So if you are having trouble, don't hesitate to send me a message, I'll be happy to support you uh, also in this journey. Okay, so we are here in this two, insert into using data from tables. This is a script that we are going to use now uh, Now, as an example. I'm going to go here to the sequila.actor, so select all from sequila.actor, and I'm going to order by first name. Now, imagine something. Imagine I would like to have a table where I would want to have all the distinct names that I have for my customers. For example, a table where we would have Adam, Al, Alan, Albert, uh, Alec, Angela, and so on. If I would like to have this table, I could create a table on my own with the name sequila.firstName and then insert these rows by hand. Of course, this would be extremely cumbersome and imagine in a database where you have millions and millions of customers. That is, of course, borderline impossible to do, to write all those names by hand, or at least it would be extremely expensive. Well, luckily, we can do this with just a simple SQL instruction after creating the table. That's what we are going to explore here. So first, let me tell you here a small int, which is we can have, for example, here we see that the names are repeated. We have two times Adam, we have two times Albert, two times Angela. And one of the things that I can do is, for example, I'm going to just select first name from sequila.actor order by first name and let's look at the results so as you can see we have uh, duplicate names this is not what we want we want one single line per name we have here three birds i think so uh, we have a lot of duplicates how can we remove this well we have here a clause really cool which is the select distinct this is not directly tied to this lecture but it's a cool hint for you to know which is when we use select distinct we basically just bring distinct values from the columns that we have uh, ahead now one thing is that's really important is that you have first name and that if you join another column you no longer have the distinct values of the first name no you'll have the distinct values between first and last name between the pair so if i do this so there are multiple atoms but the as the last name is not distinct and as you have grant and hopper as different last names you'll have two rows all the same because distinct acts upon the columns that you select if you select 10 columns the distinct will bring the combination of different information that will be contained in those columns, okay? So of course, if you only have a column that will bring the distinct of only that column, of course. Okay, so here we have all the names and this is exactly what we want in our table, right? This is exactly the structure that we want in our table. We want a single row per name. How can we do that? Well, first let me create the structure of that table. So creating first name table. And that table will be, and I'm going to create table, sequila.firstName. I'm going to create it as follows. So first name 
it will be a var char. I'm going to do a var char uh, 20. No need, no need to have anything else. So I'm going to create this. There you go. Now, as we have this first name, we already have this structure right uh, created. So if I go select all from Sakila dot first name, whoops, I'll have an empty table because right now I've created its structure and metadata. I don't have any data inside. Of course, I could go here and insert into blah, 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 Sakila dot first name and all the names that I see here on this result. That would be extremely cumbersome. So wouldn't it be cool if we have a single instruction that lets us pick data from a table and insert it into any other table? We have that. And that is insert into, but instead of having, and I'm going to put here Sakila dot first name, this is exactly the same insert into that we've studied before. So first name. And now instead of the values, remember the values, we can use insert into and we can pick up our query and put it here instead of the values. It's that simple. So if I close the query right now, what will happen is instead of inserting manual values, which is exactly what the values mean, we are inserting the data that will go into our table. Notice that, of course, this complies with all the rules that we've seen in insert into before. So we have to have the same number of columns we are trying to insert into. We have to respect the data types that we have in each column. It's exactly the same. The only difference is that we are not writing the values by hand. We are now using another table or another set result to insert into this table. So if I run this one, this almost seems like magic because if I go now to the, let me run this first name, I'll have exactly the first names that I've seen before. So now my first name is populated with data. This is also a common expression to use when working with databases. Now, notice that this was really, really cool because we just compounded on something that we've learned before. We've learned how to use insert into, we've learned how to use select. It was just a matter of combining both of these instructions and making them super easy and working smoothly together. This will be something that you'll probably find when you are working and getting a bit more advanced in SQL, which is SQL is really flexible no matter what's the implementation that you are using. Either MySQL, Postgres, or uh, Microsoft SQL, all the implementations are really, really flexible. You can combine probably most of what we've learned so far in queries, and, and you'll see that most of the concepts that we've learned will probably uh, be able to be combined together, and that's uh, really cool here in the language. And as I've said, remember if I use here, for example, select distinct first name and last name and try to insert this into the circular first name, I'll have an error because I'm selecting here two columns and I'm only having one column in my table. Okay, so this always complies with the SQL rules that we know. Now, one good thing, and that's why I'm reserving this more to the end of the course, using these select statements, either these ones or the subqueries, are good exercises for visualization. What I mean by this is when you are writing the query, you are already viewing the table that you are creating in your mind. If you do that, you'll be able to look at this code and immediately visualize what's the underlying data that this code will create. In that way, you'll know what you can do with that result. Of course, in the beginning, you first run that piece of code as a standalone, and then you'll increment more instructions on top of that. But as you gain more and more experience, this exercise of visualizing what's the underlying table and data that you are creating will make you even a better and more flexible SQL developer or data analyst. So here we've learned how we can use selects with single columns. But of course, we are not reserved to that. That's what we are going to check in the next lecture, how we can use these instructions to create multiple columns and use this insert into with a select with more columns. So I'll see you in the next lecture. Okay, welcome back to the SQL course. So now let's create another table that we'll use to populate with data from our SQLA database. Now, for example, I may want to create a table that only contains the PG movies. So the movies that have as a rating, and let's check where we can see that, SQLA.film where we have this rating SPG. Well, I know that I can go here and, for example, do a WHERE clause, as we have learned. So WHERE rating is equal to PG. Now imagine that I would only like to store three columns. The film ID, let me go here, film ID, the title and the description. For example, I would only like to store this in my PG movies table. So I would have all the movies with PG, their ID, title and description. Well. I can create a table here. I'm going to create table, sakila.pg movies. 
and then I'm going to create this is also a good thing for you to check before creating these tables that will receive data from other tables let's of course describe the tequila.film for instance I see that the film ID is a small int I see that the title is a varchar 128 and I see that the description is a text in this way, confirming this and knowing that this will get data from the sequila.film table, I will not have conflicts with the data types. So I'm going to create this table, closing it, and let's create it. So of course, right now, this PG Movies, select all from PG Movies, is empty. Of course, whoops, forgot the letter that is named, sequila.pg Movies. And of course, if I go here, it's empty, no PG Movies inside. So now I can use, of course, insert into sequila.pg movies and what I can do, I can pass all the columns so film ID, title and description close this one and now what I can do is of course passing our query exactly as is this will work just fine notice, as we are selecting three columns here we can use these three columns to insert them into this table so if I run this, let's check there you go 129 rows affected, that means that we've successfully inserted here inside the sequila.pg movies all the movies with the PG rating as we wanted. Let's do a final exercise which is going here and I'm going to uh, refresh this here. You can also drop tables here, remember? I'm going to drop it instead of using code, I'm going to do drop now. And I'm going to do something, I'm going to change for example this uh, Varshar, instead of being a Varshar, I'm going to put the title as a small int. Uh, this is of course on purpose, a mistake on purpose. Now, let's see what will happen when I try to insert the data from the sequila.film. What will happen is that I have an error. Why? Because the types of the data don't match. So this is super important. Everything complies with these rules of data types, with the rules of the length of the data types, and with the data that is uh, compliant with each of the data types that we have in the table. Everything that we do in SQL revolves around these concepts. This is it for more on select statements. This was a shorter uh, section, but it was also on more advanced topics. We scratched the surface on these concepts and also it was really important for you to understand how these concepts are probably compound on several things that we've learned. Now SQL is super flexible in treating the results or the sets, for example, each result that we have in a query and how we can use and let me pick up something that has data which makes more sense and how we can use this data that is already on tables and the resulting queries to either do another select statement on top of it or to use this data to insert into new tables so i hope this was clear to you and of course we'll have now a case study where we'll have the opportunity to work around these concepts of course i advise you to do the case study because it will be pretty important for you to practice all these concepts so thank you very much for enrolling in the course and staying on that side i hope you've enjoyed everything that we've learned so far and let's go to the case study